I call to order the regular session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, October 11th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Vaticiotis. Here. Vice Mayor Lunt is absent and excused. Commissioner Carr. Here. Commissioner Eisner. Here. Commissioner Kouyas. Here. Okay, tonight's invocation will be given by Reverend Kurt Snare of St. Timothy's Lutheran Church. If we can all rise and then after the invocation, uh, turn and pledge allegiance to the flag. In the name of the Most High Triune God, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Renewer, we call upon you to be with us here and guide us unto your purpose. We thank you for this day and we thank you that you would forgive us our sins. We ask that you would bless all who live and work in Tarpon Springs. Help us to be good managers of that which you've entrusted to us. Help us to share with those in need as you have shared with us. And we ask that you bless those who you've called to lead our city, our commissioners and our mayor with wisdom this night, that we would do what is pleasing in your sight. We ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, before we uh, proceed, I'd like to make an announcement. Uh, with us tonight, we have Ms. Erin Jackson with the law firm of Johnson Jackson LLC sitting in for us as city attorney. Welcome, thank you. Um, before we also proceed, we've got a couple of um, housekeeping matters. Um, we'd received two memoranda from uh, Vice Mayor Lunt and also Commissioner Carr requesting uh, excused absences. Um, Vice Mayor Lunt, we, request, we received one on September 21st. We would have done this earlier except the um, hurricane Ian got in the way, and he'd like to be excused this evening um, because of, uh, actually he's out of the country on a family retreat. So if I could get a motion and a second to that effect. Motion to excuse uh, Craig Lunt. Okay. Second. All right, uh, any comments by the commission? Yes. I've got a question. So I think Ms. Jacobs mentioned it was excused on roll call. Am I understanding, did that already happen or is this? He, he hasn't been excused yet. Okay. But we're going to take care of that right now. Okay. Are we discussing my request also? Yes. Meeting if, too, if, not the last if that's okay with you. It's fine with me. It's your, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Uh, so any commission comments other than Commissioner Carr? Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. Uh, we also received a memorandum from. Um, Commissioner Carr uh, on September 26th. Um, in that one, he had asked to be recused uh, from the um, special session on Wednesday 21st because of family matters, and then also from the regular session on the morning of Tuesday 27th um, uh, because of other uh, circumstances concerning Hurricane Ian. Um, May I have a motion and a second to those? Actually, we'll take one at a time. The first one would be the special session on Wednesday the 21st um, as far as the uh, uh, personal matters at home. And that was the date of the millage rate? Pardon me? That was the date we discussed the millage rate in the, the second budget yes, hearing? Yes, that's correct. Okay. It was the budget hearing. Are there any comments from commissioners first? Let me ask. Okay, is there a motion? Motion to excuse. Is there a second? Okay. Um, well, um, there is no motion in a second, and I'll uh, discuss this with the uh, city attorney later to see what we do with that. Um, but uh, based on, uh, uh, and let's do the, set, the next one as well, and then I'll have something else to say. Uh, the other one is the um, excuse from the regular session on Tuesday um, the 27th because of Hurricane Ian um, and evacuating uh, Commissioner Carr's family at that time. That was a, a, 
a meeting that he had a conversation with the city manager be made, before he made his decision. Um, does the commission have any comments on that? Yes, I have a comment. Go ahead, Commissioner uh, Eisner. I want, uh, I want to know that, um, I want people to know that I, I really appreciate that he wanted to evacuate his children. We were all terrified, um, but usually you have to get a uh, excuse and recusal from the board, not from the city manager. Um, I did check into it. Uh, all the rest of us were here. Um, we did not release any fire department people who have young kids. We didn't release any, you know, police department that had young kids. And um, the mandatory evacuation was for areas A, B, and C. I believe he lives in an area D. Um, it was a nine o'clock in the morning meeting. And, you know, at that time there was no real danger except that he wanted to get out earlier. And I just don't see that that is excusable. But that's me. Okay, thank you. Um, any and anyone else? Um, uh, Commissioner Mayor, Carr. There you go. You can, Commissioner Cooley. Uh, just for the sake of, uh, of the sensitivity of the hurricane and uh, you know the safety of his children uh, and you know how much danger it was in the community, I, I don't mind the excuse for that. Um, the prior one, I think there was an ample uh, discussion of him coming to the meeting you know for the, the millage rates so uh, with the hurricane issue uh, I will grant that excuse, uh, excuse. Okay. may I have a motion and a second please motion to excuse second roll call yes, yes. Commissioner Eisner no Commissioner Carr yes yes Mayor I've got a, I had a couple comments I want to make sorry I had a comment I wanted to make. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, a couple things I, I just want to bring out to the public. Uh, first, I, I find it embarrassing um, that an individual on the board won't excuse an absence, but then you just excuse an absence for someone that's out of the country. Uh, the first meeting that I missed was the last budget meeting um, to adopt the millage rate and adopt the budget. I had a, an immediate mam a family member that had surgery that day. My daughter was also sick and going to the doctor's office, and I had a work session that went late as well, too. Um, I missed the meeting, it was my error. Um, I asked for an excusal because of that. I had a lot going on that day, completely just slipped my mind, completely forgot about it. Um, to me, I find it very unprofessional. Um, it's not surprising to me though, as a board member would say something like this, that is unexcusable. Secondly, we had a hurricane that was coming towards Tampa Bay, Clearwater, Tarpon Springs area that completely decimated Fort Myers. Um, I decided it was an, a good idea for me to go ahead and leave town. Uh, it wasn't a regular session meeting. It, the regular session meeting was canceled that night and moved to a 9 o'clock meeting that morning. I decided it would be best for my family and I to get out of town, uh, try to beat the traffic and get, a, get to the other side of the state. As you can see what it did to Fort Myers, uh, it was a serious storm and that was projected to come over Tarpon Springs. Um, to me, it's, again, an embarrassment to say that there was no reason to leave the area. Um, again, it was a special meeting. It wasn't a regular session meeting. That was regularly scheduled. Uh, I, decided to leave. I decided to leave. I talked to the city manager. I told the city manager, if you don't have a quorum, I'm happy to stay. I'll stay for the meeting and leave after the meeting. He then informed me that there's going to be enough for a quorum that there'll be four other people on the board that are going to be attending. I said, okay. I'll see you at the next meeting. Hopefully everything goes well. Um, see you after the storm. So with that, I, I think it's clear. I think it's um, obviously a very political, um, politically um, charged board that we sit on at times. And uh, to me, it's sad that you're not going to put the human element into um, the decisions and the votes that you make up here. So with that, I just want to give a little background of why I missed the past two meetings. Um, with family related issues. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to ask any of the other commissioners if they've got any comments. Um, I, but I'd like to make a comment. Um, go ahead. So, uh, the first meeting that um, you didn't attend, you, you did write a text message to our city clerk stating that you were on your way 
So we as a board assume that you were on the way to the meeting. It was after I know, that you wrote the, the family situations, so which I completely understand. And if we can get those type of notices just even before that, I know family things happen and if you can just let us know, it's, it's not an issue. But we did have this assumption that you were on your way or we're gonna walk through that door at any moment during that second uh, hearing. And uh, regarding the hurricane, I, I can agree with you. I, I understand your situation. So thank you, Mayor. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Eisen. So in answer to the uh, first part, uh, as I like to agree with Commissioner Kulius, you had texted uh, three times to the city clerk that you were running late and you were running late and you were running late and never showed and never called to tell us that you were not coming. So that's one thing on that part. Um, if you're willing to stay for a nine o'clock meeting, if you didn't have a quorum, then there was no reason for you to not stay, um, whether we had it or we didn't. Um, I don't understand how you can have the safety of your children and then not put the safety of your children. That to me make no sense. Um, I still say, I, I don't, I, I would have given you the excusal if you had asked the, the uh, city manager to A, cancel the meeting, which he could have done, and I spoke to him about it, and maybe he should have done that um, if, if you couldn't have been there. But we have a responsibility to the residents of this town. That's what we are elected for. And uh, if you're willing to, as you just admitted, you're willing to stay, that's what you should have for the hour. That's my feelings. I am not at any means um, questioning your wanting to, to protect your children at any means. Um, but that should have come as a vote from us and not from the city manager. City manager did not take authority until we had that meeting at nine o'clock and we offered him the authority to make those decisions for us in our absence. So at that point, he had no business to give you that um, okay to leave. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mayor, got one clear. No, 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 no more comments. All I'm gonna say is that um, not everything up here is political, and all I'm gonna say, it takes two people to, for it to become political. So I'm gonna move on. It doesn't affect your status as a commissioner. I understand um, there are some issues, policy issues that we need to address. Um, I've had extensive conversations with the, uh, the city manager concerning this, even to the extent that the policy changes with the city attorney that comes in here. It used to be where special sessions weren't even an excusable meeting. In other words, there was no reason to excuse them. Either you're here or you're not, but it doesn't affect your standing as a commissioner. So I don't want to spend any more time on this. We've got a long evening ahead of us. I think everybody's had a say. I think it's um, your, your status doesn't change, and um, I'd, I just simply want to move on. And there's untrue stuff that was said, so I'll clear it up at the end of the meeting. Pardon me? So there's untrue things that were said. I'll clear it up at the end of the meeting. Okay. All right. All right, we're going to move on to uh, item number, uh, actually it's a, f a special presentation by uh, Mr. Ryan Cordobaum, Advent Health North Pinellas. Mr. Cordobaum is the president of the Advent Health North Pinellas. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor Vaticiotis and City Commissioners. Um, really excited to get to share just a, a couple of things this evening and uh, um, hopefully share a couple of things. My goal is to share two points. First, a little bit about me. So not only you, because I've met with many of you individually, but also the residents and people of Tarpon Springs to share a little bit about who I am, my background. Second, what our plans are for the hospital. Advent Health North Pinellas has been a mainstay here in the community and so excited to share some of the things that we're gonna be doing um, over the next couple of weeks, months, and years. So really excited about sharing that with each of you this evening. Um, first, a little bit about me. So I am uh, previous to my time here at uh, Advent Health North Pinellas. I was at Advent Health Wesley Chapel. So I've par been part of the Advent Health team for many years. Prior to my time there, I was actually um, a CFO for two hospitals in Northern California. So I had the chance to learn firsthand what it means to be not only a CFO and an executive in a hospital, but one that is 
deeply rooted in the community. That actually speaks more to me about the community of Tarpon Springs than anything. So the town that I'm originally from, Paradise, California, was actually um, displaced through a fire in 2018. So I know what it means to be a part of a town that has deep roots and one that care about its citizens and its people. So through that process, I've talked with each one of you uh, individually, and I'm really excited to be a part of the Tarpon Springs community. My wife and two kids, I have a two-year-old and a seven-year-old, we're in the process of relocating from Tampa here to Tarpon Springs, so really excited to be a part of the community. Maybe see uh, you guys at Publix or see you uh, at the beach, so really excited about, uh, about joining everyone here. Um, so enough about me. I want to talk briefly about the hospital. So Advent Health North Pinellas, we've been um, in the community for, for years, and it's really exciting to see a couple of things that have transpired over the last couple of weeks. First off, many of you were there for the Christopher Stills painting unveiling, which was absolutely fantastic to unveil beautiful historic Tarpon Springs and highlight Christopher Stills as the national uh, artist who lives right here in Tarpon Springs with his gallery being here in Tarpon. So we unveiled that and it was very well received. You, many of you were, were there that evening. It was great to share that with state officials, county officials, um, so we really appreciated you guys supporting us in that effort and in that endeavor. Um, second, we also did a ribbon cutting on uh, two weeks ago on Sunday for the lobby, where we also highlighted the Tarpon Springs uh, marching band, who was there to, to do a ribbon cutting and an unveiling. So saw many of you there, um, which was also really exciting to, to see. And what it meant to me was it was very special because it showed that you guys are not only a supporter of our campus, but as me as the new CEO. So moving forward, a couple of things we're gonna be working on. First, we're gonna be working on doing some uh, renovations to the awning, which you guys generously approved at the last meeting, so really excited about that. Second, we're gonna be recruiting new physicians so that specialty care can be provided closer to home, including general surgery, orthopedics, and vascular surgery. Just a quick uh, story that goes along with that. Um, Three weeks ago, we had a patient come into the ER with what's called a AAA, an abdominal aortic aneurysm, and it can be life-threatening. This individual came and was not doing very well, but our new vascular surgeon was able to do life-saving work for her in the moment to save her life, and because of the work of Dr. Melanie Nukala, that patient is still alive today. So I'm really excited about the care that we're providing right here in Tarpon Springs, and I'm really excited about what we're gonna do in the future moving forward. That's what I had this evening. Any Thank questions? You. Well, I just wanna welcome you again to Tarpon Springs for the third or fourth time. Um, I think you're gonna have a, a, an excellent um, experience here in Tarpon Springs. It's a great community. I understand it's very similar to the one in California that you were raised in, and, and I, we're very grateful for that. And um, anything we can do to help, um, we're here. And um, call on us anytime. And um, uh, we're just looking forward to seeing you in the future at many of our events, which you've already started, which uh, I, I'm glad to see as well, and also partly sponsoring those events as well. So let me ask uh, commissioners if you'd like to have any uh, comments. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, uh, Ryan, we're uh, super excited you're here. Uh, enjoyed our conversation so far that we've had. Um, obviously, being a, a visible presence in our community, it makes a huge difference for the hospital. The hospital has made leaps and bounds over the past few years, and looking forward to those to continue. Uh, so we're looking forward to your leadership uh, moving forward here in Tarpon Springs, and hopefully you're around for many years. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Rayson. Thank you. Um, Any time a conversation is planned for 30 minutes and turns to two hours, I did enjoy speaking with you. I think, I think you're a great guy, and I think you're going to do great things for the hospital, and I'm here to help any way I can. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you, Commissioner Eisner. Commissioner Kulias. Hey, thank you, Ryan, for uh, coming to Tarpon Springs. You've hit the ground running, and we appreciate all your efforts in taking care of our hospital and the community. Thank you, sir. Reached out to Milty uh, the same day we talked about it, so uh, hopefully we can get him here to, uh, to our ER. Appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. All right. City Manager, do you have anything? Welcome, look forward to working with you like I work with Jason, so thank you. Absolutely, appreciate it. You do know that if you need anything real quick, 
you, you can get one of us, but we need two others to get you approved. The city manager could do a lot quicker. <laughs> so, Got it. but feel free to call us and see how we're doing anytime. We'll do the same with you. Very so, good. So, thank you, Mr. Quarterball. Thank you, Whit thank right. you, Mayor. Um, public comments or Mr. Quarterbaum to comments. the presentation? I thought you were still in public comments. You didn't announce it was I, I was going to ask if the residents had anything, any public comments concerning the presentation. Yes, I do. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, Dr. Clough, years ago, was one of the first doctors with open heart surgery. He went to out of the country to assist, um, trying to think of the doctor that did the first heart, open heart surgery. Uh, and he was a student of Dr. Clough's and uh, Bernard. And after that, Dr. Clough was always called to help all over the United States with heart transplant and open heart surgery. So we were very lucky to have Dr. Wim <coughs> Clough in Tarpon Springs and I hope you keep all the historic pictures of our early doctors in the hospital because it's very important. Some of our doctors were very world renowned, but they never let people know. But Dr. Clough was the number one heart doctor in the United States here in Tarpon Springs. Hmm. And uh, I don't want to see those change, please, please. Please fix the hole on Canal Street between Grand Boulevard and the bayou, it's so deep now, if your tire runs in it, you're gonna bang up your car. Please. And the bricks are standing up now. Well, are we on public comments now? now? I'm telling you that because it's dangerous. The car hit it and their uh, oil pan went. I told them to come and see you, you'd fix it for them. Mr. Quarterbaum, can you help with that? <laughs> <laughs> are there any other comments concerning the hospital presentation? Mr. Jump, are there any uh, remote access comments? If anyone would like to speak on this, this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. Thank you. And Ms. Jacobs, I'm gonna assume we don't have anything. Okay, let's move on to public comments. Um, anybody here for public comments just on anything that's not gonna be on the agenda this evening? Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. <clears throat> Just want to let you know, in case you're not aware, that Clay Colson's case that started as a 163 comp plan challenge uh, to the 6th Judicial Circuit, basically saying that there was an improper and or illegal uh, development order granted to the Morgan Group so they could build apartments on the 74 acres that is owned by Walmart. The previous attorneys, Trash Dagno, took it upon themselves to agree with the judge in the case that Mr. Colson did not have the right to record in court. <clears throat> Ignoring case law from the Florida Supreme Court and the second DCA that says that you can. So Mr. Colson is now taking this case to the Florida Supreme Court. You may have been notified today. They at least noticed on the second DCA website uh, the document title. But you may also notice if you've ever been to the second DCA website that when you click on things, you get nothing. It's a black hole. You can't find out anything that's going on in anybody's case in the District Court of Appeals. So more now than ever. You know, you used to be able to do that. You used to have free reign, free access to all the cases online, just like you do at the Sixth Judicial Court. So now more than ever, it's imperative that we have the right to gather news, to record these cases, these hearings. 
so that everybody can see what's going on. We can't have this star chamber justice stuff anymore. This has to end. And why the city would have allowed their attorneys to advocate against the First Amendment is beyond me. So now that you're having a new representation, all you have to do is say, you have no objection to Mr. Colson recording or anybody else recording a hearing in court from now on. And of course, there may be some strange exceptions where the judge feels that it would be disruptive or sensitive if in the case of a child or something. But that wasn't the case here, and that wouldn't be the case for any of you if you had a case that you wanted to record. All you have to do is instruct your new attorneys to tell them that you have no objection. It's very easy to do. It'll cost you a whole lot less than fighting this in the Supreme Court. So ask your new attorneys what they think about it. Ask them how much they would charge to write that letter. Ask them how much they would charge to take this to the Supreme Court. If for no other reason, it'd be an easy financial decision to make. Unless for some reason you don't think that people should have their First Amendment right in court to gather news, to gather information, to record, to let people know what's going on behind those closed courtroom doors. This has to stop, and we definitely can't have the city of Tarpon Springs be the case law that says it's going to be a dark courtroom from now on. We can't have that. But unless you plead no objection, that's what you're going to have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robotsky. Any other public comments? Good evening, Mr. Geddes. Hi, good evening. Uh, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Um, it is, it's to my understanding that the Trask Law Firm has fallen out of favor with the city of Tarpon Springs. And I also um, have come to realize that that circuit court judge Keith Myers is uh, married to an attorney that is employed by and works for the Trask Law Firm. And I also have found myself in a conflict. I have a court case with Judge Keith Myers concerning the county's ad valorem property tax based on Pinellas County Resolution 95 286 section 4 C-2 the county was sold to the water district in a fee simple title 30 year transfer of function and and power that sale had taken place 12 years ago so in actuality the county ad valorem charge as equated today is not a county ad valorem property tax lien but the charge has now evolved into a water district non ad valorem levy. This shape shifting of power to a non elected body of government is a conflict um, with me, and I feel as though Judge, uh, Circuit Court Judge Keith Myers, being married to an attorney who represents city governments, city governments thereby representing county governments. In turn, um, this is a conflict of interest um, concerning the uh, judge uh, being married, in a sense, to someone who represents that which I am taking to court. Um, I don't feel my case is being fairly heard um, or is even being recognized in such process. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Other public comments, please? Good evening, Ms. Wade. Good evening, Julie Wade, 1095 Main Sale Drive. I wanted to congratulate all the city departments and staff for their hurricane readiness and preparation. It was a lot of work, and I wanted to thank them for doing whatever they could to ensure our safety. I'd like to start by quickly reading into the record the letter I was unable to share personally with Tom Trask, our former attorney, due to 
the necessity of change in that hurricane meeting. Dear Mr. Trask, it is with personal sadness as well as woe for our city that I bid you farewell. The guidance, support, leadership, and patience shown to me personally and the code board members and staff has been remarkable and consistent. It has been abo uh, above reproach in all aspects. The loss of your institutional knowledge may not be replaceable for our city. It is also concerning that the current board of commissioners allows innu innuendo and insinuation to be a part of their discussions and deliberations. I'm sorry that those unjust implications have been directed to you, Mr. Trask, and your firm. I understand the necessity of distancing yourself and firm from such needless and undeserved defamation. With certainty, you should know that great majority of the citizens of the community appreciate you and your work and recognize our loss. I will sorely miss you. Thank you for your help. I love this city. We do amazing things here, but I am concerned that we are becoming the city of no, N-O, nothing new. If you look at other small cities in North Florida where I grew up, like Brunstown and Bristol and Mariana and Shipley, they resisted change and their kids and businesses have gone. Some growth and change is essential. You've said no to a hotel, even though citizen surveys said we want that. Supposedly, up here somebody said it was because of traffic, more cars. Well, if the cars are all parked there, they're not continuously coming in and out of the city, and so it would be less traffic. We said no to new apartments. Uh, and yet when we put Icaria and Santos Isles, they haven't created new traffic headaches or crime. They brought new consumers and workers and families. We said no to extending Belcher. I was at the meeting. No traffic safety study was done, but a commissioner thought it would be dangerous. No food trucks. No to what Pasco County wants to do. Not even necessarily our business all the way. Experts give testimony. It's disregarded and disputed by the same loud voices that continue to drive the no change narrative. I want to be the quiet voice, the one on your shoulder whispering to you, evolve, adapt, stay relevant. Thanks to our great city staff and all the new businesses who've opened, they've added to our relevance, not altered our essence. Change is necessary within a city, as it is in nature to survive. Please plan for and adapt to it for all of our good. Let's set a positive tone and not pick at things like absences. Thank you. Any other pu public comments? Good evening, Peter Lack is 514 Ashland Avenue. Ms. Jackson, welcome. Thank you. I hope you don't take the preview of this meeting as all future meetings, but we will see how it goes. Let us remember all those souls who have now crossed a century mark, who have passed away not through any necessarily fault of their own, but maybe through an indirect fault. And why do I bring this forward? I sent the board a uh, article that showed up on CNN Opinion on September 29th, two days after the storm, by Stephen Strader, Associate Professor of Geography and Environment uh, from the Villanova University. And I will quote just one paragraph, because he talks about how natural hazards will continue to be hazardous, but how we develop and where we put people is what makes it a disaster. And here's a quote. The simple fact is that when more people are exposed <coughs> to a natural hazard, the odds for a major disaster to occur are greater. As our population and built environment grows and expands, we are more readily placing ourselves in harm's way. 
The wetlands and mangroves that once acted as natural buffers to the risky waters and waves are now shrinking or gone. They have been replaced by subdivisions. I get the business observer. I know I'm an environmentalist, but I'm also a business person. You can see there, nice big piece track of land, big piece track of land surrounded by houses. And then if you go back, if you go actually to the business observer site in this issue, which wasn't the last one, but there's an article about dirt movers, about the largest deals in 2022. Babcock Property Holdings, vacant land, 12.6 million, Charlotte. Punta Gorda, vacant land, 12.2. Babcock Property Holdings, Punta Gorda, vacant land, 11.9. They were going to be putting houses in there, apartments. What's that land going to be worth now? So I have a, only a few moments left, and I want to read something about my passages. And I've selected three because it shows how the earth and nature and God who has put us on this beautiful planet is unhappy with us. First is Nahum 1, 2 through 8. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemy. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way, in the, his way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand this indignation? Who can endure, endure this fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. Now I go to Jeremiah 25, 19-20. See the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he foolish, fully accomplishes the purpose of his heart. In days to come, you will understand it clearly. And lastly, Jeremiah 47, 2. This is what the Lord says. See how the waters are rising in the north. They will become an overflowing torrent. They will overflow the land and everything in it, the towns and those who live in them. The people will cry out. All who dwell in the land will wail. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Welcome, Ms. Jackson. Let's, um, we're going to continue on with the public comments, and then I'll, uh, I'll let some... Elias Garnica Uskategi, uh, 1482 Hillview Lane. I don't know exactly who is in charge of where the bus stops or how it goes where it goes, but I was sitting at Tula's Trail on Sunday and got very lost in the thinking of what a terrible waste it is that we aren't using the old train station as a bus stop and that instead the trolley makes a very interesting turn um, north on Harpen Avenue to go around Orange when it would make so much more sense if it came down Orange, um, stopped at the, just traveled down, I think it's Safford, a uh, distant maybe, I don't know. But if we used one, I, I really feel that the old train station is grossly underutilized as a common space and as a place that can be used like for events and like more active like, I, I don't know, I just really see like if we used that back parking lot the same way that we use the front parking lot that's on all, for the craft festival. I, I think we should be a little bit more creative in utilizing our parking lots and basically moving around um, the pop-up markets, different areas of the city with the understanding that we can shuttle people from one place to another and like mitigate the traffic issue. And there's really always enough parking. You just gotta know where to look for it. And most people don't know where to look for it. Uh, and I guess that would also take some cooperation from some of the local businesses that do have like a lot of empty space that, or it's like, can we have permission from these days? Well, I don't know. I don't know how it works. It doesn't matter. Uh, we could be using those parking spaces in much more interesting ways. Um, 
I, I really would like to see if there's a possibility of using um, the train station much better as like a landmark uh, going on because uh, it's it's really nice and it's just you can see really how the the ground was cut for the train to come through and it's a very interesting slope uh, I personally feel that Tarpon Avenue uh, between alternate 19 and Diston it should not be for cars uh, it's kind of a travesty to be having people just driving through the historic downtown and not seeing anything and how much of like basically business and foot traffic that we lose because we have no space for people to walk on the street it's all parking and cars either we let the cars go through or we have no parking on that street um, and direct it all to the adjoining streets um, it would be great if there was a bus stop at the Tarpon Springs library I, I uh, lastly, I guess I wanted to com communicate a message of a possible collaborative future that is understanding of how the city of Tarpon Springs is the only organized municipality in kind of a big range. I don't think Palm Harbor is ever going to incorporate, Holiday is never going to incorporate, but Holiday was Tarpon Springs when it was just like Tarpon Springs as a general area. And then we know that East Lake is basically Tarpon Springs also. Uh, if we look into the context of us at the very southern end of the Florida Springs coast and think of us as like basically the continuity of the same springs that are in that are north of here uh, and think about Wall Springs and Tarpon Springs wherever that spring was bubbling up uh, think about it as more in in line with the history and culture of that north northern area because we are the extreme edge of Pinellas County um, but we do have some I would say some obligations to the unincorporated communities that surround us as probably the only municipality uh, and we have infrastructure set up already so I would just say think about that thank you Are there any other public comments Jesse Reynolds, 605 South Distant Avenue, Tarpon Springs, 54 years of my life here in Tarpon Springs. I'm speaking to the board, and if anybody watching at home, the ones that couldn't make it, we say we'll get and gather up late on. I'm asking the city, um, the mayor, the council member, uh, the assistant um, mayor, and everybody to listen to the people. I know some of y'all ran on, let's change the city of Tarpon Springs. Let's just change it. We need to do something. We need to get rid of this. We need to get rid of that. But if we got a system that's working within the government and everybody in top is being represented equally, if you do somebody in the city wrong today, you'll do me wrong tomorrow. So it become a problem to me. I'm saying the people that have the power up here, I'm asking y'all to listen to all the people and don't get up here and make personal decisions because when we start making personal decisions, carrying personal vandana, we just lose the people that we represent. It's just out the window. It's not about black, it's not about white, it's about doing what's right. Some people say, you know, we just need to make a change. Don't make a change if it ain't broke. Don't make a change just so you can go and have a group conversation and say, well, we made a change. Because sometimes if you're making a change, you got to be careful. If you make a bad change for the people, then you done done us wrong. Y'all are elected officials. Some of y'all probably won't run again. Some of y'all probably tired. Some of y'all done done other things. But for those that's planning on making a career, you got to be careful not listening to the people top and spring. They don't jump up. They're not going to stream. They ain't going to wave no pom-pom. But next time it comes to vote, if you got a business going on, you got to remember. They're going to remember. I'm telling you, you got to be careful with the agendas that you push because we come together, black, white, Greek, purple. We come together as one when we see something ain't being done right. I'm asking y'all to please pay attention to the move that you're going. Because if you think people are sitting quietly, you got some people at home, they're gonna be watching and they're gonna show up at the right time. I'm telling you, you got to be careful with the thread of the line that you do just for the sake of doing it. You got to be careful. I have one question if I could ask, is that a problem if I ask a question to the board? Uh, if uh, Mr. Reynolds, if you could ask somebody, I mean, if you have a specific question I, to I, ask, I you, you have to call tomorrow 
not okay. questions tonight. Tonight, okay, these okay. are well, just since comments. I, since, since I used a little bit of my time answering, you, you can ask a com you can ask a question. You won't get an answer, but the okay. city manager will answer you tomorrow. Okay. Well, I'd just like to say I don't think our city manager is trying to go nowhere. He got many years left in it. He didn't led us and brung us a lot. And if he ain't trying to go nowhere, he need to stand up and let the people know I ain't trying to go. And we don't need nobody on this board trying to force him out. I'm telling you, and I'm not saying threatening. I'm not coming up here sticking my chest at. I'm speaking as a citizen that then sat down with a many people and so many people in this room. We didn't sat down and we didn't say it. Our city manager have done us right, and we the people. We want to continue with our city manager, and I'm telling the rest of y'all that's sitting up there, you got to be careful pushing a personal agenda. I know the two minutes is important. You got to be careful pushing a personal agenda. When our city manager is not trying to go nowhere, y'all want him to look and find somebody. You're asking for what? If he was leaving and say, "Hey, I'm finna leave," then we take and say, "All right, Mark, can you find somebody?" But if he's saying, "I still got life in me. I still got fight. I'ma still represent the people." You got to be careful forcing somebody out because you have the power to get together and congregate and make up what you want to do to push out. You got to be careful. I say that there because I know what it's like to be falsely accused. I know what it's like for people to slay mud and spaghetti. And that's what brings the fight out of me. When you do it to our city manager, and if everybody out here get quiet and don't show up and just be cool with it, then you're doing a disservice to everybody, your next door neighbors that can't make it. So I say if our city manager is not ready to leave, you got to be careful talking about forcing him out because y'all hold the vote. If he done something wrong and it's criminal, then the state attorney did. If I don't see no criminal charges, then it become personal. That's just like me. If I do something stupid and kick this thing over and scream and holler, he going to get up and do his job because now I done got out of character. That's what he here for. I'm telling y'all on the board, don't you get out of character based on somebody else speaking to you or whispering to your calling. Our city manager have done us right. I'm telling y'all that's here. Don't let the board bamboozle him into getting somebody. We don't know what we're going to get. Mark didn't did the police department. He didn't brought many things here. And he didn't sat down and got an open policy. You have a problem, you can walk up there. That don't mean you're always right. That don't mean you're always going to get here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be called. And he's going to go to the department, and he's going to correct it. If it need to be corrected, if it don't need to be, he's going to tell you. So I looked at it, I investigated it, and Mr. it is Reynolds, what it is. Can, I understand, and I'm telling you too, Mayor. I know you might have arranged your course I'm, and you want to leave. I'm telling y'all, you got to be careful when y'all start playing with the city manager because you're playing with us, the people. You're playing with us, the people. And y'all got to know that we're serious. You Mr. can't just Reynolds, come up here and do what you want to do and then think that it ain't no repercussion. Mr. You may go out and you may not want to be um, heard again. And you may not want to come. But some of y'all that want to be heard again, you're looking for a vote or you want to make politics, you got to be careful when you don't listen to the people talking. I've been here all my life. It'll turn on you real quick. You know you didn't mean the city manager. Mr. They didn't say you was the greatest. Mr. Reynolds, you the city manager your, your time is don't up. Don't force your the time city is manager up. out of this place based on a personal vendetta. I'm telling you. Y'all gonna be then started something Chief, right Chief, up in that's here. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Mr. Reynolds. Something. I say it because I know what it's like to sit here. I done had some issues with the city before, and I had somebody to come and say, hey, look here, we're gonna make it right. We're gonna do right. All right. And if the rest of y'all ain't willing to do that and do right by the people, you don't have a personal vendetta. Mr. You don't have the power not to listen to the people. Mr. Reynolds, we the one voted and put please, some of you in. Let's stop now. You've had plenty of time. Thank you. And I hope that y'all stop doing what y'all doing behind closed doors. I understand. We've talked about it before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Are there any other comments? Any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any other IT comments? If anyone online would like to speak, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand, so I'll allow the first person in. Thank you. Barbara Walker, 3019, Bradford Circle, Palm Harbor. And I just wanted to say good evening. And thank you very much for having this technology available for to be able to participate from home this evening. I, I do miss being there with you all. And that's all. That's it. That's it. Thank you. And I'll allow the next person in.
Hi, uh, this is Vice Mayor Lunt. Uh, first, I just wanted to apologize for not being able to attend the meeting tonight. I just wanted to all of you know that I am in attendance, even though I'm uh, a few time zones away. Um, I wanted to, again, just apologize to people because I'm not there tonight, but I wanted to know that I'm very much paying close attention and uh, very much uh, involved in what's going on. Thank you. Enjoy the full moon over Tuscany, Mr. Uh, Vice Mayor Lunt. It's beautiful. Thank you. All right. Um, are there any other comments? And we do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay. Ms. Jacobs, did we get any? Um, okay. Uh, Commissioner Eisner would like to make a comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I wanted to start off by saying tonight is a night of transparency. Um, I heard a couple of comments that were made. Um, I want to clarify some comments that were made. Um, I happened with uh, our ex-city attorney. I asked why we was being billed for travel time, why the city was being billed, and he gave me no answer. That's A. B, when I asked him who gave him the authority, he didn't, he said nobody. It was just, that's just the way it's been. So I didn't find that to be a good um, answer. But subsequent to that, and I want to read this, we had a resignation letter that he said, and I, what I'm going to highlight is these false accusations have wrongly maligned the reputation of his firm, attorneys, and will be addressed in an appropriate manner. Unfortunately, it's not clear now the members of the Board of Commissioners have been strongly influenced by false, defamatory, and tortious accusations and intent to sever the city's decade-long relationship has been said before. The follow-up to that, <clears throat> I want to thank Commissioner Coolius because he wrote, Tom, I've looked over and attached the highlights, resignation letter, and residence, and have asked if you've given any statements since that September 9th letter. You made a statement in your resignation that you'd be addressing the matter at a later date. The appropriate manner and time, I believe, have passed and a statement is appreciated. Do you plan on addressing the situation as you expressed in the resignation letter? There are many questions the citizens would like answered. It's been over 26 days, and I think you owe your firm, you owe the citizens and the board an explanation before October 9th, your end date. We do plan on discussing several aspects of this issue with, on the agenda tonight, October 11th meeting, and after the 9th, you have no obligation to us as legal counsel for Tarpon Springs. I myself, speaking as Coolius, maybe the commission as a whole should be able to respond to your statement on this matter, in which you've been given ample time to gather your thoughts and address it. Can you provide a statement prior to you and your firm's agreement ending with the city before October 9th? And he kindly said, Mark can share this with us, and that's how we know about it. Now, mind you, I followed that up, and I said, Attorney Trask, and I sent this on October 7th, because I know people have said that we just terminated him. We didn't do anything. He, he resigned. Attorney Trask, as of today, I have not seen a response from you to on the request sent by Commissioner Coolius that he sent on October 5th to provide a statement addressing your comment in the letter dated September 9th to the board. The matter will be addressed in an appropriate manner, is what you said. I will assume that one will not be coming now. I would have hoped that you would have provided a follow-up to the board and the residents of Tarpon Springs before your last day. I have to this day not received anything from th their firm, from Tom Trask, from anything. So anybody that's telling me or telling this board that he was something that he wasn't, he had the opportunity to respond. He didn't respond. As far as the food trucks that was mentioned, that was not our board who decided on it. The Antclote was decided under his um, jurisdiction. Um, the hotel could not have been passed because under his jurisdiction, he allowed our, the board to change to a 10-year development code, which you'll be hearing later in the emails that he's admitted to. 
Um, Icaria was built on a wetlands that caused a whole lot of issues in this town, but I was brand new here, so it was nothing to do with me. Um, when I asked Trask about his overbilling the city, he said that he won't do it anymore, but he'll get us another way, was the words he used when he was sitting up here. I didn't appreciate that either. Then he changed it the next day and sent us an email stating that he will no longer be billing us for travel time. These type of comments are not professional. Transparency is what's professional. Um, I called him and I could not get a direct answer from him on any of these comments, nor has anybody else. So he decided to resign for, I guess, some of the comments that I've asked him about and some of the emails that I'm about to read tonight. But in addition to that, um, he had every right to do whatever he wanted to do. He could have been here tonight. He could have been here and defended himself. He could have written a letter. He chose not to. Um, the newspaper, if anybody read it, said that he was, um, as, as I recall them saying, it was only a matter of an hour or two a month. What he negated to mention was we have six attorneys that come here per month for the different boards. So six attorneys times two hours a month is $1,200. So I, I don't know how much this is or how much this isn't, but whatever it is, it wasn't what he said. Okay. Um, that ends the um, public comments. It's 726. We have to start our resolutions and ordinances. Um, let me ask, uh, before we go on to the consent agenda, does any commissioner have any item that he wants to pull? If you do, we'll, we'll withhold the consent agenda until after the 7.30. Do you have anything you want to pull? I just don't know how to ask any questions of number one. That's all, you know, but. Do you have questions on that one? No? I'll leave it. Commissioner Carr, do you have any? Okay, let's go ahead and do the uh, consent agenda. Um, item one, attorney's fees, Trash Stagnall, uh, invoice one, 2022. Item number two, authorize execution of interlocal agreement providing for control of illicit discharges. Item number three, authorize execution of Union Academy National Trust grant agreement. Item four, approve holiday meeting schedule for November and December 2022. Item five, award file number 230016-N-AS, single source purchase of motor roll equipment and support services. Item six, award file number 230011-N-AS, single source purchase of peerless vertical turbine pump. Item seven, award file number 230005-N-AS, single source purchase of Trimble Forensics X7, laser scanner related accessories. Item eight, Gratify increase to file number 200153-C-JL, library materials utilizing state of Florida alternate contract source number 5000000-20-NY-ACS, books, non-print non library materials, and related ancillary services. Um, I've asked whether you have any items that you wish to pull. You do not. Are there any public comments on any of these items? Here to LAX 514 Ashland Avenue. We'll start with number three. Authorize execution of Union Academy National Trust Grant Agreement. I don't see Ms. Dabbs here, but in honor of Ms. Dabbs and all the work she's done, I have to say thank you for getting this through. And uh, I know it's important to her in the Academy area to uh, start chronicling some of their history. And Tina knows how important it is to uh, chronicle the local history. Number two, execution of interlocal agreement providing for control of illicit discharges from within Pinellas County. Anybody know what that's about? I know I saw the interlocal agreement, but I didn't see anything in there about the guidelines and standards of what you have to do in regards to the MAS permit that maybe uh, might be important for the public to know about because if we're gonna watch for illicit discharges, your public is your best eyes. So illicit discharges, things that go into the bayous, the rivers, uh, any kind of other stormwater illicit discharges and things of that nature and maybe Tom Funchin 
touched on here earlier. Uh, he can maybe elaborate more on that. So lastly, attorney fees, trust and owe. Invoice 1292. Uh, this has to do with concerned citizens of Tarpon Springs. And on September 12th, 2022, I believe th three days after Mr. Trastano uh, announced their resignation, and then at uh, the meeting, I guess it was that morning of the 27th, I wasn't here, but Mr. Mara said that they were going to be withdrawing all their cases. So on September 12th, there's a billing notice here, draft substitution of counsel and proposed order which would mean they're going to be telling the court, hey, we're resigning, the city's going to be getting new attorneys, court's notified, we put things on hold till you all advise the court who your new attorneys are. We checked today, I, we, there's still no uh, filing, and yet they're no longer your attorneys. That should have been done Friday the 7th because their contract expired on Sunday the 9th. So I just want to point that out that we're still waiting to see the withdrawals. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. That's what I had asked this board to do multiple times. Just instruct the attorneys to file a withdrawal on both of those cases and on all cases they're involved in. Uh, but specifically, the Concerned Citizens case and Clay Colson's case. Now I don't know how that, what mechanism you go through to enforce that, to make them withdraw from these cases. And I don't know how, since this is about the attorney's fees, you can control how much they charge the citizens for what they're going to do from now on. They're no longer under contract. So, get with your new attorney, uh, figure this out, and as soon as possible, get them off of those cases. Check the docket, they have not withdrawn. And the man sat up here and said that they were gonna do it. And they did not. But I don't think that you guys ever instructed them to do it. So, I, I don't know if that had to happen in order for them to do it. I know they should have done it on their own, but they're no longer under contract. So uh, whatever you have to do, please clean that up. Uh, it absolutely has to take place. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just on that note, I, I checked with Mr. Dagnall over the weekend about that, and I'll be addressing that during our uh, contract with the uh, um, interim legal services a little later this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask for a motion in a second. Oh, let me ask, uh, Mr. Jump, are there any uh, remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on these items, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. No. Okay. Um, may I have a motion in a second, please, for approval? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, before we move to the quasi-judicial, I, I want to make sure you get the um, information on concerning, no kidding aside, the pothole that Ms. Protos brought up. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, on, um, so we're going to move on to the quasi-judicial uh, hearings. And we've got one item this evening, application 22-170 and 22-68. Um, this involves the um, car wash at the corner of Klosterman and US 19, and also the um, um, sign, the, the large billboard sign that's there. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask the city attorney to read the first ordinance uh, of application 22-170 car wash by title, and then give us the instructions for the quasi-judicial and swearing in the residents. We'll do a full hearing on that one and then move on to uh, ordinance, uh, the, the next two ordinances at the same time as part of this application. Ms. Jackson, if you will, please. Thank you. Ordinance 2022-03, 
an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, annexing 0.92 acres, more or less, of real property located at 38652 U.S. Highway 19 North on the northwest corner of U.S. Highway 19 North and Klosterman Road, application 21-170, providing for findings and providing an effective date. Thank you. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial quasi hearing, it is not the Board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the Board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The Board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find against the applicant. Thank you. Okay. Um, would you like to swear in any witnesses this evening? Yes. Do we have any witnesses? If you'd like to stand and... Please stand. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Vincent, I assume that's the applicant that's here. Okay. Um, is there anyone here that claims to be an affected party in this matter? Have any of the commissioners had any ex parte communications with the applicant? Let's go ahead and uh, with the presentation, Ms. Vincent, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is applications 21-170 and 22-68. These are running uh, in tandem. Uh, these are both applications are for annexation, land use, and rezoning. These are second readings. Um, these were approved at first reading. So um, if if it's okay with the board, I'll dispense with the real formalities of the presentation. Uh, there's been no new evidence uh, to enter into the record. Um, so application 22-170, which is the main car wash, um, the, the, the subject property is at the northwest corner of Klosterman and US 19. So you have the car wash and then you have this little tiny piece that's, that's in the corner of the property that is actual, actually is, locates, uh, is a location of a billboard. So that's all being annexed in together on second reading. So the application 22170 is the car wash. You have an ordinance to annex. You have an ordinance amending the future land use map from the Pinellas County designations of residential office retail to the city of Tarpon Springs uh, designation of commercial general. And you have a rezoning, um, a corresponding rezoning application, uh, ordinance 22-05, which amends the property from the zoning atlas designation in Pinellas County of commercial parkway to the city of Tarpon Springs designation of highway business. And then similarly for application 2268, which is the billboard, you have um, basically identical ordinances achieving the same thing, the annexation, the land use, and the rezoning. Uh, Planning and Zoning Board did uh, review these um, and did recommend approval, and they were recommended for approval by the board on first reading. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and answer any questions that the board might have on these applications. Okay. Uh, does the city uh, commission have any questions, Commissioner Eisner? I'm sorry, Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Renee, the city of Tarpon Springs is my understanding and the sign code doesn't allow billboards in the city of Tarpon Springs any longer. Um, so if this billboard is... It's uh, legally non-conforming upon annexation. What's that? It would be legally non-conforming upon annexation. <clears throat> so if we have a storm and it's destroyed, would they be able to rebuild it at that point? Um, I'm going to say no, but I don't have the ordinance absolutely in front of me, but generally non-conformings cannot be reestablished. And maybe we could have that for the second reading. The, the, I'm Just sorry, to, this is second readings. I'm not sure. Um, 
Oh, is this a second reading? These are second readings, yes. Okay. So. Sorry. My understanding is that it wouldn't be able to be rebuilt based on what I've heard in the past. So, okay. Um, no further questions. Commissioner Eisner. I have no questions. Commissioner Kulias. No questions. Okay. Does the applicant have any um, questions for Ms. Vincent? Okay. Ms. Vincent, would you like to um, enter the uh, written back up into the record? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's time for the applicant. Would you like to come up and at least state your name, address, and whether you have any um, comments or not, or a presentation that you'd like to make? Uh, Troy Carter, 904 Tomlinson Drive, Lutz, Florida. I'm a professional engineer in the state of Florida. Uh, again, as she mentioned, this is our second reading. We've been working with staff closely on this one. Happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Thank you. Hang on there a second. Uh, does the commission have any questions? Commissioner Carr? I've got no questions. Commissioner Eisen, Commissioner Klaus, uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, public comments, are there any public comments concerning this item? Mr. Geddes, if you have a public comment. Yes, Mayor, thank you. David Ballard, Geddes Jr., 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. My question would be relating to the water supply to this uh, car wash. Are they a self-water supplier? Do they have their own well point? Are they required to use the city's reclaimed water for their uh, water source, um, or do they use uh, city water, um, or do they use a blended form of water? Um, I do know that there is a car wash uh, man by the name of Neil Valk just built one on the corner of 580 Main Street and Belcher, uh, and he uh, has his own well points thereby he's his own water supplier whereas the rest of the residents in town should I wash my car I'm required to use reclaimed water should it be made available um, yet he uh, in that particular instance in Dunedin uh, was able to tap into the aquifer itself uh, to supply his uh, water needs and um, he doesn't pay a water bill as the rest of the residents would as a, uh, um, uh, a, uh, a business owner, um, I wondered if this particular car wash uh, also had that same set of circumstances where he was allowed to go into the aquifer for free water. Thank you. We'll, we'll hang on a second. We'll see if we can get you a, an answer in a second. Let's see if there's any other public comments. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Jump, are there any um, remote access comments? Online would like to speak on this item. Please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Ms. Jacobs, any emails? Um, if the applicant, uh, Mr. Geddes, um, presented his testimony comments in the form of questions, if you'd like to offer a rebuttal in the form of an answer, I would appreciate it. Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, so we are connected to city, water, and sewer. Um, we paid all applicable fees. We'll continue to pay whatever billing is necessary. I would state, because I think there was some confusion last time, we have a reclaimed system on site that is internal strictly to our operation. We recycle about 75% of our water. We do that to lower our water consumption but even that water ultimately will outfall to the sewer eventually. Um, so we're, we're not using any reclaimed water. The water we reclaim on site just cycles back through our wash. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and um, ask Ms. Vincent, do you have any closing comments? Uh, I just did want to make one clarifying comment. Uh, the billboard actually will be legally conforming under our code upon annexation. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and ask um, for comments from any commissioners. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, um, this is a, one of our main entrances to Tarpon Springs. This is a pretty big uplift of, of the property compared to where it was before, where it was an empty car lot and a kind of hand car wash area, closed down gas station. So uh, it is nice to see that this was redeveloped. Um, redevelopment is a key for Tarpon Springs to continue to grow and see some of the older buildings that are not historic um, driven, but be re redeveloped to something that is um, 
better for the tax base and really overall better contributing business to the city of Tarpon Springs. So I'm excited to see this here. Uh, it's a nice um, addition to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> yes, I just want to thank you. It's an uplift. Um, it's really a, uh, it was an eyesore. It's no longer, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Commissioner Cuyas. I, um, I agree. I, I think it's an excellent improvement for that corner. Um, it's there. <laughs> it looks wonderful. It's appropriate for the highway district, and I and, um, um, haven't tried it yet, but I probably will. So sure uh, welcome to Tarpon Springs. Um, if I can have a uh, motion to approve ordinance 2022-03 annexing the property into the municipal limits of the city of Tarpon Springs. Motion to approve. Second. If there are any further comments from the commission, roll call. Ed to announce that the legal advertisement requirements for ordinance 2022 4 and 5 were met and the public hearing was called by virtue of these ordinances being published by title with a map in the Tampa Bay Times on July 6th of 2022 and September 14th of 2022. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Uh, we're gonna go to ordinance 2022-04, amending Flume from Pinellas County Residential Office Retail to City of Tarpon Springs Commercial General. If I can have a, um, uh, Ms. Jacobs or Ms. Jackson, do we read the title again by or we have to? Go ahead, please. Yes. Ordinance 2022-04, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the future land use map for 0 0.92 acres, more or less, of real property located at 38652 U.S. Highway 19 North on the northwest corner of U.S. Highway 19 North and Klosterman Road from Pinellas County Land Use Designation, ROR, Residential Office Retail to City of Tarpon Springs Land Use Designation CG Commercial General Application Number 21-170 providing for findings and providing an effective date and as Ms. Jacobs just noted the legal advertising was done on July 6, 2022 and September 14, 2022 in the Tampa Bay Times by title and with a map. Thank you. May I have a motion and a second please? Motion to approve. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Also, Ordinance 2022 05, amending zoning atlas from Pinellas County Commercial Parkway to City of Tarpon Springs Highway Business. Ms. Jackson. Ordinance 2022-05, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the official zoning atlas of the City of Tarpon Springs for 0 0.92 acres, more or less, of real property located at 38652 U.S. Highway 19 North on the northwest corner of U.S. Highway 19 North and Klosterman Road from Pinellas County Zoning Designation CP, Commercial Parkway, to City of Tarpon Springs Zoning Designation HB, Highway Business, Application number 21-170, providing for findings and providing an effective date. The legal advertising for Ordinance 2022-05 was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on July 6, 2022 and September 14, 2022. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for that. Motion please. to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes, that ends uh, quasi-judicial item, 13, item 13A. We have to do item 13B just as we did 13A. Um, it's application 22-68. It's for the billboard that's also co-located on the property. Um, Ms. Jackson, if you could read ordinance 2022-19 annexing that particular property and then go through the quasi-judicial procedures again, and then also swear in any additional uh, witnesses that may have came, come in since the first item. Ordinance 2022-19, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, annexing 25 square feet, more or less, of real property located on the northwest corner of U.S. Highway 19 North and East Klosterman Road, application 22-68, providing for findings and providing an effective date Legal advertising for Ordinance 2022-19 was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map 
on June 29, 2022 and July 6, 2022. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the Board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the Board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The Board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinance, then the Board is required by law to find against the applicant. If there are any witnesses, would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give at this proceeding is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Okay. Ms. Vincent, if you could go ahead and make your presentation, please. Um, I would just enter into the record uh, my previous uh, presentation from this evening. Um, we do recommend approval of the annex. Hang, hang on. Yes, sir. I just want to go through before the presentation. Let me go through the ex parte and the other uh, again. Um, there aren't, are there any affected parties to this particular item? Has any um, commissioner had any ex parte communications, conflict of interest? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Vincent. Please proceed. Thank you. This is application 22-68. Uh, this is the billboard portion of the property. Um, as previously stated at, with the uh, previous application, the staff recommendation is to approve the annexation ordinance, the future land use map ordinance, and the rezoning ordinance um, as previously presented, and there's no new information to add to this uh, application. Thank you. Does the commission have any questions? Uh, Commissioner Carr? No questions. Commissioner Eisner? Commissioner Cuyas? Okay, the applicant, do you have any, just if you could come up and state your name for the record, please. Troy Carter, 904 Tomlinson Drive, Lutz, Florida. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access public comments? Anyone online would like to speak on this item? Please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Thank you. Um, Ms. Vincent, do you have any closing or summation? No, okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Um, do we have any um, comments from the commission? No? Okay. okay. We're going to go ahead and um, on item 13B, the application 22-68 billboard. Um, on item ordinance, uh, item one ordinance 2022-19. Uh, Ms. Jackson, if you could read the title again. Of 2022-19? It is an ordinance of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, annexing two fi 25 square feet, more or less, of real property located on the northwest corner of US Highway 19 North and East Klosterman Road, application 2268, providing for findings and providing an effective date. Thank you. We have a motion to uh, approve and second, please. Motion to approve ordinance 2022-19. Okay, thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Cuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, on item B2, ordinance 2022-20, Ms. Jackson, if you could read that item by uh, title, please. Ordinance 2022-20, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the future land use map for 25 square feet, more or less, of real property located on the northwest corner of U.S. Highway 19 North and East Klosterman Road from Pinellas County Land Use Designation ROR, Residential Office Retail, 
to City of Tarpon Springs Land Use Designation CG, Commercial General, Application number 22-68, providing for findings and providing an effective date. Ordinance 2022-20 was legally advertised and published in Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on June 29, 2022 and July 6, two, two, excuse me, 2022. That's okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, may I have a, a motion, motion and a second? Motion to approve, Mayor, of Ordinance 2022-20. I'll second. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, item 3, Ordinance 2022-21. Ms. Jackson, please. Ordinance 2022-21, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending the official zoning atlas of the City of Tarpon Springs for 25 square feet, more or less, of real property located on the northwest corner of U.S. Highway 19 North and East Klosterman Road from Pinellas County Zoning Designation CP, Commercial Parkway, to City of Tarpon Springs Zoning Designation HB, Highway Business, application number 22-68, providing for findings and providing an effective date. Okay, thank you. May I have a motion and a second to this one? I'm sorry, let me just, may, may I Go talk ahead. about yes. the publishing? The um, ordinance 2022-21 was published in the Tampa Bay Times by title with a map on June 29, 2022 and July 6, 2022. Thank you. May I have a motion, motion and a to, second? Yeah, motion to approve ordinance 2022-21, Mayor. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes, that ends the ordinances and resolutions. Um, we're going to go to the special consent agenda and um, we're going to um, do item nine first and then we'll take a, a break and then uh, begin on items 10, 11, and 12. So um, item nine is the approved direction for a temporary contract agreement and approved release of requests for proposals for city attorney services. Um, I'm gonna ask you to start this, Mr. LaCourse. Yes, um, thanks to the hard work of Janina Lewis. Um, we've been working on this again. This was supposed to happen, um, but got delayed due to the hurricane. But again, thanks to Ms. Jackson, we knew we were covered for this meeting, so we were we were fine in, in waiting that time with the hurricane. Um, I wanted Janina to come up and uh, she's done hard work, not only on, on researching and, and bringing to you a proposition for the process to get a permit uh, city attorney, which I think can go very quickly, um, but also good, got, done a good job of getting several good firms, included one that, that came in over the weekend to add to the, to the, to the um, groups that were um, agreeing to do some temporary services that we're going to ask them um, to involve all of them. So since Janita did all this hard work uh, during the 30 days while we were working at closing out business um, with Mr. Trask's firm, I'll have Janina tell you how she did and the product that she produced for you tonight um, for these two items. Janina. Good evening. Janina Lewis, Procurement Services Director. Honorable Mayor, Commissioners. Um, first, what I'd like to talk about, uh, as the city manager mentioned, is the fact that our previous city attorney resigned and gave us 30 days notice, and that kind of put us in a bind to be able to put something together very quickly, to be able to put it out there for firms to give us a proposal that you know would be proper and we'd be able to select the most qualified. Um, since the time frame was kind of short, uh, we, my recommendation to the Board of Commissioners, the Mayor, is that we do an interim type agreement, um, which is just basically to bridge the gap. Uh, we're looking for a period of no more than 90 days, with a possible extension if we don't get the um, new attorney on board by then. Uh, what I did was we reached out to several um, attorneys that had worked with the city in the past and a couple that were uh, known by like Dunedin and a few other local um, constituents of mine. Uh, what we did is I called and got the rates and the names of the attorneys that they would provide. Uh, we also asked them to provide us with their availability as well. Uh, so the 
the potential firms is the, the list on the back. There are three, but actually, as the city manager mentioned, a fourth one contacted us over the weekend, which was Vo's law firm, and we, we have added their information to the backup information. So what we're asking for is for you to consider the route you would like to take forward if you'd like to select using one attorney, using all attorneys. Uh, it's basically our recommendation to you as the board to determine the path you'd like to use for city attorney services in the interim. Okay. Thank you. Um, this item is not just for um, the interim services, but also to authorize the release of an RFP for permanent services as well. Yes, do you want me to go ahead and address that? Yeah, I think to go ahead, cause that, I think with that process and when they see it, I think that might lead into what I'm gonna recommend they do about the temporary one. Um, why don't you go into that, the permit process? Okay, uh, yeah. so the second piece to this is um, the request for release of the proposal requirements. Um, I have just listed out a few items that I thought were important for the board to know and the mayor. Uh, basically, we'd like to start out with initial term of three years on this contract. I, I'm not sure how the previous was set up. It was beyond me. Um, but a lot of the other cities and municipalities around us have a three-year term. Um, we can discuss that if you'd like. If that's one of your recommendations to make it longer, we can do that as well. Uh, the next suggestion is to update the termination clause. Instead of 30 days notice, uh, we would get at least 60 to 90 days notice, which would give us a proper amount of time to be able to put something together. Um, that's definitely up to you to determine how you would like to go forward with that. Um, my next one is how we will conduct the actual evaluation, and hopefully you've read through it or had a chance to read through it. But basically, since this is a charter member, the selection would be by the board. And the packages would come into our office and procurement services, we'll put them together. Uh, then they would be sent out to all of you um, to evaluate. It's basically a rack and stack of the top three that we'd like to interview. We would then set up the public meeting. They would come in, we'd do like a little presentation, an interview, and then the board will then decide and select future meeting. At that point, wh whoever your top selection is, we would begin a negotiation. If that falls through, then we would move on to the next. That's really the basis of the RFP right there. Um, the gist is just the, quali the quality and the criteria. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. You're welcome. Um, City Manager LaCourse, did you want to make a yes. recommendation? Um, like I say, luckily and obviously, we've got Ms. Jackson who can help us with with a lot of things. So we have her in place, but there are other needs that's not in her specialty, land use, code for there's some other things. Um, my recommendation, we just had the two other ones, and now that we have the three, would be for Ms. Lewis to get an agreement with all, with all three of them and be able to use them um, to cover all the meetings. I think we had almost every meeting covered with the, th with the two other ones. Um, the two other firms, and now with three, we'll definitely be able to cover it. Um, we've done a lot of work the last 30 days to try to prepare for things in the future, the charter amendments, so we're way ahead of what we have to do legally in-house where we don't need a lot, um, and Ms. Jackson can help us with, but as we, if you approve it, I'd like to take everything we've got a list on and, and possible, I believe the other three firms besides Ms. Jackson, I believe, I believe they're gonna be contenders um, for the attorney's job, which again, we want a fast track in process. So I would propose that we, we have Janita enter in agreements with all of them and we use them to cover um, different aspects and, and all the meetings in the hopefully no more than two months or three at the month, most before we get a permanent attorney involved. So that would be my recommendation to you. Okay, um, just for clarification, um, Ms. Jackson is a shareholder of Johnson & Jackson, who's been our labor attorneys on, under contract for the city for some time. Do, do you have an idea? Can you tell us how long that's been? Uh, I've been working with the city of Tarpon Springs since the year 2000. 2000, yeah. okay. In labor and employment. So Ms. Jackson's got quite a bit of experience. Uh, with us and, and you'll continue as our labor attorney regardless of what happens and, and we very much appreciate you being Thank here. You. Thank you. Um, so what the um, city manager is proposing, rather than selecting one um, firm as interim services, um, Johnson and 
Jackson is already under contract to the city, and there's three others that are not. And um, Ms. Lewis would have a um, provisional contract for each of those for a certain period of time, I think 90 days, in, in, um, as you stated, rather than just picking one for the interim services. And then, um, and that way we can make sure we've got all the um, meetings covered. And also it would give perhaps uh, the commission some experience to actually see some of these um, other attorneys in action. So um, that's the one item. And then before I go to public comments, one other item that would be part of this background, there were some questions concerning the, um, the litigation and the services, legal services for those. I discussed this with Mr. Dack, actually we exchanged emails uh, and I'd copied the city manager on this over the weekend. And um, the way that is the preferred approach is to turn all the cases over to um, the interim attorneys, whoever we may choose out of, if we go the route of all three, we would pick out one that would be the uh, interim attorney for the litigation. And then once we get a permanent attorney on board, then the cases would be turned over to the permanent um, attorney is the way that um, is the, is what is being requested at this point. That way, Trastagnol would be out of the loop altogether with the city. And um, I do want to mention, though, there is a caveat to that, that uh, Mr. Dagnall is also under contract with the Florida League of Cities, and they are insurer. And at times, there's monetary claims against the city, and there may be an occasion where he actually is um, defending the city, but that's through the Florida League of Cities. So I wanted to clarify that as well in case that comes up as a question later on. So let me go to um, public comments, and um, if you'd like to come forward. Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. So again, not just get them to file a motion to withdraw, but they have to notify and or your new attorney has to notify the court that you need between 30 and 90 days. So they could make a ruling. A lot of things can happen in this amount of time where you're waiting to replace them. And if you explain to the judge that they only gave you 30 days to uh, figure out how you're going to replace them, and then there was a hurricane, uh, I mean, it, you have to get that time. You have to ask for it. You have to notify the courts. And now I guess you're going to have to notify the Supreme Court of this. I mean, that you're not prepared to do any of this litigation. It has to be done this way. You have to make it clear to them. And you cannot, I mean, they, they had their representative up here say that they were going to withdraw. You trusted them. They haven't withdrawn yet. So are you going to trust them to notify the courts that you need 30 to 90 days? I think you need somebody else to notify the courts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robosky. Are there any other public comments? Hi, my name is Nancy Stuperich, and I'm an attorney with the Vos Law Firm. I just wanted to thank you and let you know we appreciate the opportunity to provide legal services uh, to the city of Tarpon Springs. Thank you. Um, city Manager, of course, if I can ask Ms. Lewis a question. Yes. Uh, Ms. Lewis, um, if the commission goes the route of the three firms this evening, uh, when would we have contracts in their hands for signing? Uh, we can have the draft contracts ready for them to review tomorrow and discuss kind of what p role or position or boards we'd like them to um, be prepared to attend. Okay. Uh, probably would take roughly a week to get week. back and, and, you know, fully signed and reviewed by all parties. Okay, thank you. That, that should help answer the uh, last question or comment that was made concerning this item. Um, Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Geddes, do, do you have a comment, sir? Hi, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, sir, Mayor. Uh, David Ballard Geddes, Jr., Georgia Avenue, Palm Harbor. Um, I've, I have attended a few of the Pinellas County Home Rule uh, Charter meetings, uh, and I believe uh, the Vos uh, Law Firm um, out of Orlando uh, had an attorney there, uh, Wade uh, 
Volfs. Um, and in regards to Pinellas County Home Rule Charter Section 2.04Q concerning transfers of functions and powers, um, I do have an issue with um, internal transfers and functions of powers regarding Pinellas County Home Rule Charter Section 204Q, which would also draw into question Vos Law Firm and the interpretation of that that particular part of the Home Rule Charter um, based in statute chapter 163 with the Interlocal Cooperation Act of 1969. I'm getting carried away here, I know, but I, I do uh, feel as though there's some issues that need to be brought before the board tonight regarding Pinellas County Home Rule Charter and the Vols Law Firm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Mr. Dawkins. Peter Lax, 514 Ashland Avenue. I really wasn't going to speak on this. I was going to save some of my comments about the magistrate, but I heard something here I really have to question. Um, I understand the need for attorneys to handle your different boards, to give you advice, but I have to question the fact of having an interim attorney come in and start working on cases and then a month, 60 days later, you got to transfer it over to a city attorney or maybe a third special counsel that would be assigned just to handle litigation. You got your special master to look at the big picture. You hire your city attorney to handle your boards, the regular functions of government, and then the litigation totally separate because you mentioned in the thing about the magistrates, I think it's on page two of your October 5th memo about keeping the city attorney, the new one, and the special magistrate uh, independent. But I would be concerned about the time and money you would be paying an interim attorney to spend hours to review all the records, and then by the time he's done all that or she's done all that, you got to say, well, we hired our city attorney to hand over your notes, and we've, you've spent all this money, and you're no further along. So uh, when we get to the magistrates, we can maybe discuss more about, you know, magistrate, your city attorney and a special counsel for your litigations uh, and then just hire them right off the bat you're going to be our litigating attorneys for this process whether it's mr colson whether it's concerned citizens whether you decide any other cases that you have on your attorney bills but i would recommend just don't jump in to an interim and then they got to do all that legal research expenses and then jump into a city attorney. So magistrate, city attorney, special counsel, and you can, through the resumes of these different firms, you can decide who would be best to handle it. You bring them in, you have an executive session, they review it, they say, look, these are your options. This is what you can do, what you can't do. What Start a fresh look, but you really you're wasting the city's money and time to do an interim and then transfer it over thank you thank you i completely understand all i'm going to say is we didn't put ourselves in this position it's a complex issue in fairness to uh johnson and jackson they're filling in for us tonight they're not in a position at this point that i'm aware of to take on litigation uh the soonest that we'll be able to get an interim attorney on board to deal with this matter uh, will be in about a week or so and then we'll just have to discuss it at that time there are some issues that I'm going to discuss later concerning the special counsel as far as the litigation and everything and that has a bearing on this matter as well but for the for for the for the discussion this evening it's just picking the interim services and then releasing the um, request for proposal or the invitation to bid um, for permanent services as well. But I completely understand it's a very um, inefficient process of transferring files. Um, 
and, and I just don't have an answer for you right now beyond that. I'm, I'm not an attorney, but we'll have to deal with that. Um, are there any other public comments here with, for anyone present? Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. Yeah. Nothing. Um, let's go to uh, commission comments. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mark, I need a little clarification from you about the, the hiring for the three four firms, all of them. Um, so at that point, who would be the person to decide which cases go with who and then who's determining how long or, or who's going to be covering the meetings, et cetera? You'd have um, me as the gatekeeper of that. There has to be somebody in charge of designating that out, so that would have to be me. Um, okay. To, to separate those things. And, again, I had a good – we had a good feel of, of division from what they said. We've got a new firm involved and stuff. But, again, and a lot of these things aren't to take it and finish it. It's to – for instance, some cases you just need to file that we're in the process of changing and, and we need to delay for, for two months and go forward. Some of them are just something that may need to be filed – you know, they're not going to take over and go. They're, they're all management things, and we've got them all laid out. Um, and, and it's, you know, it would be me because it has to be somebody, a gatekeeper of, of, okay, here's the 15 meetings we got to the end of the year. Um, here are the firms in coverage and divide them between the, <coughs> the firms and, and, and cover those meetings. Um, who would take the files? And, uh, and so that would have to be me or... Okay. You would have to so designate me, somebody to do that. Sure. Let me ask a question then. So would it be, would we want the same, I mean, myself, I would want the same city attorney at our board meetings for the city commission. I think it would be wise to have the same city attorneys for the planning and zoning board as well, too. Um, the same one, not necessarily the one that sits here, but that to not have rotated attorneys at all the boards. Um, so at least there's some understanding who the, who the board members are, a little bit about what we do in Tarpon Springs, et cetera. So I think well, that's an important factor. There'll just have to be some because of the scheduling and stuff and the short time of scheduling, but we're gonna try to keep it as consistent as possible. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, we're talking about six meetings, commission meetings. I understand, okay. I agree with you, but we're talking about six commission meetings over the 90 day period. Okay. Um, Are we current we're currently contracted with Johnson and Jackson so there's is there not, there's not a need to do another well we need we probably them. need a little addendum or how that hurt just a little addendum that they're doing these services that would have to be approved by the Commission anyway right mm -hmm. well you'd approve me that'd be for that'd be CD. one of the things we you'd approve tonight for us to enter that little addendum. it'd be agreements with the other firms it'd be an addendum um, just a you know very okay. simple addendum um, of covering services needed by the city Johnson Jackson sure. that's what we're asking you to approve tonight okay so and if I could go to our procurement director um, so attorneys draft contracts um, we would have a contract that we'd provide them a template of some sort I would imagine or would we ask Miss Jackson to draft it for us on our behalf or we, we have a, a, an agreement she would probably just review for the others that we would send out okay and then they would come back to the board the next board meeting and w they would be officially approved at that point Oh, no, you'd be approving that now for us to enter in those agreements. They've already sent us agreements that we haven't read, though, as a board. You should have in your backup of what you got, the fees and, and what they're, you know. That, okay, the fees are there. I understand that point. But there's more to an agreement itself. We always get the agreements to review before they're signed. So you're asking us to approve in an agreement tonight that we don't know what it is. You understand what I'm saying? No, but. Okay. <laughs> So you're asking us <laughs> we to gave you the parameters that the firms that they're hourly and stuff they would do and that's all we would put we would document what they proposed to us in their proposals for temporary services okay so there's terms and conditions also mm -hmm. that's typically comes before the board as well to be reviewed that's the part that i think we're missing if, if out. you want to extend the process then uh, again i'm not interested in extending the process it's just what it is right this is where we're at so i'm not trying to play hardball in this situation to me i think we should hire one one team at the end of the day we've got J johnson and jackson as a backup uh instead of using all three of them i mean we could look at johnson and jackson they have um the i'm not sure how to say the individual's name but daryl mckeeter he's billing 350 per hour but when we have two other firms that are billing 175 so it's double of what two of the other firms are charging 
I understand so, what you're saying, but to do that, then we'd have a process for you. We'd have to have a process and a similar mini process to choose who, which one of these firms are the temporary attorney. Um, obviously, there's other attorneys on that list of provided fees that have a far less in experience in land use, and we would use those. So um, there's only two ways to do it. You'd, you'd set up a process um, where you do interviews and a mini process, and you select who the temporary one is, um, again, with Jackson as the backup, or, or this way while we, we speed through. It, it, it's your choices. It just... You know, sure. No, so this is what I'm saying. I'm, this is what I'm getting at. I think the, the Voss Group has got a, an extensive list of attorneys that represent an extensive list of communities as well, too. I mean, it, it would probably be a good idea to utilize them. Has there been any discussions with any of the attorneys? Can you cover all these meetings, or is it just let's take the easier route and say let's, let's contract with everybody? <laughs> it's not the again. You want to explain again, Janina? What I don't have the details on this. I'm just this is stuff that I'm trying to figure out. So I don't. To laugh at it, I'm just trying to understand where I, we're at with it. That's I, what think, I think what the city manager is trying to do, and for Ms. Lewis, it would be a meeting by meeting. I think that would be it. And anything that would involve outside that meeting, but it would be specific to that particular meeting. And um, perhaps what, um, in, in order for a middle ground, maybe the city manager in, in within the next commission meeting can provide a list of the attorneys that have been assigned to the various uh, Sure. meetings and then and that would be for consideration of the commission I, I think it's strictly going to be an hourly rate if I'm not mistaken is that correct I think that's all I mean I, I'm not so, sure about the terms and conditions but yeah let me I mean, I mean so the terms and conditions has to be something we put in the um, motion tonight that we give the city manager approval to approve the terms I and conditions you know, not a contract terms of conditions but the commission's conditions on the city manager for moving forward it would technically be the contract terms and conditions because he would be signing them on okay. our behalf as the board. Um, we're just approving the dollar amount tonight. So that's what they're, that's what he's asking for. So that, I'm just I, I, saying that's, it's a, it's a something formality we have to figure out here. Um, going back to, um, going out to bid for the rest of the items, uh, I would like to look at the three year term makes sense. Um, Ms. Lewis, I think also the, um, Geez, when you extend it another year or two, I think that makes sense as well, too. It's a mutual. You both yeah, have so to extend it. Yes, it would be an additional two-year period. Um, you both come to an agreement with that. Um, termination clause, 60 to 90 days, obviously is a no-brainer in the situation that we're in today. Um, I do like the fact of not having travel time to be charged. Uh, I don't think that's something that we should have, and I think that was a, a good point to be brought up. Um, and then also a no-inflation rider. That is just a fixed cost across the three years. Um, and then the two years that go behind that. Um, so with that, though, I think it's important that we add that the city manager has the ability to sign on our, or on our behalf without approval of seeing the terms and conditions. For those temporary services, uh, the 90 days makes sense uh, for the temporary services with an option to extend as well, too. Um, I don't see a need to do all of them. I, I think there's a couple of them on here that have enough experience in here that we could limit just maybe two of them out of the four, um, the Voss Group and jo Johnson and Jackson. Um, and if we want to add a third one, we'll do the um, Salzman and Jensen as well too out of Trinity would be where I land. Thanks. Commissioner Eisner. Thank you. Um, I read through this in very in entailed and uh, they all look like good candidates, but we've been budgeted for uh, 175, 185 an hour. Um, so my consideration, at least on the onset, would be between Vos and uh, Salzman Jensen. I don't know if there's any travel time involved in it. I know that Vos asked uh, to do a 15,000 per month um, flat rate. Um, the only thing I was concerned about with those was that they have attorneys all over the county and they're, um, I, I don't think they have enough attorneys in one area to um, accommodate our six meetings. Um, I don't particularly care to go through um, having different attorneys. Um, this is not a trial. As Mr. Delac has said, I would prefer to have one attorney 
uh, for the three months. If they work out, we could continue it as a contract. If they don't work out, um, we are on the on term. On the interim, we can um, see and meet others and decide whether there's a better fit. But I would like to see us go with one and not have to. It's hard enough transitioning from one attorney to another. It's even harder when you have to transition and getting a 30-day notice. Um, and that's what we'd be doing two and three times. So on, on that, it, it's just not a good business decision to make. Um, like I said, I, I liked Vo's presentation, um, but I don't know if they have enough attorneys local. I, I, I read it that they have one here, one there, you know, in that kind of situation. So I only knew of one in this Pinellas area. Um, I would love to know on Salzman Jensen how many attorneys are in the area. That's not here. So um, that would be, but that would be the route I would go um, just because they're local, they're in Trinity. I don't want to deal with people that are, you forget about the travel time in, in costs, but the travel time in a car accident or, uh, you know, I'll joke with you, a snowstorm. Um, but, you know, whatever it is, I, you know, I want to make sure that they're here, um, and I would like somebody more local. So, and I did see that the others coming in out of Tampa is a whole lot different. I mean, they'd be coming here through rush hour every day. So those are things that really concern me. And the, the price is, is another thing. Um, you know, a Cone Mooney is 225 an hour and 250 for litigation. Again, I don't have any fee on what uh, Salzman charges for litigation. Is that included? You know, so there is bits and pieces that is missing from here to make an educated decision. Uh, but I would try to go with something that's comparable to what we've already been accustomed to, price-wise, and see if it works out. Okay, let's just follow through with the commissioner comments and we'll, we'll go from there and see if we can kind of gather <coughs> things together. Uh, commissioner Cuyas. I mean, I'll leave it at the direction of um, the city manager and I, I'm just hoping that my main concern is this 30 to 90 days period involving some land use issues with, you know, and Clout Harbors. I want the best of the best and I want people to be able to defend the city. I'm worried about, um, you know, there, there's a lot, there's a broad network of legal counsel and stuff, and, and just want to make sure we we get a firm that's willing to work with us and and go to bat. You know, and that's my main concern for the 60 to 90 days, and then the permanent hiring. I believe uh, the city manager can do a good job in in fitting in those uh, you know attorneys and different meetings for the time being, but uh, I think we should expect that well, we're going to spend some money on legal fees and councils uh, this year. So thank you, Mayor. Okay. Uh, just for clarification, the city commission's got six meetings over the 90-day period. The PNZ board has three. The Board of Adjustment and Appeals has three. And I don't know of any other... Heritage Preservation. Heritage Preservation has three, if they meet. If they meet. If they meet. So we're talking about 15 meetings altogether out of the attorneys that you see. I don't know that there would be an issue filling the need for those 15 meetings with the three firms along with um, Johnson and Jackson. Um, so I understand the hourly rate, I understand the travel, but at this point, I think we're not in a real good position to kind of get into the weeds on this matter. Um, I think that um, you have some information from other city managers in the area. I think one or two of these firms also are backups for Pinellas County, is that correct? Yes. So it's a little more than what we just see in front of us this evening. And I'd like to just to make sure that we don't wind up having to cancel a meeting, um, a PNZ meeting, PNZ board meeting, or a conditional uh, use meeting, I'm sorry, a board of adjustment meeting, I'd like to give some discretion to the city manager to, to fill those and um, do what is best to fill the three meetings for each of those 
uh, boards with the same attorney. Mm -hmm. And it may cost us, from a marginal perspective, maybe an extra $25, $25 an hour or $50 an hour. But I think that's boiling down to the cost of business of where we are right now. Um, as far as the, um, um, the permanent services um, for, the, for a city attorney, um, I think, Commissioner Carr, if I'm not mistaken, that's where you're getting into the terms and conditions. Is that correct? The permanent services as well, or just for the interim services? Too? The interim services. The interim the, services. We'll okay. have the terms and conditions when the next proposal comes before us for the, the permanent one. Okay. Um, I, again, I'm not sure how we're going to deal with this tonight, except as of right now, we don't have an attorney other than Ms. Jackson, as you see right here. We don't have a, 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 an attorney for the PNZ board. We don't have one for the Board of Adjustment. We don't have one for the His Historic Preservation Board. And um, we need to do something tonight to provide the city manager discretion for fill those, uh, to fulfill those, uh, um, at least the most rudimentary requirements that you've proposed, which I think was in trying to make to have the same attorney at the three meetings over this interim period. I think that's- And code enforcement, I forgot code enforcement. Code enforcement, yeah, there you go. That's so that's 18, meetings. Eight, 18, yeah, 18. Mayor. Meetings. Mayor. Yep. I, I mean, I can make a motion. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to make a motion to move forward and try to close this one out. Make a motion. Okay, we've gone to uh, public comments. We've gone to the commission. It's time for a motion. Uh, hold on, is there another com uh, comment? I just want to know, it, did anybody make a call to see if any of these uh, attorney groups are able to handle all of the meetings that we have, these 15 meetings? I, I think the, the approach that, you correct me if I'm wrong, what you're recommending is we've got um, Johnson and Jackson under contract. We need a, an amendment for that to cover some additional, and then I think the city manager is recommending to do a short-term contract for each of those other three. So we would have a total of four law firms that we could actually pick attorneys from, or at least the city manager could pick attorneys from those for each of the boards that we just described. See, I'm not in favor of picking three different attorneys. I'd like to stay with one. No, no. It would be three firms that the city manager could pick one firm, one attorney from a firm to cover the three meetings for each of the boards. I agree with you, yes. Yeah. But what I'm getting at, he, he may not be able to get all the attorneys from one firm to cover the 18 meetings or whatever the number was that I described. But you could yeah. jump in and correct me and, if I'm And again, wrong. if we do that with one, there needs to be a process. We can't just, I mean, they've all been it's confirmed be that they've done this. Compared. You know, you need to set up a process for the temporary one to come on. So now we'd be entering the next two weeks while we're trying to do the permanent process, trying to do a temporary process to pick, which, which we, you know, could do. We may miss some meetings, but um, that's the problem, to pick one from what's come in for temporary, there would need to be some kind of mini process to who that one is. Um, and the time frame we're going, we just, you know, you know, what we recommended, we think will work and it'll be faster and get things at least covered and held together. All we're trying to do is hold things together, not move forward a lot to save for the attorney. Okay, Any, let me just ask, is, are you okay right now? Well, I don't know. I think Jana was getting up. Did you want to We answer? did check the availability of all the firms for the different boards, and, like, they all responded with their availability, and, and each one can cover, like, several boards or one board in a row. Like, planning and zoning would be the same. They could do all of them. Right. If, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, but they didn't all agree that they could handle all 15, is what you're saying. There were two firms that did say that, um, but they didn't all have the same attorney for every board. Uh, was the same firm, every board, but not the same individual. Well, I think, not to be selfish, but we would be um, considering having one attorney here. But the other boards, we've had, um, you know, replacement attorneys yes. uh, for this board and for all boards. So. Uh, just on those 15 meetings, I mean, it would be advantageous to have somebody who can be um, for the most of them, and if we need fill-in, we need fill-in. 
I just don't know if we should be jumping into three different uh, attorneys because we have, and we all know this up here, a lot of ground to cover with things that have been changed and needs to be unchanged. So, I, just let me ask for a little uh, explanation. Um, you're you're saying one law firm, right, to cover all the meetings. If Jana says that there are two that say they could do that, but not necessarily the same attorney for the same board for the three times that they meet over the 90-day period. I, I would like to keep one attorney on the Board of Commissioners, but the other boards, it's whatever they could supply. Okay. I, I think what, what you're going to find out and what I've, I kind of try and think ahead a little bit, a little bit, is, is that whoever the attorney is is going to have to come up to speed on what the city's ordinances are and, and right. processes as far as how we do business. And I, th I think that was one of the desirable aspects of having the same attorney for the, for the board over the three or four meetings that we would need them rather than, um, I'm talking about beyond just the city commission, I'm talking about the planning and zoning board and also the uh, board of adjustment. Each of them have their separate rules of procedure. They all have their separate uh, review criteria. And I, I, I would like to keep, if we could, the same attorney for each of those, one attorney for a, the P and Z board for the three meetings that they have. It doesn't have to be the same attorney for the board of adjustment, a different one. I understand. That, yes. That's all I'm getting yes. at. And I don't think that, Ms. Lewis, if I'm mistaken, you're saying that they said that the firm could cover all 18, but not necessarily the same attorney would be at the, at the, at the, at a P and Z board as an example for the three meetings. Correct. It would be maybe 90% of the time the same person and then maybe a different attorney would attend for a different date. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what you're saying makes sense. Uh, but I understand what Mark's asking for. He's asking for flexibility because um, Pearson may be able to do the code enforcement boards, but he, they may not be able to do the planning and zoning boards. So I, under, I get that. So I, I'm, I understand you're, that. You're okay with that? Yeah. Let me, Com Commissioner Cuglia, do you have anything else to say? No, I just think we, we need to let the city manager try to fill those spots as needed for the time being. Okay. Commissioner Carr, we're ready for your motion. Okay, thank you. Um, there's going to be a multiple parts to this. Um, so motion to approve uh, the city manager to move forward to contract with the four firms that applied for the temporary uh, attorney fees and um, attorney uh, needs for the city um, with the hourly rates uh, published uh, in our backup um, with the preference of the city commission having the same attorney at all of our meetings with the planning and zoning board having the same attorney with a secondary available um, and the same with the board of adjustment and code, code enforcement and heritage right. preservation yeah. that's it um, with the, there's going to be additional, so there's two parts of this. The second part is going to be for the RFP that goes out for, um, let's do one at a time. Okay. 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 And then, um, but the city manager has the authority to sign the contracts, um, with the law firms before coming back to the board of commission and that the city manager is going to provide a detail on which firms are going to handle um, the litigation portion of um, the city and then also the boards within two weeks. Three weeks. Two is fine? No, no, whatever is fine. I'm yeah, just, two weeks. I, I think it'd be okay with him. Three weeks is okay with you. Well, up, I can give update next. I'll give update where we are next meeting. As soon as, as, soon as he has it. If it's sooner than three weeks, you'll have it. Okay. And then I'm going to hold off on the RFP portion of it. For right now. Yeah. Okay. Is that the motion? Yes. May I have a second, please? I'll second. If there are no further commission comments, roll call, please. Commissioner Fouillas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. Now for the RFP. Sure. Um, uh, long term. Before you RFP. make 
Can I ask uh, one more thing on the RFP that I wanted to add, and that's entirely up to the commission as well, is if a firm suggests the first and third Tuesday of the month for board meetings, is that uh, Flexible. A, a doable item, or is that something that you're not willing to consider of a firm? You mean for the city commission? Yes. <coughs> Some firm may or? only be able to do a, a first and third Tuesday of the I month. I think that was the question of, of, of that. And, and I think what she's asking you is, is um, you know, is, is should we put in a definitive bid that it has to cover the second and fourth, or is there flexibility to possibly move back? Um, You're from talking about first the permanent RFP. Now. Permit, for the permit. I, I'm flexible, but I don't know about the rest of the commission. Um, Commissioner um, Carr, sure. would you like to weigh yeah, in on that? Yeah, uh, I'm flexible on that one. To me, I, I think it's best to get a, a great attorney. Um, if, if we have a great attorney apply for this, I want to be able to be flexible to their schedule. Um, they may have other commitments on those days. Uh, in the past, we actually had to move for attorney Trask uh -huh. when he took over to the different day because he had commitments on the, our other meetings. So it's not unusual to see something like that. Commissioner Eisner. Okay. I'll do what needs to be done. Thank you. Commissioner Quiers. Uh, Commissioner Carr brought up a good point, and we're very flexible for the city. So, you have your answer, Ms. I, I just want to make sure it's apples to apples. And That's okay. fine. Thank, Thank you for asking. I'd prefer not, but <laughs> <laughs> you've already committed. <laughs> so, um, Commissioner Carr, if you'd like to continue with your motion. Yeah, uh, um, I'll make a motion um, as staff uh, prepared a request for proposal requirements. Uh, with the addition of a couple items that there's flexibility in our schedule um, based on attorney availability with the preference of keeping the current um, as is, but with flexibility if there needs to be changes, uh, that there be no inflation riders uh, during the term of the agreement, uh, that the termination clause would be up to 90 days, uh, that there would be no travel time included uh, in the fees, and I believe that's it. Do you hear anything on that one? You're okay with that? Okay. Um, Commissioner, uh, I need a second. I'll second that. Okay. If there are no other comments or issues, uh, Commissioner Eisner, go ahead. Could we put in a stipulation to accept a flat rate as well? I'm not sure. What does that mean, flat rate? Normally it would be like a retainer. Is that what you're... No. I mean a flat rate for the entire month. Because that we have gotten that is um, offers. That's a. Jack. I think he's talking about the all what you know hourly retainer. Can it be different combinations of of in the bids what they are? Right. You mean as they do their pricing proposal? Yes. Okay. Yes. So they 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 will explain their pricing proposal to us and how they will work it uh, when we do the you know the overall pricing. We're only looking at the retainer fee at that time for, you know, for being able to rack and stack them. Thank you. So, so for clarification, it's retainer fee and then additional hours will be charged at an hourly rate, right? Correct. They, will, they, they can outline how they charge, uh, you know, paralegals, um, primary attorney, alternate attorneys, uh, so forth. But you'll make it apples to apples at the end of the day. Yes. Okay. For, okay. Please amend your motion on that to that effect. I, you did. Commissioner, good. you were going to second it? I'll second yes. Okay. Roll call. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. You okay? Yes. Oh, right. Can I make one more comment, Mayor? I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. So now that this RFP is approved, it's just a reminder that we will go into a cone of silence once this RFP goes onto the street, so there's no contact with any of these firms or any potential firms, except for the ones we're in business with at the time. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for that warning. <laughs> <laughs> thank, right. you for thank you, Ms. Lewis. <laughs> Thanks. All right. What we're going to do is take a break. Uh, it's 843. Uh, let's be back here at 855.
Um, we're going to go uh, to item 10 now, and um, and then I do want to mention ahead of time for everyone's uh, information that we have a video stenographer arranged for agenda items um, 10 and 11, and that uh, in case we have the, uh, we need a legal transcript at a later date. So I just want to let everybody know that. Um, Agenda item 10 is Anclode Harbor emails. Um, Commissioner Eisner, this is your item, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor. First, I want to thank you all for coming and listening online. Tonight, I'll be sharing 150 emails with you. These represent only, only a small portion of the 753 emails relating to the Anclode Harbor development dating back to 2017. For me, these emails paint a disturbing picture. These are the actual emails being sent to and from city staff using the city's email system. In these e emails, assorted staff, past commissioners, attorneys, and a few residents appear to have been knowingly allowed or actually changed official documents for the possible future personal benefit. Our city attorney not only did not try to stop this, but appears to have been complicit with them. Of the 753 total emails, I've elected 150. All the emails are available for you at a public record, and extremely, it's an extremely large file and can be downloaded using the link on the City of Tarpon Springs Board of Commissioners agenda. <clears throat> Reading these do not imply any guilt. That is not my job. That would be decided by somebody else. I believe it's important for our community to get a sense of the amount of time an effort that the city staff put into the Anclote Harbor Apartments. While on city time and with whom they did it, the emails in total show there was a substantial background staff work on proposed Anclote Harbor Apartments project before it was even discussed publicly in 2021. Spe specific parts of the land development code and comprehensive plan and effect all future projects were changed during that time in what appears to be cooperation with the Morgan Group's representation and consultants to grease the wheels for this project. Interestingly, interestingly the Anklet Harbor Apartments project was not mentioned at any public meetings during this time frame. The amount and the extent of staff work before the project was discussed publicly is troubling. It's not reflective of open, fair, and objective government. Also, it demonstrates how city staff were involved in setting zoning and land use policy without getting any direction, first from the city commission. At least there was no written evidence that the commission was aware of these activities. Although based on the emails, at least one commissioner was aware that an apartment project was being considered for the former Walmart site. So before I read some of these emails, I wanted to read some of these staff emails. And what my, we have, my God, can we make that any smaller up there? <laughs> um, what I tried to do is, the people I'm going to be reading about is their names are up there and their titles of what they have, um, what, what they are to the city or to the program or to the Morgan Group. So. I have here Heather Erwiller is our ex um, planning and zoning board person. So when you hear the name Heather, that's who that is. So she, um, the other person I wanted to bring out since you may not be able to see it is Ed Armstrong. Ed Armstrong is the attorney for the Morgan Group. Um, so this is a from Heather Erwiller to Ed Armstrong and Mark copied in Mark LaCorris. And it says, Dear Ed, as promised, I'm attaching the staff report and backup to the proposed LDC changes. The planning and zoning meeting is next Monday, 128 on 2019 at 7 p.m. in City Hall. I'd recommend you have a look at the live stream from last night's Board of Commission meeting, which you can find there. The Walmart site was discussed around one hour and 52 minutes by Peter Delacus. I let the city manager know you'd be following up with him. Have a nice day, and I hope you're feeling very much better. So my question only is on this, why is somebody giving information to someone else about a resident that was speaking? He has every right to look whenever he wants to. Um, 
the staff report is the ordinance 2019-02 to amend the land development code article 6 section 96 authority and requirements an ordinance of the city of tarpon springs florida amending paragraph d of section 96 of article 6 of appendix a comprehensive zoning and land development code by increasing the duration of a development agreement by providing for severability and providing for an effective date. What that means in plain English is the development code was changed to an extended period of time, which is why we had a situation back when we were discussing the hotel that we were not able to, it, whether we liked it or not, to give a 10-year development code to anybody else. Until this code is changed back to what it originally was, we had no business to give anybody a development code or development permit here in the city. This ordinance, number 2019-02, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending paragraph of section Article 6 of Appendix, Comprehensive Zoning and Land Development Code by increasing the duration of development agreement by providing for severability and providing for an effective date. These are hand grenades for us. That's what they are. They're giving developers 10 years to do whatever they feel like doing. Um, this board wouldn't be here down the road when the decisions are being made. Um, another ordinance that was here is um, Ordinance 2019-03, and I'll just read the part. The word lapsed to expired, adding or designate to approval by the city manager amending the expiration provision of an approved conditional use, adding a waiver of the one-year expiration and providing an alternate expiration schedule when a conditional use is approved. So I have to ask, this was a city manager approval. And I don't know if it went, did the commission even know this? So I went back to listen to some of these recordings and I watched Heather at the time um, try to convince the planning and zoning board to extend the 10 years and they were adamant about not wanting this code changed. And I remember Justin Vesey asked the question of the board of, of, have we had any issues? Have we had any problems that we need to change it to a 10 year period? And I remember she had quoted by saying that we did have a problem at the Bayshore area project. So they asked what was the project? What was the, what was the problem? And they said, well, they had to come back for because it took so long, they had to come back to the board for reapproval. So he asked, "Well, was it approved?" And he, she said, "Yes." So the way I see that, that wasn't a hindrance. That was checks and balances. That's what we look for: checks and balances. So she then took that and went to the board of commissioners, and I don't know how she did that, but she convinced them to change it to a ten-year, and that's what we're sitting with now. Mind you, it says, whereas the city of Tarpon Springs deems to be in the best interest of health, safety, and welfare of its citizens to provide for flexibility in setting the expiration dates. This didn't benefit Morgan Group or a developer. It benefited you. How? I'd love to know. Nobody could seem to explain to me how it benefited the residents. Whereas the Board of Commissioners realizes the lack of certainty in the approval of development can result in a waste of economic and land resources. So if we give them 10 years, they won't waste our resources? Is that what I'm understanding? Whereas the Board of Commissioners recognizes the providing the ability to waive the one-year expiration date of conditional use when approved in conjunction with a development agreement provides additional certainty to developers you bet it provides them certainty. It provides certainty that they could go through two or three different board of commissioners. They could approve things down the road and, and push and, and do whatever they need to do to get it done. We should have the ability to re-examine everything that they come before us with.
So this page that I'm looking at is, Dear Ed, this was the email. It's hard to follow emails because they're on threads of four or five, so bear with me. But it says, Dear Ed, I promised, and he, she wrote about Peter Delacus in his 52, min, uh, you know, 52 minutes into the area. He wrote back, thank you, Heather, FYI. Camille, who is, I guess, the main deal in the Morgan Group, has authorized Cindy Terrapani to appear on behalf of the Morgan Group to request a code change along the lines of what we discussed for the conditional use code section. Just wanted to give you a heads up. So what I have here, which you can't see, is they re Ed rewrote um, our codes and sent it to her for approval. And I know you can't see this, but all these lines that are crossed out um, were rewritten by Ed Armstrong, as it says here, Morgan Group proposed revision. Now, since when does the Morgan Group write our code enforcement and, and, and our code development? But it's here. And this is what was accepted and presented. So I have here, again from Heather, we look forward to the proposed changes to Ed Armstrong and Cindy Terrapani before the close of business today with the revised hearing schedule. Let me know if anything is missing. Who's running our city? So it also sent, says here, we sent our changes to Erica for review. Erica is Tom Trask's partner, if anybody doesn't know that. She agreed that the changes are significant enough to warrant pulling this item from Monday night's planning and zoning board and re-advertising. The new hearing schedule will be as followed, and it gives you the new hearing for the planning and zoning, the board of commissioners, and the board of commissioners' second reading. Is this legal? This is from Heather to, mind you, I will be giving you numbers on all of the people and how many times their name was on each email. So you'll have an idea of who the players were and who they weren't. So this is from Heather to Ed Armstrong, Cindy Tarapani. Dear Ed and Cindy, attached is the revised language the city staff will be recommending to the Board of Commissioners. Mind you, this is written by Ed Armstrong. This item has been removed from the Monday, January 28th, Planning and Zoning Board, and re revised language will be re-advertised, and the new public hearing schedule will be as follows. We have, this is another ordinance, and I won't read the whole ordinance, just a couple of parts, whereas the city of Tarpon Springs deems it to be in its best interest for health and safety and welfare of citizens to provide for flexibility in setting expiration dates. And again, these are all ordinances that were changed accordingly to accommodate a future item. These were all back in 2019. So in answer, when Heather wrote to Ed and Cindy, he wrote back, thank you, Heather. I really appreciate what you've done for us. These are the staff emails. These are not the 150 I was talking about. So I don't know if you remember, but one of the questions Commissioner Coolius asked Camille Salam was who was at that first meeting? And Salam didn't remember. He knew that Mark LaCorris was here, but that's all he remembered. So this is a letter from our secretary, Trish, and it says, please write a letter for me to sign to the sim similar to Karen's, Karen Lemons, 
and add how I feel this project is important to the future growth of Tarpon and encourage them to pursue it. Thank you, David Banther, Vice Mayor, City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, using Vice Mayor email. But he wasn't there. How did he meet this guy? Now, if anybody's ever met Dave Banther, he's not forgettable. So the letter was, hello, Camille. It was very nice to meet you yesterday, learn more about you and the Morgan Group, as we discussed during the meeting. Our city team believes the residential multifamily concept you presented for the site would be an excellent, excellent use for the property. It'll fill a need for the city for upscale apartment dwellings and add to the quality of life for area residents. I reached out to Dan Earls and left a message for him. I will follow up with you uh, after we talk. This is from John Tarapani to Karen. Um, thanks, very nice note to Camille. Should go a long way in helping achieve a current level for the Morgan Group to invest in Tarpon. Thanks again, enjoy the nice weather for the weekend. Why is he involved? This is from Cindy Tarapani. Karen, thank you so much for your support. We also appreciate the staff's time yesterday to discuss the project and look forward to working with you. By the way, these are all in October 2017. October 2017. So Camille responds, um, Karen, it was sincerely a pleasure to meet you also. I met with the Walmart broker, Dan, on Friday, and I'm confident your efforts were influential in getting the meeting. It's the first thing he mentioned when answering my call. Dan committed to doing his best to get Walmart focused on this opportunity. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I'm looking forward to working with you, too. Then we have Camille. Um, this is to David Banther. Thank you for the letter. It was sincerely a pleasure meeting you, too. I've not received a response yet to Morgan's offer from the seller. I will send you an update if we get a signed LOI. I hope we have the opportunity to enhance Tarpon Springs together. And my comment is, he told, Salam told PK, he did not meet any commissioners, and they never met. But there was ex parte communication. It's here. By the way, all these emails you can read on your own. I've been through them four times. They're nauseating. So this is from David Banther back. Let's stay on the Walmart rep. And he's sending that to Karen Lemons. Again, I don't know why a commissioner would do that. I comment here, I don't know. Maybe does Karen work for Dave Banther? I don't know. So then we have another one from John Terrapani. This is now 2018. Karen, could you please call me as soon as possible concerning the Walmart site? There's some movement and there is important opportunity for your involvement. Camille Salam with the Morgan Group, who you met, asked me to contact you. Mind you, I can't talk about any of the phone calls or the meetings, I wasn't there. But if this is what was put in writing, I leave that to your imagination, whether you think it's more or less. So then I have Mark LaCorris, who we've spoken quite a bit about this, to Heather. Uh, Mark, I finished the, uh, this is first from Heather. Mark, I finished the update to the future land use element, coastal element this weekend for the wetland, upland, habitat, conser conservation sections. I've sent two ordinances to the city attorney for review. So whoever said that our attorney wasn't involved, he was. He saw this. I will send the draft language to Cindy Tarapani, Ed Armstrong, and Katie Cole. As soon as I hear back from the city attorney, should I be sending the proposed changes to anyone else? The tentative hearing schedule as follows, planning and zoning board, 
on November 19, 2018, with the first reading on December 4th at the BOC, and then on to the state and county for review. Please let me know if the Board of Commissioner date works and if you want to see the changes. So Mark responded, the schedule is good. I don't need to see it. Thank you for all your work, Mark. From Cindy Tarapani to Heather and to Mark and to Camille and to Ed Armstrong, dear Heather um, and Mark, on behalf of the Morgan Group, we want to thank you for your time meeting with us last week. We now have a much better understanding of the process for the project as a result. At the meeting, there was some additional information that Heather stated she would research and respond to us. Based on meeting notes, these are items that we need you to research and do guidance on. So they asked for a CHHA, which is a coastal high hazard, flood zone maps, access for a second um, entrance on Hayes, um, where the Hayes Road is on a city or county right of way. Um, they wanted a plan a, a amendment. I'm just trying to go through this because this, this is ridiculous. Um, but truthfully, my comment on here is, was our attorney mostly not present in all of these negotiations? He was aware of it, but their attorney was on every single email and our attorney was not. Did he do his job? Was he there to protect our city or not? That's the question I know I'd like to ask him. Heather to Cindy, in review of the LDC section 209, I find no evidence that suggests that second access point must be included in the conditional use. Review for the proposed project on this parcel number, this item may be deferred and reviewed in conjunction. Um, dear Cindy, it appears the city's future land use is split for the site as well, so we need to complete not only a countrywide plan amendment, but also a local plan amendment. Please see the Florida land use map attached. I will send along the proposed changes for the upland habitat wetland comp plan amendment is the next few days along with our proposed hearing uh, schedule. Mind you, while all this is going on, we're trying to run a city. If you had a development or anything else that you needed to get their attention, they weren't available. They were working directly for the Morgan Group. So the next comment I have is from, this is an email from um, Cindy Terrapani to Heather, and again, it's Camille and Armstrong and all the rest. This was a major deal. Dear Heather, I received three e emails from you last week regarding the site we discussed for the Morgan Group. I greatly appreciate the information, including, please note that you sent these emails to my personal email address that I use for the Heritage Preservation Board, rather than my work email at Florida Design Consultants. I would appreciate it if you would use that work address in the future. Based on issues outlined in the email to you on October 4th, we're still waiting for your response on the designation in the coastal high hazard area flood zone and the status of the Hayes Road. So again, this is a major deal. We had no attorney present except Ed Armstrong and he's on every email. Heather to Mark. Mark, I worked on the shopping cart ordinance this weekend. I would like to go over a couple of things with you and get your reaction before I move it on <coughs> to the police and city attorney. Um, I need some second half of, I need some, some, I need some time second half of this week. I did not get time to start work on the changes to the conditional use section. We had discussed that we need changes for projects such as the Morgan Group where your CU expiration date needs to be extended out to coincide with the DA expiration date. Even working on weekends, I'm just not getting enough time to get all these changes researched as quickly and as I hoped. I am very frustrated with it. Um, Karen also wanted to consider waivers of things like height, use, setbacks, and developer agreement, which I think is a good idea, but I understand your reservation on that, and we can tackle that at another time if you think that's best. And then it has <coughs> Larry, 
<coughs> Larry from Navaline is here 5 p.m. on Wednesday to assist in reconfiguring our planning and engineering module. So I'll be sending Pat to staff meeting for me. Be nice to her. I didn't know he wasn't nice. So far in just one day, we've realigned about one third of the planning module in Navaline. I got some great tips from Larry on, on parcel management for the land management side, which I can share with both IT and utility billing for addressing. I know that was all about you, but just to know the money was not wasted. I learned a lot. And I will get Townsend Terrapani's credit letter done before I leave for the day. And I, respond, I responded to Cindy's request on the Morgan Group property. This is about it, except I am really tired. Wonder why. Um, so the response back was, told Karen I was leery, but still think about it, maybe putting it in and let the BOC take it out. That came from Mark. Let's talk later this week. You can give me more pluses and minuses. Great work on the Navaline work being done and money was well spent. How about I put some language together for discussion's sake? We can always leave it out. Think about it, it might be easier if we have language to discuss. I need to pull developer agreement ordinances from some other communities and have a look. I'm sure there are lots of examples out there for us to look at. Let me see what I could find out and make it easier to decide whether we should consider waivers or not. We're now in 2018, and this is Heather to Cindy and the rest of the crew, as you know who I'm talking about. It's Ed Armstrong, Mark, Camille. Dear Cindy, I'm working with Forward Pinellas on the coastal high hazard area. Question for the property, along with the dates, for a pre-application meeting. I've asked that our GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems Department, to provide me an overlay for the property of the current and preliminary flood maps, et cetera, et cetera. She writes back, Heather, that's when I say she, it's Cindy. Heather, we are very anxious to receive you a map of the proposed flood zone for the site. Can you please advise when we might receive this from you? Alternatively, if you can provide a link to the county website with the proposed maps, that would be helpful to ensure that both the city and our team are looked at the same proposed flood maps on a related issue. The site appears to be in the coastal high hazard according to figure eight of the coastal conservative element. Can you confirm this? Ed Armstrong to Patrice. Pat, thank you so very much for doing this. I sincerely apologize for not replying more promptly. I simply lost track of this in the course of a very busy week. Regarding the meetings, I'll start with the Walmart site. I have the Swift Mud Governing Board meeting in Brookville all day Tuesday and cannot attend. Cindy and Camille have conflicts as well and are unable to <laughs> attend as well. We view this meeting as critical in proceeding with the project. Accordingly, our client respectfully requests that it be rescheduled to a date and time when all of us can attend. We would greatly appreciate the city honoring this request. With respect to the other case, because they were handling caliber collision, I don't even want to talk about that. So she writes back, hi Ed, I have tentatively agreed to back-to-back -back pre application meetings for Tuesday, October 23rd, starting at 1.30 for Forward Pinellas to, st to discuss the Walmart project. It seems like we have a staff that's working for the Morgan Group, Cindy Tarapani, um, Ed Armstrong. That's my take on it. Maybe I'm wrong. This is from Heather to Cindy. Cindy, I have no luck finding any reference to the countrywide plan use in 2007 Walmart staff reports. The 2007 files are on a bit disorganized, so going through them will take some time. I do not expect to find any reference to the countrywide plan or the PPC designations, as we do not usually concern ourselves with PPC issues when we approve site plans. Usually that is done at previous step or there is no question that the proposed use is allowed. I'm going to track down the 2004 files and see what I could find. 
I should at least be able to find the original application which should have the land use zonings marked if they're required, the same form as we use today. I am sure if we have the site plan files from 2004 to the planning and zoning records room, but I will look tomorrow if, I know, if, I'm, if not, I know some of the files were transferred to the city clerk. So I'll make a request to see what the city clerk has on Monday, because our city clerk has nothing to do. If nothing else, um, I know the land uses and zonings had to be set with the DR1 was expired. I would assume that they would have referenced the countrywide plan uses when they assigned the land use zoning. I'll try to locate the ABR and DRI files too. I apologize, I don't know what these acronyms are and I don't really care. I was lucky enough to find countrywide map half sec sections from 2009 on the planning drive. I'm attaching them for you to take a look at. It appears we, we to be as we discussed yesterday. I'll be in touch with you when I have more to share. Um, dear Heather, this is from Cindy again. I researched and found the countrywide map and rules th that existed prior to 2015. And she has a whole list. I'm going to go right through that. I don't even want to read it. By the way, anything I don't read, it's all out there for you to read. I did have to break down 753 emails into 150, and I prefer not everybody to go to sleep here while I'm reading. Um, so we have here um, Marshall Finkelstein, and I believe he was trying to get an estimate of building permits. So. He, he sent to Kevin, I tried your office line a couple of times today but wasn't able to get through. We need estimates of the building permits for our Tarpon Springs um, UW. I was hoping you'd assist in this endeavor. So there's a whole list of all of the permits and how much they cost. Um, and then there was more follow-up from him back and forth now to Kevin. So I want you to understand something that when Camille stood in front of us and told us that they spent $40 million on this project and that when we asked him to walk away from the project, the city spent a great deal of money in labor and time also that was not included in this. So I have now Heather and these email chains go backwards. So Heather writes, uh, this is from Camille to Heather. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I'd like to schedule a call with you at your earliest convenience to discuss the site plan for conditional use application. Please send me your availability on Friday and Monday so I may coordinate with the others. I plan to ask Cindy and our civil engineer to join us. Dear Camille, I have some availability tomorrow, 11 30, 2018 in the late afternoon, blah, blah, blah. Heather, let's get on a call tomorrow afternoon. Does 3.30 work for your schedule? I'll circulate an Outlook invite after this email, and if needed, we can adjust the time. Attached is an explanatory site plan that Nat and I would like to discuss on our call. We would like to discuss timing requirements of the shelter study. It's not listed on the conditional use application checklist as required. However, the after-mentioned LDC requirements is for conditional use approval, clarification on it, and when it is needed for a conditional use approval. So she, she wrote back, just FYI in case you're curious. Some of these emails you will not follow because there are phone calls in between, there were meetings in between, but I'm going to do the best I can with what's written in front of me. So this is eight emails back and forth. Um, this is Rodney, who's forward Pinellas. I wanted to confirm that you're planning to attend the meeting tomorrow at 2 p.m. Tarpon Spring City Hall regarding a plan amendment for the old Walmart site on US 19. Heather organized this meeting, and Ed Armstrong and I represent the contract purchaser. Can you please let me know who will be attending from Forward Pinellas in addition to you? And this is from Rodney. Cindy, good morning. The pre-application meeting regarding your project is on my calendar for tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. 
Number three, Rodney, apparently we had a misunderstanding on our part. We thought our pre-application meeting was forward Pinellas and City was at 2 p.m. My client is coming in from Miami with his plane landing at noon in time for the 2 p.m. meeting. I'm hoping that you could be available at 2 p.m. at your office for the meeting. Pat advises that she could attend at 2 p.m. Hopefully Heather can also attend at 2 p.m. Cindy, I need to try and rearrange my calendar to make this work for tomorrow. Stay tuned. Thank you so much for understanding. We'll wait to hear back from you. Cindy, we're available to meet tomorrow afternoon, 2 p.m. Do you have any idea what a mishmash this is for our city to start projects and to stop projects, all to accommodate the Morgan Group? Rodney, we greatly appreciate you rearranging your schedule to accommodate us. Ed, Camille, and I will see you at office tomorrow at 2 p.m. Camille, I will send you Rodney's office address. Thanks again for the understanding and help. Yes, Heather, and I could come down there for 2 p.m. I must leave by 3 to 3.15 to get back here for Snow Place staffing. Thanks all, see you tomorrow. I think it's a good time to chirp in. Um, John Tarapani is in 49 of these emails. Ed Armstrong is in 491 of these emails of the 753. Cindy's in 414 of these emails. Mark is in 222 of these emails. Dave Banther's in 14 of these emails. Camille is in 341 of these emails. Karen Lemons is in 85 of these emails. Patrice is in 495. So mind you, think of that, that's our staff. And then we have Heather, who's in 184, and she's also in our staff. Um, Tom Trask is in 49 of these emails. Erica, his partner, is in five. Jacob Carr, Commissioner Carr, is in 27 of these emails, which I haven't gotten to yet. Townsend is in 11 of them, Commissioner Townsend, Tarapani. Um, Commissioner Connor Donovan is in eight. Kim Yothers is in 124. The Morgan Group, as a word, is in 436. Um, and Cindy Tarapani also has another email, so she's in another 38 for Florida Design. Um, again, this doesn't include any phone, video, in-person meetings, um, but don't get fooled that Morgan Group was the only one spending money. So I have that, if anybody wants that, it's free to me to give it to you. Um, Heather wrote, Dear Ed, as promised, I'm attaching this, oh this, I'm sorry, I read this already, but this was, this was the one calling out Peter Delacus at the hour and 52 minute um, time, which, I guess he's a scary guy, that's all I can say. Um, Heather Erwiller to Mark and copied in Patrice, Erica, changes to the conditional use section. Mark, we sent our changes to Erica for review. She, oh, sorry again, these, this was read also. Uh, so she knew that these were serious changes to our conditional um, agenda and the changes and she asked to have it pulled. So now you have um, Heather writing, due to a major family surgery on Tuesday, I will be missing the Board of Commission meeting. This is from Heather to Mark. Um, and she says, I'll be working in the office in the weekend and we'll be here on Monday until 3.30. I'll monitor the emails and phone messages and I'll be able to do computer work during this time. And then Mark wrote back, thank you. I called Ed Armstrong and talked to him about initiating this agenda item. I'll work with Bob Cochin Pat, and Pat Monday to work out all the details. Ed will be calling Tom Trask on Monday as he thinks he has a legal argument that could be another avenue. 
I'm still going ahead until I hear otherwise with our plan. No worries. Enjoy the conference, Mark. So this is from Heather to Mark. What is it that you said to me? I think it sounds like, why are you working on the weekends? All joking aside, I left you a couple of notes below. I spoke with Pat and will be following up with an email for your benefit. Here's how things have to go down unless Ed convinces Tom otherwise. So from Mark to Robert Cochin, our ex-police chief, important item to get with me on Monday about, okay. And Robert wrote back, okay, I'll get with you on Monday morning about this. What this is, I guess somebody else has to speak of that. Um, we had an issue with right of ways. So here's from Patrice to Tom Trask on the right of way vacation. Because I know there was a discussion and some comments made. Hi Tom, I believe you were aware we're looking at the possibility of revising the right of way vacation ordinance in order to make the advertisement deadline. We want to have an ordinance ready to, in case the Board of Commissioners wants to go that route. Could you please take a look at the draft ordinance as soon as possible and mark it up for me, especially whereas in section 21601 needed in the ordinance since the changes apply only to section 216. The crux of the change is to remove the land valuation and the appraised value calculation component from the fee. In other words, we are to now give up property for free and not charge anybody. My plan is to get the ad to the new newspaper by 10 a.m. tomorrow, and then if the Board of Commissioner decides not to go forward, I can always pull the ad on Wednesday prior to the paper's deadline. So then we have Tom back to Patrice. Pat, please use the attached version from Tom. Um, and then I have, thanks, Tom. Why did we strike Section 216 standards for review? I just wanted to change the fee. I think this is the thing that Ed Armstrong had changed for us. That's what I would tell you. Also, I suppose to call you later to, I'm supposed to call you later to coordinate after you talk with Ed Armstrong on this. Chief Cochin will be filling in for Mark tomorrow night and I'm supposed to coordinate back with him. After I talk with you, I have a planning and zoning tonight so I'm here for the, du du for the duration and very flexible on time to talk. Thank you again. So Tom writes, we don't need to revise or delete 216 from the LDC. It's fine the way it reads. It should just not be included in the ordinance since we're not revising or amending it. Got it. This is from Pat. Got it. Thanks. Ed Armstrong, this is... From Ed Armstrong, here is the right-of-way deed in the city. So I'm guessing he rewrote it. So this is from Tom to Ed. As a follow-up to our telephone conversation this morning, I wanted you to know the city staff has prepared an ordinance that removes the fee related to the value of the property. The fee in the ordinance would be limited to $200. It's being sent to the newspaper tomorrow for publication. I don't have the hearing dates yet. Signed, Tom. Ed Armstrong to Tom. Thank you, Tom. So very much appreciated. So this, I don't need to read. Here we have from Patrice to Cindy Tarapani, Heather, of course, Camille, and to uh, Ed Armstrong. It's the Morgan site pre-application meeting and follow-up. So I know you can't read it, but you'll at least get to see what the questions and the answers on two pages that they wrote 
on all of the questions that were being proposed just for the pre-application. Again, this is all staff time, not including phone calls, not including meetings that were scheduled and then broken. Um, we have a whole string of pull -up ponies here. So then we have a question from Commissioner Carr, um, and it's dated June 10th, 2019. Um, he seems to be asking about spot zoning and what it means, and there's a response. I'm pretty sure nobody in this room cares what spot zoning is, so I'm not gonna read it, but I needed you to understand on June 10th, 2019, um, that there was a request for spot zoning and the request was for the Morgan Group area. Um, this is from Ed Armstrong to Mark. Um, yes, it clearly did. We're hoping to meet with you. Tom Trask and whoever else you'd like to bring late next week to discuss further. I will only bring Will Conroy, a young lawyer and an investor in this deal, to the meeting. Please let me know and thanks always, Mark. I'm first through the first eight pages, just to let you know, that was just a joke. Um, Heather Erwilla, um, dear Mark and Heather, in addition to the general overview of the project status, we would like to discuss the hurricane study at our meeting on Tuesday. Um, just to give you an idea, these are just more and more. Um, Cindy Tarapani to Heather. Um, dear Heather, Pat, and Louise, thank you so much for your time in meeting with Camille, Ed, and I yesterday on the US-19 project. As we mentioned, Camille is revising the concept plan with the earlier version and would like to review it with you and the city staff. We would like to ask you to schedule a pre-application meeting with all the city staff on the morning of the Friday, October 11th. Camille will be in town that day and we're hoping that the morning works for you. But yet, our city attorney is not present at any of these conversations. We have a $100 million project being done and we don't have a city attorney there. Cindy to, let's see, no, this is multiple ones. Um, this is, Cindy writes to Pat, Pat, my client needs to make travel arrangements, so the sooner you could confirm this, the better. Before that, she said, Pat, are we confirmed for October 11th in the morning for the pre-application meeting for this site? It's very interesting that somebody needs confirmation on appointments, but I kind of recall when the concerned citizens needed to get an attorney or a representative, I forget what it was from Jacksonville, it was turned down because he wasn't here and they didn't want to allow it through video. But yet, when it's the shoes on the other foot, it seems to be allowed. Dear Pat and Louise, thank you so much for organizing this, this pre-application. Um, our intent was to present our revised concept plan and site to get your reaction and comments. However, we're still working on that concept plan and would like to defer this meeting until the plan has been finalized. So would you please cancel the October 11th meeting with the city staff? We will be back in touch with you once the concept plan is finalized for to be ready for review. Thanks again for your assistance and we apologize for the inconvenience. So could you please hurry up and wait. So now we have back to Commissioner Carr. Um, this is not political. Um, he asks a question of Karen Lemons on December 1st.
Karen, I heard last week there's an offer on this property. Do you know what it is all about? But he knew about this on June 10th, 2019. And I'd love to hear who he heard it from. It doesn't say. But it says Jacob Card, Toppin Springs City Commissioner. So. Now we have um, the response. Karen wrote, good morning, Jacob. A development group, the Morgan Group, is undergoing due diligence for residential multifamily development. We've met with them several times over the past two years. However, they have not submitted any formal applications. So there isn't a project yet. I don't have any information on what their offer may be on this property. So then when Mark heard this, he then forwarded it to the entire board because you really can't have one commissioner knowing about this and not the rest of the board. This is another deferral of another meeting. So this one I found interesting and I did question the city manager on this. This is from Renee to, this is in 2020, I don't know how it got mixed up in here, but it says, Dear Mark, please find attached my application backdated a bit for the position of planning and director. I sincerely appreciate your willingness to give me time to consider all my options and the offer of moving expenses subject to the board approval. I would respectfully like to pursue, if possible, an extension of one year requirement to take residency. I realize this is a legal question at this point and would also require approval by the BCC, whatever that is. I, uh, I sincerely looking forward to the opportunity to re return to work with you and other staff. I look forward to speaking you with you soon. I questioned Mark on this because I didn't know anybody in this city was valuable enough for them to be getting moving costs, but his comeback was that the Board of Commissioners approved it. So again, I did not want to waste time and see which commissioners approved it. I would have never approved having paying somebody's moving expenses, but I wasn't looking for a planning and zoning person. Um, the answer that Mark gave to this, first it said, Renee said she's resending her, uh, resending her resume that's attached. And Mark said, good, please call me on my cell phone. Can't get it in writing when you're on the cell phone. Um, this is from Cindy, dear Pat, my client has asked that I confirm the Anchor Harbor conceptual development plan is scheduled for June 4th, blah, blah, blah. And then you have, dear Pat, can you please confirm this? And then it's, hi Cindy, yes, you're scheduled for June 4th. Um, it will be a Zoom meeting. I will send you the information as soon as we have it set up. And then from Cindy, will Ed, Camille, Ed and Camille, uh, the applicant, and I be panelists on the Zoom meeting, like at the Board of Commission re, re, you know, meeting this Tuesday? I think it would be very helpful to have this format. Who runs our city? That's my question. So here comes back Cindy. These are the details I'll have to get back to you on. We've been doing desktop reviews with no meetings for the TRC up to now. This will be our first Zoom. Once I get the details from the IT, we will let you know in any case at the point, no one will have to travel. And then it has Camille of the Morgan Group is the entity doing the project. Dear Renee, this is from Cindy. My client has decided that he wants to have written confirmation from Forward Pinellas. 
on how the density averaging and TDRs will be applied to the site. We also want confirmation from them for what you previously told us, that stormwater ponds do not count towards the five acre maximum of office plan category. Finally, he wants FP to confirm that it is okay to have building partially in each plan category and only the units physically within the office plan that would be counted towards the maximum units allowable on the office parcel. So I've drafted the attached letter to be sent to Rodney. I definitely appreciate your review. Comments after your review, would you please call me? Let me know your thoughts. Per client direction, my goal is to submit this to Rodney and hopefully tomorrow morning. Thanks. Um, Cindy, I think you've captured everything is the comeback. I've not considered the use of density transfer, so I reread that section and it looks like you've correctly framed the issue from my own reading. So then we have a situation where there was, the Tampa Bay Times was trying to get some information and they accused our city manager of a gag order. Um, I think he had asked that none, nobody speak to the people. So this was in here as well. This is from Cindy Terrapani. Can you please commit to providing the comments by this Friday? Pat, to Cindy, we will do our best. I will try to update you as soon as possible. Um, Pat, consultant sent them, but the file has technical issues. I have a call into them to resend. We should hopefully get them to you by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, Commissioner Eisner, can you speak a little closer to the mic? Sure. Yeah, yeah please. So then Cindy writes, Thanks, Renee. We really appreciate your help on this schedule. Um, Cindy writes back, I do really appreciate you working with us on this. Thank you, Cindy. No worries, she says. We've dropped the ball on this advertising a couple of times, so we owe you. This all has to do with getting in ads. Well, this is a goodie right here. So this is a letter from Ed Armstrong um, to Patrice, copied in to Cindy Terrapani and Camille. Hi, Pat. I just wanted you to reach out to you regarding the Morgan Group project. At yesterday's TRC meeting, Camille suggested that within reason, the Morgan Group would be willing to pay a premium to the traffic consultant if the record could be generated more quickly. Wow. His, offer, his offer was serious. Could you please check to see if that might be an option here? Very much appreciated, Ed. Have a nice long weekend. It's within reason. Then we had five envelopes came in. This is from Mark to the Board of Commissioners because we, the commission wasn't aware of this. Five envelopes came in today at City Hall with information on a Zoom's neighborhood meeting on the Walmart property from the Morgan Group. Myself and Renee know nothing about this meeting and will try to get information. If asked, the city's not involved in this meeting, and you must, you must consider Sunshine Law if you pan, plan to virtually attend. Sending to the city, um, I'm sending this to the city attorney so he can go over proper procedures for if you want to listen in this meeting. We presume it is to get neighborhood feedback on this project. Just not sure of the timing and why the city staff was not aware of it. Can't write this stuff, but it's written.
So Tom read this and wrote just, okay, thanks. I have no idea what that means. Um, it says we have a preliminary planning develop, plan development application on file that has been reviewed by the city's technical review um, committee. We did not receive any advance notice of this neighborhood meeting. Okay, that's the answer. Okay, thanks. Camille, to Mark. I just tried reaching you on extension 2204. Please give me a call on my cell when you have a moment to discuss the Anklet Harbor neighborhood meeting. Thank you. Excuse me. This is Renee, I'd appreciate your feedback on the TRC commitment number 19. Um, pursuant to the proposed wetland mitigation plan, it appears the project meets section 55 of the land development code, agency approvals, permits will be required, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole thing that was sent and what happened, this was from Camille to Renee, copied in of course, Cindy Terrapani, Ed Armstrong, uh, Richard Buck, Harvey, Harvey Gonzalez, Artie Cintron. Everybody from the Morgan Group is aware of what's going on. Except our city attorney. Um, or maybe he was. I don't know. I'd like to ask that question. I'd like to ask him a lot of these questions. Camille will, can, can and will give you a call this afternoon to discuss this. Um, this is from Renee back to Camille. Yes, my schedule's open at 2 p.m. Please let me know what time works best for you. We will give you, this is uh, Renee back, we will give you a call around 1.30. Um, this is all emails back and forth. I'm gonna cut it quickly to the development plan. Um, Patrice sends again to Artie, Harvey, Gonzalez, Renee Vincent, Cindy Tarapani, Ed Armstrong, Camille, Richard Buck, um, Miganette Scott, Rogers, Wes, and Kim Yothers. Artie and all, yes, we've received it and wanted to relay that Kim, our coordinator, was very appreciative of your putting the submittal into separate digital folders by application type. She usually has to comb through files for multiple applications. I think I only want to read one more so I don't put you all to sleep, even though I have a million more. Um, this is from Renee Vincent to Ed Armstrong and Mark LaCorris, impact fee. This is another very funny one. Um, Payment of fees, we have impact fees. So the impact fees imposed by this article, this is from Renee to Ed, shall be paid in legal tender unless the Board of Commissioners accepts an in-kind contribution of real or personal property for public use, which serves the same public purposes as those for which the impact fees are imposed. So what that means is they could give us a useful or useless piece of land instead of paying the impact fees. I'm so glad she figured that out. She also underlined it in yellow in case Ed Armstrong wasn't able to find that in this one paragraph. Ed Armstrong to Renee. I would agree. Nicely done, Renee.
Here we have a situation where, I don't know if you remember, Governor DeSantis had, uh, I believe, he had an executive order reinstating that we would have meetings, and then he um, changed the order and added an extra 30 days. So this is a whole bunch of emails back and forth where they utilized the governor's executive order to help push along the agenda. This is from Cindy to Mark LaCorris. Dear Mark and Renee, are you aware the Anclod Harbor developer and team are holding a virtual neighborhood meeting tonight? We're anticipating the need to also hold a live in-person neighborhood meeting. I wanted to ask if you could make the Heritage Museum in Craig Park available to us with this purpose. We think the Heritage Museum is the best location for a large room that, that could accommodate attendees with plenty of social distancing. And gave the date October 26th. Um, I believe that got shot down. Um, so the vote to change the amendment for the fee schedules um, is on here, and this has the minutes from the ordinance, and also um, has the public comments. John Terrapani was on here, and he said the board took two steps forward with items 15 and 16, but taking one step back with incentives for investment in the community. He then explained the development process and felt this was another level of bureaucracy for investors. Peter Delacus from 514 Ashland said wetland served a vital purpose and spoke on the importance of the Walmart property for Tarpon Springs. He said the city could create a mitigation bank for the city. So the motion was from Vice Mayor Banther, who wasn't at a meeting, and Commissioner Kitka was the second. Um, Commissioner Carr voted no. Commissioner Kitka voted yes. Commissioner Seba voted yes. Vice Mayor Bantha voted yes. And Mayor Alahuzis voted yes. So that's who changed the, uh, the fee schedules. just if you want to know what trouble we might be having down the road. The governor appoints Ed Armstrong and John Mitten to the Southwest Florida Water Management District Governor's Board. So that's where Ed Armstrong sits. How's my time, Mayor? Soon, please. <laughs> an excellent job. But Thank you. We're, we're on. Thank, I'm going for an Oscar, I want you to know. Okay. Um, this is from Cindy Terrapani to Pat, Camille, Harvey, uh, Gonzalez. Dear Pat, as your request, please find attached the files from the ecological consultant. I hope they're in a format that you can easily read, but if not, please let me know. Let me do my closing here. If I could find it. Okay, that's not it. This is my ending statement so I don't put you all to sleep. These e emails don't even scratch the surface of what went on here. My stomach turns when I think about it. Years and years of manipulation, years of intimidation, years of laying the foundation to ruin our city, to make money for a few. I even heard a rumor just recently that 300 gopher tortoises were buried alive. And again, my stomach turned. And I have a strong stomach. 
Fortunately, there was only a rumor so far that we know. But I called Fish and Wildlife to check on it because I couldn't help but feel that the people who wrote these emails might be capable of doing this. I don't know, but I had to check it out. If somebody tells me something, I'm going to follow through. All of these 753 emails, some of which I read, are stomach-turning emails that show in their own words how certain people put profit over people. I even wonder if the Morgan Group, whose own website proclaims they have values and integrity, knew about this. So this was copied from their website. It's their statement. The Morgan Group has a commitment to integrity, trust, honesty, ethics, and professionalism. The foundation for all that we do. Did they know this? Did they approve this? Did they give their blessings to let the loose the dogs? Or did these people seemingly powerful in their own sphere of influence in Pinellas feel they were above it all? They could deliver here. They seemingly had the law behind them. They had the FDOT studies that showed how safe it was for 800 people to pull out in 65 mile an hour and traffic and cross three lanes in a stretch of highway deemed one of the deadliest in the United States. How could that be true? I drove in mid-Manhattan and I couldn't cross those three lanes. I'm calling on Mr. Evan Sheckler. He's the newly appointed Morgan Group president in charge of the Florida operations to answer and to justify the actions that these emails take. I call for him to come before us and explain if this is in his way of doing business. And that's all I have to say, and thank you for listening to me. It's all yours. Thank you, excellent, uh, Commissioner Eisner. It's, uh, it took a while, but it was, um, you kept us on our feet, <laughs> actually on our standing straight up in our seats anyway, so thank you very much. Uh, there's no action item in this. No? Okay, so let me go with the commission comments and then we'll go to the public. Um, Commissioner Eisner, I'm sorry, Commissioner Carr. Mayor, I, I think traditionally we go to public comment and then we go to commissioner comment. So I, I know, but there's no there. action item on this thing, so let's do the commissioners first and then we'll do uh, the public comments. We've yeah. got another sister item just right after this. Sure. Um, I mean, there's a lot of emails that are read tonight. Uh, I think it would be wise to hear from Mark a little bit more of what a common, um, what's common in development, what's common with city staff as the board, we don't direct city staff what to do. The city manager makes that decision. Um, so I think it would be probably educational for our board and the public to understand what that looks like. Uh, this is obviously a big project. It's not a housing project on a single lot. Um, so there's gonna be more staff time involved with this. Um, and then I believe if it goes before TRC, I think there's a cost as well too um, for an application. So I think some of those would be nice to hear as well too. But to me, I think it would be a good idea at least to hear from the city manager who's over all the city staff to directs their day to days and time to be used. Um, I mean, based on what I'm understanding, there, there's an accusal of city staff using time where they shouldn't have been used uh, for this project. So. Um, if the city manager could share a little bit on that, I think that would be beneficial. You want to say anything? Not at this time. Okay. Okay. I mean, in that in that aspect, I think these are those are things you want to evaluate um, on our next agenda item. Um, to me, it sounds like a lot of due diligence questions. Uh, was there a significant amount over a handful of years? Yeah, there's a significant amount of questions. Um, Right now, I mean, there wasn't any red flags that raised to me other than the, s the applicant making a proposal to change um, the code um, word, for, word for word. I, that's something that I had issue with. Um, a lot of the other emails seem like they're more due diligent questions throughout the time. But uh, I, I do have some concerns with an applicant 
giving our planning director verbatim of what they want to see the code to be updated to. Uh, that, that did raise some red flags to me. Uh, but all other emails that were read seemed to be more like due diligent questions. Um, but that's for us to, I guess, dig in and understand further. Thank you, Commissioner Thanks. Carr. Commissioner Kouyash. Commissioner Carr, I'm just so uh, fuddled with your, your comment. I mean, but we're going to get into your part as well. Uh, citizens of Tarpa Springs, we need to apologize to you. you. You've had a government that wasn't representing you. They were self-serving at times. Not all of them. Not all of them. But uh, it's clear to see that there was a lot of undisclosed personal items that were not presented to the public, nor was the public giving direction to the Board of the Commissioners to act out these land use codes. So we owe you apology. You deserve to have people up here who are going to represent you and not do backdoor deals to try to get projects done. So Mara, I may come a little bit of unhinged, but you have a right to call me down at any point. <laughs> and uh, we all knew this. We just couldn't tie in together. We couldn't prove it. But at the time, we, we knew the way the project was. It was laid out, what was being presented, and the areas it was. It just didn't make sense. So I'm not sure of criminal charges in a court of law, but these regular session city public meetings uh, is the court of public opinion. And this looks bad. This, it's d disturbing, and a lot of people have some answers. You know, a lot of people are gonna have to answer some questions here. Now, during the ethics course taken at the Florida League of Cities Conference, I had uh, one of the attorneys for Attorney Trask, Daniel, Randy Mora stated, the comprehensive plan is a policy decision. It's the constitution for all of your land use development that comes in front of you. No development can happen that contradicts your comprehensive plan. There was another attorney teaching in that same ethics course that stated, if you were someone that states, my business keeps creating a conflict before the council, <coughs> and at some point it's like, well, are you going to be able to vote on one of these important zonings? No, because I have them all under contract. And if that's a continuing or frequently occurring conflict, then that's a conflicting point. This can lead to a tough decision. You can either keep your council position and quit doing that type of real estate, or you can quit your public office. There are cases, and that's where it comes down. You don't have the right to hold on to your public office and do the type of work that you like that creates conflict. You just don't. Avoid those conflicts. And that was in the ethics class treated by the Florida League of Cities. And I so happened to record it, so I, I was able to write it down verbatim. Now, we're going to establish some, some facts. On October 17, 2017, Commissioner David Banther emails the BOC assistant to write a letter of support for Morgan Group and their project for the future growth of Tarpon Springs. I'm positive the future growth wasn't told or given a direction by you, the citizens of Tarpon Springs. I know what we were fighting for to stop. And it's apparent that this one commissioner who wanted to run for mayor but then dropped out because of the toxicity, the toxicity of government at the time just was too involved in it, so he had to. Now, that's not the future growth that we were fighting for and why you have this eclectic bunch of commissioners and our mayor. And you know, on October 27th, Cindy Tirapani emails Karen Lemons expressing her appreciation for staff's time the prior day to discuss the project. We don't know what was discussed. I, I haven't looked too much in onto the emails except for the 150 that were downloaded to the website. And uh, I want to thank the mayor for being able to do some research and Commissioner Eisner for bringing this to your attention because it takes a lot of guts to come up here to talk about it. It takes, you know, uh, to bring it to bring it to light and one thing I could say it's time to fight fire with fire on 
November 9th, 2017, Khalil Salami emails Commissioner David Banther. Thank you for the letter. It was a pleasure meeting you. I received a response to Morgan Group's offer from the seller. I will send you an update if we get a signed letter of intent. I hope we have the opportunity to enhance Tarpon Springs together. So we've established that Camille Salimi, who came up here and couldn't remember anything because of his uh, billion dollar book of business, which I don't care for and ne neither do the residents of Tarpon Springs. And we are able to establish that he was talking to a commissioner who was partners with the son whose father was the owner operator of the planning company in which his stepmother was presenting the case. On November 10th, 2017, David Banther emails Karen Lemons, let's stay on Walmart's representative. Why is a commissioner getting involved with the private, the private sale of a property that at some point it's, it's gonna cause a, a land use issue, but we haven't gotten there yet because as, as this was coming unfolding more, there was a select group on the commission at that time that knew what was going on. Not everybody knew and I'm sure people are gonna have a chance to explain themselves. And on May 13, 2018, John Terrapani emails Karen Lemons about an opportunity for her involvement in whatever movement was happening with the property. Again, who's running the show? Is John Terrapani running the show? It, or is he, is he really the, the, the puppet master to people like David Banther and his son that ended up taking over the transition of that seat, knowing there was gonna be an application presented? at some point to the board, knowing that they had an obligation to stay out and avoid conflicts of interest regarding land use and zoning issues, that's something for discussion. Now, this gets a little tricky because I, I've talked about this before and uh, here's another example of why. We've talked about code enforcement, working with the network to either try to seize property from the poor or try to create leverage on that property to get those people to want to sell. So on August 18th through the 21st of 2018, we had a code enforcement officer, Steve Gasson, notifying Samantha Boos of code enforcement violations in the homeless encampments. This, and they use it to leverage the property. Walmart doesn't want to keep building on fines and having their properties, you know, fined against it and building outrageous amounts, so it helps force them to want to sell the property. We've seen it happen in other cases. Uh, there are gonna be issues where that's gonna get addressed, where Steve Gasson was your code enforcement officer, and Tom Trask was the representative at that time for a lot of different cases. This isn't the only one. And so, this may or may have not had a direct impact on the property owner wanting to sell the property in Morgan Group. On. August 21st, 2018 at 10.05, Officer Steve Gasson emailed an officer that he had an open code case on the Walmart property. He wanted the officer to, quote, trespass all of the folks on the property and get them off of it. On August 21st, 2018 at 10.23 a.m., Beth Hughes emails the code enforcement officer, Steve Gasson, do you want this note added to the case about obviously removing the, the people from the property. And that same day at 1029, Steve Gasson replies back in an email, nah, thanks though. So we had a code enforcement officer that did not want to document an important detail in the case. By the way, he's, not, he's no longer your code enforcement officer and the person that was underneath him resigned to, to go find a better job with somewhere else and get paid more, which seems to be the case with us. So we do have a code enforcement issue and uh, I'm hoping we can make it right by treating people the right way as well too. On September 18, 2018, an email from planning and zoning director, Heather Erweiler to Cindy Terrapani. It appears that the, the city's future land use is split for the site as well. So we need to complete not only a, co a countywide plan amendment, but also a local plan amendment. 
I will send along the proposed uh, changes for the upland habitat, wetland comp plan amendment in the next few days along with our proposed hearing schedule. Mind you now, Heather Erweiler was pretty much, uh, she was a greenhorn in the planning. She was about three to five years out from being a certified planner. Uh, she had no business in helping create these laws and ordinances and working with Morgan Group and none of that was disclosed to the public. And I'll make sure I follow back up on that again. Um, on, and I have to, uh, I know at times I've been critical, but uh, as I read these emails and I was able to see how the land use changes were coming about and who initially started them, I do have to apologize to Ms. Renee Vincent, our current land planner. She did not change the codes. Okay, just because she's articulate enough to discuss what those changes were about the application doesn't mean she was the one who was part of all these two to three years of land use changes at that time. From then October 18, 2018, between 4 to 5.30 p.m., Cindy Terrapani and the city planner, Heather Erweiler, exchanged emails on Hayes Road being a city or county right-of-way. Mind you, there's been no communication from your one commissioner at the time who said he's been, you know, at, at some point during the public comments at the end of a meeting, commissioner comments, you usually give progress or updates about what you've done for the week or, or what you're trying to help out for the city or just anything in general, but none of that was ever mentioned. And uh, you know, a couple of these emails are, I'm reading back, but I, I do want to talk about what it establishes, at least what I believe. So on October 18, 2018, at 614, City Planner Heather Erwell emailed City Manager Mark LaCourse, I did not get time to start work on the changes to the conditional use section. We had discussed that we needed changes for projects such as Morgan Group Project, where the CU expiration date needs to be extended out to coincide with the DA expiration date. So once again, we're talking about land use codes, uh, who's working with who, that still hasn't been disclosed to the general BOC. So on October 10, 2018, Grant Standard of Hill Ward Henderson emailed Ed Armstrong, city planner, Heather Erweiler. Also, I'm trying to get ahead and prepare any necessary documents that are needed from us to get the comp plan amendment changed. Is the application attached the correct one that will be needed for the change? So I can't confirm yet, but I'd have to see what that application was. Was it the, uh, was it the, the apartment complex and just a general idea or what the study did involve that they were looking to see in the attachment? Uh, and on January 13, 2019, Ed Armstrong emailed city planner Heather FYI, Camille has authorized Cindy Terrapani to appear on behalf of Morgan Group to request a code change along the lines of what we discussed for the conditional use section. Just wanted to give you a heads up. This was for the January 28, 2019 Planning and Zoning Board. I do not believe Morgan Group, I don't, I don't believe those land use changes were discussed involving Morgan Group's involvement in those codes. Uh, on January 25th, 2019, city planner email, uh, the city planner emailed Ed, Cindy of Morgan Group, attaches a revised language the city staff will recommend to the BOC. This item has been removed from January 28th Planning and Zoning Board agenda. The revised public hearing schedule is February 25th, 2019 Planning and Zoning Meeting, February 26th, 2019 Board of Commissioners first reading, and March 19th, 2019 Board of Commissioners second reading. Now the interesting part about this, uh, Commissioner Eisner did bring up the, the, the commission at that time, but I'd like to hear from them whether when those changes were being presented to them, did they have all the backup information? Were they able to see who the key players were behind the land use changes? Or was it just the ordinance written out and presented to the board? I believe some of those commissioners would have been able to realize you know, who these key players were in trying to do this land use change, 
before, uh, if everything was presented thoroughly to them. I believe our attorney at the time did not disclose how they came about creating these land use changes. And they have an obligation to let the board know, hey, we have reached out to an outside law firm, an outside le uh, legal counsel to help construct these land use changes. We have had a developer work with us to help construct these land use changes for some type of project that includes density, higher density. And we're talking nearly a year and a half from the first Commissioner David Banther's response in supporting the future growth at Tarpon Springs. So, on December 2nd, 2019, the Board of Commissioners, the assistant, our commissioner's assistant emailed candidate for mayor, David Banther, uh, candidate Gustavati Kiotis, candidate Susan Hales, and email city manager Mark LaCourse forwarded to the board, of the board of Commissioners from Karen Lemons to Jacob. Jacob, a development group, Morgan Group, is undergoing its due diligence for a residential multi-story family. We have met with them several times over the past years. However, they have not submitted any formal applications, so there isn't a project yet. Nor was the public notified of a potential project that our staff had been working diligently on under whose direction? Whose direction was it? So, uh, you know, we're gonna hear at times that the board was pro-development, but if they were able to see these, these emails on the back end on the pro-development land use changes, I'm sure they were able to then help reconsider their, their thinking process. I'm not sure, but uh, that was definitely kept from them and that will no longer happen. All land use changes moving forward, we're gonna have all the backup material on who's talking about it, who's going back and forth, striking it out, and it's all gonna be disclosed to the Board of Commissioners moving forward. Now, and what I, I didn't read that email about Ed wanting to pay a premium to expedite the traffic study. Does that happen often? Would that be an influence to help expedite a study that may have not been done properly or, or was sped up to help appease the, developer, the, the developers, that is all up for discussion. And, uh, you know, yep, and our city attorney, Tom Trass, uh, the conflicts of interest, just the appearance of a conflict of interest was more than enough for him to have to disclose Trask Daniels' involvement in these land use changes with Morgan Group and their attorney. There, there's no doubt about that. There's, you can't tell me no on that. And uh, how we go about handling this, this is gonna be interesting. Uh, I also, like Commissioner Eisner, we, I wrote our attorney, Tom Trask, you need to give us an explanation. Your agreement ends with us on October 9th. You got about four or five days left. You owe us an explanation. And yet that hasn't been given. And all I could say is, you know, those who stay silent on something, they're, they're hiding. They're hiding from something. And, and it's a shame that a law firm of legal counsel can sit there and be quiet for 30 days now. We haven't heard from them, nothing. So something's up. And I, if, I, if I hear from the first special counsel that there's nothing there, I want a second one. Now, as far as, you know, John Terrapani, the, the, the officer of the Florida Design Consultants and, and Cindy Terrapani, vice president, you know, their company slogan is, some, some watch things happen, some wonder how things happen, FDC makes it happen. Huh? Seems like you'll do whatever you can to make it happen. And not telling all the information or disclosing it all from 
the attorneys that are working with you and our city attorneys, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. And none of that, mind you, if remember the first and second readings of this Anklo Harbors project, did you ever hear once our, our city attorney or Ed Armstrong talk about, oh, we've worked together on this from 2019 about conditional use codes that were gonna help benefit this project. You never heard it. So not only did you have two separate meetings in which critical information, which you're supposed to uh, make an oath under God, was not disclosed to the people. I wonder how that could affect the, the outcome of this um, decision or people with integrity could have voted. So now I'm going to the three votes for the project at that time, because I'm just, I'm floored by it. We got Commissioner Connor Donovan, he was a young guy, you know, uh, you know, he opposed so much the sale of the marina over at, um, down by the docks in which the, or no, he was for the purchase of the marina because he was gonna be the broker for it. And he was gonna get a commission in his pocket, Townsend Terrapenny was, and then Connor Donovan opposed it because he would never vote for someone who's making money off a deal or their families were gonna be making money off the deal. But yet, when the biggest uh, development project came around in Tarpon Springs with an estimated, we've heard anywhere from 120 million to potentially $180 million, his tune changed. And this is a problem. It's a problem because you, you see the consistency and integrity was slowly being wiped away. And mind you, Commissioner Donovan did accept a budget analyst two position with the county of Pasco. A few months in between the middle of 2021, I wanna say, during the height of these first and second readings and on Commissioner Donovan's application for references, there was three individuals. The first one, uh, his name was Hans Schnabel. He was uh, uh, a Clearwater affordable housing individual, I believe, something along the lines of that. The second one was uh, Commissioner Dave Edgers, which, uh, you know, that's a great reference. The third one was former Chief of Police Robert Cochin which it's a great reference, but if you think Connor Donovan was gonna come up here and oppose Robert Cochin being our next assistant city manager or city manager, you better think again. You better think again. That's why it's important to have people with some stability in your office. Now, and Commissioner Jacob Carr, I, I am so disappointed because some people will, they are just so blind by what they see in front of them and how deep they're in that they just got to write it out. And I get it, but the people of Tarpon Springs see what's going on. And you were able to, you constantly supported this project from the beginning uh, through all the hearings, who knows how much you knew about the land use changes and all those people involved. But I'll tell you one thing, you know, while, while code enforcement was picking on other people's property, including that Walmart property, they were letting that property go that was owned by your family to run its course and not be fined once or twice over a two year period. But once that project got accepted, the Anklo Harbors project, a couple weeks later, Jacob Carr's family is presenting that project with the back of the, the property over there off the Pinellas Trail, in which they made it a junkyard. They made it a salvage place. That was supposed to be the start of a multi-use entertainment area. And yes, sir. And that was it. So there, there seems to be a lot of easy going here. Point of order, Mayor. Go ahead. There's a lot of tangents going off of here of accusing multiple people that aren't in these emails, I guess, of what's going on. So I just we... I just calmed him down on that. Okay. He understands. Mm -hmm. I, is that correct, Commissioner Krias? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, anyways, 
a property was rezoned in Commissioner Carr's interest. I believe, and, and the, the, the former mayor, Chris Alahousis, he is in fact the biggest disappointment of them all. He, he knew of this controversial issue, allowed land use changes to affect the city's development applications and did nothing. And I don't know if you remember as a private citizen, I would come up here and, and when the project was really starting to form, I, I would say the name John Terrapani. I would say it multiple times in their involvement and the mayor would stop my constitutional right as a private citizen to speak the name of somebody who was all in fact behind the project. How could he let that, some, how could he let that happen? Why would he deliberately stop my will to free speech when it was in fact the truth? And so, It seemed like we had someone who was uh, running the show with our city staff, with our legal counsel, who was not on the board of commissions at the time, who was uh, planning a deal, and but yet we couldn't talk about it. So uh, there's a lot that's going to come up in the in these you know from these past hearings that was and wasn't disclosed, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. And you know. That was same traffic study, I, I, as I said, it, I guess it was expedited, but this was also a former Mayor Alahousis who sat with his paper and read verbatim two, three lines about how he thought Mr. Hatton's traffic analysis was sufficient for the project, okay? And that was basically what he sold, uh, that, that's what his approval came off of. Now, I find that unacceptable, you know, he, he if you, you guys want to sell, the mayor seems to me of selling out, selling out his city of Tarpon Springs. And I would ask, those who supported the project, knowing what you know now, would you still support it? Did you just think this was uh, just status quo of land use changes and zoning changes that helped benefit the city of Tarpon Springs? And so, you want it to be yes because it's bad to say no. Anybody can up, come up here and be a yes man and push progress like you've never seen. But this board was not elected for that. We're elected for smart foundational building and letting future boards decide on what was gonna happen. But we had to get our roots down because they were not put in place. So, and those of you that wanna come up here and say we're wrong and, and you know, um, you want to support those people who are constantly, you know, trying to push this uh, item. That's fine. You can, but you can't tell me it's because everything looked right because it didn't. And if you still did think it looks right now and everything was cool and just legalities wise, then I'm so happy you're not on this board right now making the tough decisions <laughs> and that we're up here trying to fight for the residents of Tarpon Springs. So, as Camille Salami stated during his bond hearing where I, I asked him several questions, he says, Tarpon Springs owes the Terra Panties a lot. In what form? Tarpon Springs owes them nothing and owes you nothing as a developer. We owe you great service as a city that you guys chose to live in, okay? So no one's owed a $100 million deal without true disclosure to the people of Tarpon Springs. So Mayor, I'm just gonna end with that because I know we got a couple items coming up and thank you for dealing with my passion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Pierre. <laughs> Commissioner Eisner, you've got the green light on. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I wanted to clarify two things. Understand whatever I've read, um, there are 753 emails I probably got through 100 of the 150 I selected. So when Commissioner Coolius explains these things to you, there is truthfully so much more, and there's only so many you can take before your stomach turns. But I did wanna um, clarify something that you brought up, and I thank you, um, because I did proceed to ask the city manager who knew and who didn't on the board at the time? 
And I don't know if the city manager would like to answer that right now or whether he would like me to answer it. You tell me. It's mine? Okay. He said everybody that was on the board was well aware of it at the time because I asked that question. So they can weasel out of it any way they want now, but they were aware of it. So that's your answer to the question you asked earlier. Mm -hmm. Whether he wants to admit it or not now. Sir. Okay. No, thank you for providing that, Commissioner. Okay, thank well, you. Um, it's my turn, I'm gonna reserve my time. I've got the next item, so I'm gonna uh, have a brief five minute presentation on that one at the outset to kind of put it in perspective as far as how the uh, Morgan Group benefited from the email uh, journey that the Commissioner Eisner and Commissioner Kuya went over. So what I wanna do right now is go to public comment um, and um, Mr. Koulianis, you're, you're up, go ahead. Thank you, and happy birthday, Mayor. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I, I said it anyway. <laughs> um, I'm just, I wanna confirm something that both uh, you commissioners said. Um, in 2017, they had this initial meeting, right? Um, we had our first, we got, I got my first packet in September of 2020. You're on the PNZ board. On the PNZ board. I got my first packet in September of 2020. Um, oh, oh, Dean Progermitis has given me minutes, so just, right, Dean? Two minutes, so you'll have six minutes. All right. And Georgiana, you gonna give me, me two? Can we also have Mr. Colinas? Just six minutes. Just we six. have Mr. Right. Colinas state okay. his address for the record? Oh, state John Colinas, 1020 Peninsula Avenue. Thank you. Okay, so we got our packet in September of 2020. Um, I, I normally we get packets. We've got um, things like you know a setback's going to be 12 feet instead of 10 feet or whatever, and uh, it's usually stuff like that because we get it like on Thursday and we're supposed to vote on it on a Monday, right? I'm, I'm going through it. 420 apartments. Holy mackerel! I never heard. I'm kind of attuned to what's going on in the town. I never heard of this 420 apartments. I made three phone calls. I called the mayor, then commissioner. I called uh, Commissioner Carr, y you weren't available. And I called Commissioner Donovan. I wanted some background. I'm gonna go, I'm going to vote on 420 apartments in one working day and I don't know anything about it. And you knew very little about it. Connor Donovan said, um, he knew very little about it, but he made a comment that it was, he think, I think it's a little too big for that spot, that location. Then he did thought that. All right, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Leadership usually comes in two forms, transactional leaders and transformational leaders. The citizens chose transformation in this past election, hence you. In each of the, <laughs> you're the walking embodiment of transformation. But in, in each of the four races, the citizens chose the candidate that represented the best opportunity for change. No one should have been shocked that you are affecting change today. I commend you in your efforts. We must restore, uh, we must restore full trust in our city staff from top to bottom. And in so doing, only then can our government, our city government work in a transparent and effective way for everyone, and not just those select few that wield and peddle excessive influence. It's problematic when our staff and the applicant are indistinguishable from each other. I watched some of the Enclod Harbor proceedings at home with my wife, and she would ask me, who does this or that person work for? She was often surprised when I told them that, told her that um, that person she asked about actually worked for the city. She actually thought they were working for the applicant and they were indistinguishable. I'd like to speak as a planning and zoning member. 
please do not construe any of my comments as a pro or con on Enclosed Harbors as a good or bad project. It is the process that I'm concerned, that concerned me. As you know, safety was a, a central concern. On the second reading <coughs> in front of the PNZ, Mike Cascudis asked the city's traffic consultant, the city, mind you, the city's traffic consultant, if the multiple exits onto US 19 scheme was safe. The consultant answered, in her opinion, that two exits are safer than one. Mike repeated his question, asking, is it safe? She said she couldn't say it was safe, but only safer. He even repeated his, her answer that it's not necessarily safe, right? And she confirmed it. However, a few weeks later, before the Board of Commissioners, Commissioner Carr asked the same exact question, and he received, yes, it's safe, a yes, it's safe answer. The then Commissioner of Atticiotis <coughs> was the only commissioner to call her out on her contradictory statements, but he was to no avail. He was a, a man in the wilderness at that time. To many observers, it was the answer, it was that answer to Commissioner Carr that was a seminal point towards sealing the ultimate three to one vote. The question in my mind is why would a consultant hired by the city feel compelled to give such an answer when she admitted that she had done no studies or tests that met the relevant and substantial evidence standard required in a quasi-judicial hearing? yet she made a definitive statement that opened the door for your vote and possibly others. It's not my intent to embarrass any of our current staff. To the contrary, I am fond of the people in our planning department. However, some of the staff and I know of report conclusions in the past being influenced and changed by parties outside of the office here in the city. Our planning staff need to work in an environment free of influence from so-called influential citizens, um, outside attorneys and consultants, and yes, even city commissioners. We need to eliminate the unwarranted skepticism from the board members when staff bring reports and recommendations to us. We need to be able to trust them. And to this point, we haven't. And it's all because of this whole environment that's been created. It is my advice that you investigate what you need to, make the structural changes necessary so that this kind of stuff doesn't happen again. But more importantly, the citizens need not have short-term memory losses in future elections. We've been here before. My brother made those same kinds of changes you guys are making. The difference was the citizens had short-term memory losses because the nagging voices of the naysayers and the enablers want nothing more to return to business as usual we must remain diligent. Thank you, Mr. Cooley. Thank you. Um, we're going to continue with public comments, but if I can pause for a moment, um, we've got our 11 o'clock required adjournment time approaching. I'd like to have a um, motion to extend the meeting to whatever you care to make the motion to and, and a second, and we'll vote on it. Motion to extend the meeting to 1130. I'll second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Mr. Robofsky? Thank you. It's Annie Samarcos is donating her time to me. And it's just one person that can do that, right? Yes, yeah, six minutes total. Okay. Yes. That is Thank changed. You. I am reminded. Chris Robosky, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. So we'll get to the 
subpoena process on these people and get them under oath and get them questioned. That'll be in the next item. <clears throat> what you need to do now, it is imperative upon this board to draft a statement to the courts, to the various judges, that this litigation about this project that states that you have uncovered information that proves that it is at least improperly granted development order and at most an illegally granted development order. And you need to get this statement in front of the judges before they make any judgment. This has to happen ASAP. So alongside of saying, hey, we need 30 to 90 days to fix what this attorney did to our city, uh, we also have this other problem that they helped create. So you might want to take that under advisement while this thing's being investigated uh, and either not rule or at least, you know, that has to be a minimum of what you do. If you're not going to settle the case with concerned citizens or the case with Clay Colson, then at least let the judges know what's going on here. And you brought up something else, fish and wildlife. Yeah, somebody noticed that they went out there and filled in the holes. But gopher tortoises have a way of digging their way out if you fill them in without heavy machinery. So they must have also been murdered. Now, you may think that since fish and wildlife went out there and gave you a clean bill of health, well, guess again. You think this is the only place that they have influence? Do you recall Provenzano and the other idiot from Florida Department of Transportation that came in here and lied, said that was a safe project? Do you think that they weren't influenced? Do you think that Fish and Wildlife also was not influenced? Call them up again. Ask them very nicely. Can we all go? Can we get a team of experts go with you? Make sure that there's a clean bill of health. Why would you object? Why would you object to that if it is in fact true that they're safe, that all those gopher tortoises are alive? So once again, thank you for doing your job. It's been a long time coming up here waiting for this. Keep doing it. Keep doing your job. Get this investigation done. Get these people under subpoena, under oath. But my God, all you have to do is at least notify the court that the people that have spent all this time defending this land, defending the city, defending what is right, let the courts know that these people are correct, that they were doing the right thing, and that the board was corrupted, the staff was corrupted, the court must know. This has to be done. It has to be done as soon as possible. And you can't assume that, you know, what was within reason to the uh, traffic engineer, maybe it was within reason to other experts elsewhere, other departments. Who knows? When you're talking about multi-million dollar projects, who knows? how much bags of money get tossed around, I don't. But I was advised that it doesn't always take that. It's not always bribes. It's just pressure of somebody losing their job for doing their job properly. People have fear of that. So their boss comes in and says, uh-oh, you know, old Ed gave us a call. I guess we can't look too closely at this one. I'll have to put pressure on everybody, you know. Don't look too closely at those gopher tortoises or whatever it is. You know, you can't have two ingress, egress on US-19, but then all of a sudden you can. Where's that coming from? You know what this is. This is corruption. And it's finally out, man. It's finally out. And you can't run anymore. And whether you skated on that ethics complaint or not, you ain't going to skate on this one. They're going to get you under subpoena. They're going to get you under oath. So it's about time. Every single one of us thanks you for doing your job. 
hundreds and hundreds of people will know about this. Thousands on our email list will know what you have done here today. But you have to continue the work. You gotta let the courts know. It's imperative. You gotta follow up with every agency and see what's going on there. This can't end here tonight. This has to continue. This is the hard work. And we're going to need a new city manager. And we're going to need a new city planner. We're going to need a lot of things in here alongside our attorney. It's coming up on the end of the year. You got a lot to do. I'm so sorry about that. You didn't create this thing. But thank you for fixing it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Ross. Mr. Geddes. Good evening again. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Based on the National Fish and Wildlife National Wetland definitions, must much of this property, um, this indigenous land, falls underneath a, a riparian wetland definition, which calls into question the Swift Mud Board itself, um, I believe there's a person in question that's on that board, um, as the Swift Mud Board uh, could be compromised and um, possibly corrupted um, in regards to this issue, in regards to uh, wetland uh, concerns. Um, I call that into question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gettys. Good evening, Mr. Rockland. Good evening, Mayor, Board of Commissioners, Robert Rockline, 755 North Lake Boulevard here in Tarpon. Uh, I can still say good evening, luckily, at this point. Uh, thanks to Commissioner Eisner for uh, reading a lot of the emails. I did a lot of the reading also, probably uh, not in the greatest depth, but my overview is, is pretty good when it comes to those things. Hearing them was much more impactive than personally reading them. Uh, and you only, like you said, you only, you only scratch the surface. Uh, it was generally a, a big mutual uh, benefit society uh, that most of us were not invited to, it seems. But uh, I know that this board basically, uh, you know, is ultra uh, concerned with transparency and accountability uh, in government and in all the dealings involved. Uh, I commend your quest for the truth in this. Uh, it's going to be arduous and abrasive, I'm sure, going forward, but it's, it's definitely necessary. Uh, truth equals knowledge, and knowledge is power. Keeping the truth from the public would be an effort to remove or inert that power from the public that's entitled to it. The power to offer opinion, the power to form consensus, the power even to vote correctly. Uh, we're all human. We've all made mistakes, and sometimes Mistakes can be forgiven, but not if they're repeated uh, or concealed or denied. Uh, those mistakes, uh, that's, that's like a concerted effort to insult the public as well as insult our elected officials that represent us. Uh, generally, know, knowingly doing something wrong is always worse than the same thing done, whether it's recklessly or negligently, negligently in the eyes of the law, and rightfully so. They're called uh, you know, standards of proof. Knowing something uh, is being done wrong by others, but passively allowing it to continue, it, it's almost the same guilt by, by omission, you know, failing to act. Uh, you know, if you own your actions, sometimes you can be forgiven, but uh, forgetting, uh, you know, to own them uh, and the public forgetting that you didn't is not going to be the case. Developers usually have nothing to lose unless they have something to gain. So their sins and their disingenuous representations are almost expected. But for those in public surface, any violation of public trust is disheartening, to say the least, and possibly illegal, with things like official, uh, official misconduct and such. Uh, a lot of my civic and governmental experience was pointing me to something that was inherently wrong with this project. In, in a lot of cases, it was many things. Uh, just not being right with this proposal and the actions that, that brought it forth. Uh, it's like a road was expressly paved even though none was planned and people woke up the next day and it was just there, uh, unexpectedly constructed unjustly without notification or due process. 
so I just urge you, whatever it takes to go forward, whether it's time, money, legal expertise and stuff, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's out the truth. Let the people know that you know uh, what was done was inherently incorrect, wrong, possibly illegal, but that going forth, none of that will be tolerated. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Francis. Georgiana Francis, 15 Athens Street. Chief Young's uh, officers have become very familiar with my address as of late, and I, for one, am a huge fan of the no trespass orders. <laughs> so I just want to let you know that. Um, listening to Commissioner Eisner's presentation tonight uh, reminded me of my favorite movie. I catch a lot of flack for this. It's Independence Day. But, <laughs> you know, I've listening to all those emails, all I could not keep this quote from popping into my head, and I want to read it because I don't want to get it wrong. It's um, Randy Quaid, who plays Russell Case in the movie. And he says, good God, I've been saying it. I've been saying it for 10 damn years. Haven't I been saying it, Miguel? Yeah, I've been saying it. And we've been saying it. The town has been saying it. We know the Tara Panty Banther name and everyone associated with them. I'm not afraid to say their names. Their names were all over those emails. And Ms. Commissioner Eisner, that was the question that he kept, and he did such a superb job of reminding everyone throughout his presentation, who is running our city? Who's doing this? And, and to second what uh, John Koulianis mentioned about his wife asking him questions during those Anclote Harbor meetings, I felt the same way. I wasn't as involved in the city as I should have been, and you know, I'm aware of what happened when we all just sit back and we don't pay attention and look what happened. Look, it's just they get comfortable, they get reckless in those emails. And I didn't know that the staff was the staff. I too thought that they were all the Morgan Group. I thought Renee Vincent was the Morgan Group. And that brings me to my next thing and I debated shortly in my head bringing this up but I think this is the time to bring it up. Um, and you know, I think I've gained some credibility in my own community. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, 10 years, probably 11 years practicing and this is something I overheard in a meeting, but I don't want people to overlook the other names in those emails that were also complicit on these board meetings. And there's two names specifically that were on a vote. One was Rhea Saber, who's been vocal and was a huge proponent of the hotel that everybody was against except her, her, and her involvement with the Tarpon Springs Merchants Association. And another name is Susan Kikta. And I don't feel I debated this and I realize it's okay because you know what? They were former commissioners their names were brought up. During the Anclote Harbor meetings, we had some meetings with, um, you know, trying to get organized in a short amount of time because as Mr. Cooley has pointed out, we didn't have a lot of time to get prepared to, to fight this because they had three years working behind doors with their own lawyer, with ours not being involved at all. We had very little time. And so we had a meeting and we got together and some of those people are in, that me in this room tonight. Wendy, Chris Zabrowski, Annie Samarcus, Margot Leiser, Peter Delacus. And Susan Kicka told us all that John Terrapani would call all the commissioners before every meeting and tell them what to do. And she herself included. Now she can say she didn't say that, whatever, but I heard it and I believed it. And I want people to remember that. We need to remember those names and those people that were there. They're not, they, they try to switch sides, but we can't forget who they are and what they were complicit in. And, and and those, every name in there, should everyone should think about those names as upcoming elections come around and who they're associated with and who's donating to their campaigns. Um, and I just really, I want to thank Commissioner Eisner and Mayor Vatikiotis for sticking to this. And you know, even I was a, a naysayer. I, you know, I wanted things to move forward. And you know, I admit when I'm wrong, and I'm, I'm glad that you guys stuck to this. And um, I hope that you see it through its resolution and get the special counsel appointed. So thank you very much. Thank you. Elias Karniku Skatagi, she was actually the first person who I heard mention Terrapani and Banther in like the same sentence. I find it very interesting that uh, no one has really referenced the fact that they have uh, they have a, a real estate office together, and then that the Terrapani family owns most of, like most of the buildings on the first block of Main Street, and they still the Terrapani 
Banther firm represents a lot of land around the city and that so much of this goes way back uh, as far as I think in the first comprehend the comprehensive plan from 20 years ago Cindy Cheriponthi is on that as one of the main people who was involved in the making of it so I, I really would uh, some time ago uh, Mr. Koulias said something about how it's a culture a bad culture uh, and I, I would have to agree with that and that none of this is actually uh, that the question of whether or not this is legal or uh, who is running the city, uh, it, you could actually see it reflected back in state politics actually because this is exactly how lobbying works is that uh, private firms or groups write the language or change the language that they propose as bills or to modify existing uh, legislation and then they pass that on to a firm and that firm passes it on to whoever is representing the bill. So it's not uh, unheard of, it's actually quite common in Florida politics for developers to be so in and involved on crafting the legal language that enables them to do what they've done. Uh, it's a major reason for why Florida is so controlled by developers because all of the institutional power is not in the hands of people who are elected or even like employed, it's uh, bigger things like families uh, that basically have had power for a long time, businesses that have had power for a long time, uh, where it's diffuse, it's not any one person, it's outside of just who we elect because it's the same names that come up over and over again and they manage to stay right outside of the orbit of who would ever be held accountable. Uh, so I would urge that we look into that system of how we can assure that people who haven't been involved in the government before or in the city municipal staff get included in the future in like new hiring um, and also who we consider is valuable to listen to because at this point I, uh, I feel <coughs> like the Tarapani family, like they've made their mark, they can go now because the way power and wealth consolidates is like it's never enough like they already have so much but then they also wanted this because it would be more and more and more it's never going to be enough um, so I, I i honestly think we would be so much better if they can keep their name on main street but i don't understand why they have to like continue running things it's uh, the city governance should belong to the people and I think that's what we're seeing right now is that the people are taking back control uh, with the democratization of the information that we're seeing right now. Um, I, I really commend what you're doing just know that it's going to be a very sticky thing to pry apart because a lot of this is part of a corrupt culture that is allowed and it's just very common here, and picking it apart is going to take some time. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Susan Kikta, 214 Earl Street, Tarpon Springs. Um, I am a former city commissioner, and I just want to clear the record that I fought for this property again since 2008 or maybe before for this Walmart property. So for people to say that I voted for these land use changes and I knew exactly what I, why I was voting for this is so not true. There was a lot of backdoor dealings, I'm sure, going on with this property since 2008 that I'm not aware of. Why, why would I vote for land use changes on this property when I'm fighting to save it? So I, I think people should get their facts straight before they start accusing. Uh, there's a lot of name slinging out here tonight. I get it. We're, we're all um, passionate. We're all passionate. And again, I've been fighting for this for a very long time. I thank you all for bringing all this forward. But some of the name slinging that's going on, you know, it's not. It's not. It's not right. I'm appalled by by these emails that were that that were read tonight. Absolutely appalled on what is going on behind the scenes with this city. And, and 
it's just it's just amazing. I knew, I, you know, we've all figured there's some stuff going on through the years, but this really, really nails it. Really nails it. All these emails. I wasn't able to open up the emails, and I really would like to read them myself. So I may um, put a records request in for that. Um, we really need to question the board that served after I served, and the board. So it's the board that served before all of you. That board needs to be questioned. Absolutely, and I don't know if this is something we can think about, or you know, coming up. Can can we recall that vote? Recall the vote, and start over again. Um, that that could be an option. I know we've been asked to do that in the past, as when I was a commissioner. So, um, recall the vote and and start over and see if it passes again. Thank you. Public comments. Anyone else? Randy Myers, 1389, Sail Harbor Circle, Tarpon Springs. See, and I just wanted to emphasize, come back to Chris's request and ask the board to, um, to create and approve a motion to uh, prepare, provide a, uh, to the appropriate parties, a well-drafted letter about um, informing those parties of what's happening here, however best you can do that. Um, uh, I'm, and I'm talking about with regards to the litigation that's that's going on right now. So I'd like to ask the board to prepare a motion and complete that process, if you would. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anyone else for public comments? Um, so I can clarify, I'm allowed one person to volunteer minutes for two minutes to a total of six. Six minutes total. Mr. Wagonfur is going to uh, volunteer his time. Okay. I don't think anybody's been more involved with this property since the beginning. I remember the first meeting I had after I became a commissioner in 2004. We went up to Ellen's office. There was Marilyn Healy, Ed Armstrong, John Hubbard, and another representative from Walmart. And they were explaining their project. And to be honest, they were open at the time. In fact, <laughs> I shocked them. I brought in my tape recorder and I asked if I could record the meeting and somewhere in a box I've got some cassettes. But, and again, as Ms. Kitka mentioned, some of us have had problems trying to download the email so I haven't been able to read them. They are surprising and shocking in some regards, but not surprising, not surprising. I remember the first meeting December 8th. In fact, it was kind of interesting. Um, it was Thanksgiving 2020 and I got a text from someone saying, I hear you talking about the Walmart property all the time and did you know that it came up to the planning and zoning meeting? I said, nope, didn't know it. Called Carl that weekend, December 2nd, we went down to the office and stacks, stacks. I mean, they definitely had been working for quite a while, quite a while. So we had to scramble that December 8th meeting. I remember coming in and right there, Cindy Tarapani, Ed Armstrong. And I turned around and looked up. She had said she had been working on this project for over three years. And I, right then and there, I said, you turn coat. She said, don't go there. So over the years now, I kind of always wondered why John and Cindy back in 04 and 05 were so against the Walmart project going through. 
And then when I see her there and I hear this, well, maybe because they didn't have a part in the deal the first time. And I'm not one to toss things out because I don't know, but that's why I think a special magistrate is required because Commissioner Eisner read emails, but in Mr. V uh, uh, Mayor Vadikiotis's memo, he mentioned about F8, the F1 forms, which are financial disclosures, and I think it's the S8, which is for recusals. But I just want to remind some of y'all the depths of what Ed Armstrong, Hill, Ward, Henderson will do. <laughs> Every time they come to Tarpon, Tarpon gets messed up. We talked about it a couple of months ago with the right-of-way vacations and how Ed Armstrong got that changed and then Pioneer Development came in. They didn't have to pay any fee, which cost the city almost $75,000 for that right-of-way that they got. And now we're seeing all the stuff that Ed Armstrong machinated. That's why developers go to him. I used to joke about calling him the Pope of Pinellas because everybody would go to Ed Armstrong to get their projects done. But I gave you a clue on October 27th, around 12.30 a.m., 1 in the morning, the 28th, when I read the emails between Ed Armstrong, Barry Burton, what was the other lady's night, the associate, the attorney, where he basically got the county to have Kelly Levy Hammer and Ms. Foster retract their statements about what they had said with regards to the project. Ed's been doing this for years and people know it. He's got the influence and such of that nature. But because my name was mentioned earlier, I, I have about a minute left. I kind of want to go over something real quick. Uh, the February 25th of 2019 planning and zoning meeting, it's only 35 minutes. You can go online and look at it. Sadly, no one was there. But if you watch it, you can see how Heather shapes the conversation, laying the groundwork for this. And then the next night on February 26, 2019, there was a meeting of the Board of Commissioners that Ms. Kitna references, and they weren't told the truth either. They were given contrary information that, well, we need to change this because there was a project on Orange Street and then they got tied up and they didn't get their approval from the Heritage Preservation Board, so they had to come back for the conditional use again. That wasn't the reason they changed it. They did it for the Anklin Harbors, and I promise Commissioner Carr, I know he's gotten beaten up a lot about some of this stuff, mostly because he voted no, but he was the only one at that meeting to vote against all three of those ordinances. The one that changed the development agreement from five to 10 years, the one that tied the conditional use to site plans versus building permits, and also where they discussed having a developer pay for the city's review of the environmental studies of the wetlands and upland actions. And Mr. Banther, right on cue, no, we can't have them do it. They're already paying enough fees. So, and there again, it's ironic. <laughs> Cindy, at one of the hearings, said, well, there was never anybody talking about trying to make this property a park or trying to save this property. Yet at that Board of Commissioners meeting, in public comments, I was there speaking about the Walmart project, and then during the debate about the development agreement and also the mitigation, I spoke about the mitigation prospects for the city 
and how a lot of these things are being changed to favor a developer. I just didn't know it was a specific developer at the time. So they've been lying to this board, previous boards, and I only hope that this commission decides on the next item to hire a special counsel, special magistrate, so it takes it out of your hands, so it's not deemed political, and they can look at the truth and the facts. Thank you for allowing me an extra moment. I greatly appreciate Thank the you, opportunity Mr. to share these facts. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Koulianis. Good evening. Uh, Tom Koulianis, 1250 South Pinellas Avenue, Tarpon Springs. Um, had no intention of talking tonight or ever talking again here in a commission meeting, but I feel so vindicated tonight. I feel like going out and celebrating because this is what we were talking about 35 years ago, what was going on in Tarpon Springs. There's two things that are different now that have allowed you to take the steps you have. Number one, technology. Didn't have emails back then in 1986. You now have emails. They leave a trail of what these people do. And number two is they don't have a state attorney at their fingertips. That whenever something occurred in this city that certain people didn't like, Jimmy Russell, the state attorney, would call a grand jury if he could do it easy. They can indict a ham sandwich, according to these attorneys. So what do they do? They call a grand jury when we got on the board and started saying no to some of these projects. Six months of going through grand jury proceedings is what my family had to endure. It was a bitch, okay, to put it mildly. When I lost the election, there were no indictments. The grand jury was over. That's what it was for, it was to defeat me so I wouldn't run again. Why? Because we were turning down projects. We were against projects like Tarpon Tower, where the city had to go spend a million dollars for a friggin' fire truck to get up there. Food Lion, many of you people don't know. Have you ever heard of the Food Lion project? That was, do you know where uh, Sunset Hills Elementary is? That used to be a Food Lion. They put a friggin' shopping center in a wetland behind the school. It lasted about as long as a couple of these commissioners have. And that went bankrupt. There are certain things that are just, I'm just so excited about what you guys are doing. Keep up the good work. The, the, the problem is nothing changes in this town. It's just, it's generational. You get the same families, the same, different generations. And I got two minutes from Michael Hulis, by the way. Yeah, but, uh, you know, Mr. Koulianis, if I could just interrupt, we're approaching 1130, which is what we'd agreed to for uh, adjournment. I'm going to ask for a motion and a second to extend it, and then you can continue on. Motion to extend till 12 o'clock. Good night. I'll second. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Continue, Things please. are different now. <clears throat> In the past... In the past, they would use the city manager as a conduit. Each commissioner would tell the city manager how they felt about an item. He'd let them know what the other commissioners felt about it. I was approached by a commissioner when I got elected. If you have an issue with anything on the agenda, let, let the city manager know. He'll let us know. So I wrote a letter to the U.S. Attorney's Office Robert Merkel, back in 1986, and told him I was approached and I wanted him to investigate. I did not give it to Jimmy Russell because he was part of it. During the grand jury proceeding, when I was testifying, Mr. Jimmy Russell held that letter up to me and said, why did you send this letter to the U.S. attorney and not to me? And I told him in front of the grand jury because I couldn't trust you. So, and then I brought up other things, such as using the city manager as a conduit. <clears throat> Excuse my breathing right now. <clears throat> so, there's generational differences. 
the same families are in it, different players, but the same families. You have the tear panties. You know, how many of you are aware that in 1980, Commissioner Terrapenny was arrested for buying a million dollars worth of marijuana. Any Mr. of you know that? Mr. Koulianis, if we could leave that. I understand. Well, I understand these, it's, these it's, are things that are it's a public understand. record. I understand. Okay? There are, there, are commission, there are former mayor and former commissioners that get up and remind you at every meeting that Tom Koulianis was investigated and that's not the fair. I, I understand that. Okay? It's not fair. I'm I agree finally with that. saying enough yeah. is enough. Right. Yes, I was investigated. Why? I think everybody knows why. But there were no indictments. It was just, it worked for them. So I, I applaud you for what you're doing. Keep it up. And our children will applaud you. And thank you for it. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Coolidge. Uh, are there any other public comments? Any other public comments? Um, Mr. Jump, are there any remote access comments? Ms. Simon, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand, so I'll allow the first person in. Uh, hang on with that. Do you I'm have sorry. a comment? Go ahead. Yeah, Wendy Crisado, 616 Palm Avenue. I just want to thank this commission and honorable mayor for you know who you are that we voted for. And in 25 plus years of Brian and I coming here, and I recognize several people here that have fought the development over here, I have never seen the transparency and the honesty that I'm hearing tonight. And I, I'm almost in uh, unbelief. And, you know, I have prayed that I would live to see this day. And this is just the beginning. I can't even imagine how much greater it's going to get. And I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jump, go ahead, please. Well, good evening or good morning, depending upon where you are. This is Vice Mayor Lund. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to uh, say that, yes, I did sit through this. Um, I was one of the people that did read the 750 some odd emails several times along with Mr. Eisner and, and Mr. <laughs> Commissioner Eisner, I wanted to applaud you for your review it was it was succinct it got people interested and i think everybody is, knows what's going on um commissioner uh you've done an excellent job in, in exposing this i think we all were a little bit shocked and i'm, I'm just wanted to say it was it was well done i'm sorry if i'm mumbling a little bit here it's, it's like six o'clock in the morning or something for me but um Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. I'm glad we got through this. Um, I think it was handled in a pretty respectful manner. I think the public is going to become better aware of how transparent our current commission is going to be. Um, and we'll continue to be in, in favor for them. Thank you. Thank you. do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jacobs, no emails. Okay. Um, all right, we're going to end that item, and um, we're going to proceed on with um, item number 11, which is authorization to uh, seek special counsel concerning past administrative procedural matters, and that's my item. And um, uh, this one is going to require some action so I'm going to go ahead and, and um, Mr. Jump, if I'm going to need somebody to set up that little um, computer down here for that presentation. If I could have somebody come down here and do that. Um, what I'm going to do, waiting for Mr. Jump to come down. Is he coming down? Okay. Um, when Mr. Jump is coming down, the, um, you've heard a lot of the emails tonight. 
Um, a lot of things don't sound right. If you start looking at the um, ethics rules, if you start looking at the Florida rules for professional conduct of attorneys, it raises a lot of questions of whether uh, there's been any of this has crossed those lines, that behavior has crossed the lines of that. And, um, and so I, I think that we can, hear, we can talk about it um, until we're blue in the face, but we're not gonna really know until we get a professional person that specializes in this, an attorney that specializes in this sort of um, work in order to be able to tell us um, what they believe happened, um, whether there are any actionable items against individuals, and then perhaps maybe whether there's anything um, that the city can do concerning the, uh, the approval itself, um, whether there's anything that happened that would affect the approval. And so, um, and, and that's the one side of it. The other side of it is that we continue to spend an inordinate amount of time um, on this matter. Um, and we need to kind of put it in the lap of somebody else so we can move on with some of the city projects. For example, the one that I'm con personally concerned about um, when the bridge, which is the county's job uh, at the Yacht Club begins to get construction, we have to have that intersection at Spring Boulevard, Martin Luther King fixed or else people are gonna start be driving through salt water in that to get into town. So there's a number of things that we need to turn our attention to. Um, the city manager has uh, and his staff have about a, a dozen um, ordinances that are altering the policy to prevent some of these things that are happening that we've already uncovered from the campaign trail and other things. That's got to come back to us between now and um, Christmas. So there's a number of things that are there. In addition, um, just for the record, um, our current planning director has already gone through all the, or, the ordinances, the comprehensive plan changes that were done as part of these emails that were discussed this evening, she's gonna be coming forward at some point to ask us direction on whether we should roll these back, uh, amend them in some other way, or leave them in place. So it's not like we've been sitting idle, but we've been preoccupied with what we're talking about this evening um, in order to keep us from bringing some of these other things uh, forward. What I'm gonna show you tonight is um, actually for about five minutes is to uh, put everything in context as far as what these emails, what the um, uh, changes of the ordinances meant in terms of furthering this project and how it pretty much sealed it tight once it was approved so there's no risk of it expiring, for example. So let me walk over there and I'm gonna uh, just move to the, to the podium for a moment. Some of the ones that you're gonna see um, are, have already been talked about, and I'm just gonna just quickly go through those. But basically, um, it's the, the topics that we're gonna be getting into with the special counsel is, um, if one is approved, is ethics and fiduciary duty or responsibility and transparency. And um, the, the, the two that would be an issue which would be actionable would be the ethics and fiduciary responsibility. And, um, if you read the highlighted um, area there that um, public officials have a broad fiduciary responsibility to the public interest. When you elected me, you, you want me, I, I can't show up here not having read the, the backup. That's fiduciary responsibility. I need to know what I'm voting on in order to do that. Um, obviously, a previous board from all appearances didn't know <laughs> what they were voting on. It was somebody's responsibility to tell them what they were voting on. That didn't happen. In fact, it was actually concealed from them. So where does this fall into our roles and responsibilities in the city's charter, which is the Constitution, <clears throat> under our Section 8, which is the legislative section? It's the Board of Commissioner's responsibility to set zoning and land use policy. That didn't happen here. Actually, all this land development 
uh, ordinances, comp plan things bubbled up from the staff without any really request from the city commission. All this just bubbled up and, um, and the approval was kind of the Radar O'Reilly approach of approvals where you just slide in underneath the commission's nose and just sign right here. It's, it's, it, result, it, it has to do with these other projects, but the real purpose of the ordinances were not disclosed to the commission. Here are some key dates. Um, what, there's some, uh, the emails are on here, but the key, the dates are really the most important. Um, the first staff meeting um, and the, with the developer occurred October 26, 2017. The commission was notified uh, with actually beginning with Commissioner Carr's inquiry as far as the understanding of the project and it followed up with the uh, uh, city manager's email to the commission uh, basically telling them that there was the due diligence going on with the Enclode Harbor. The first application, which is really important, the first application uh, for the approval was September 15th, 2020. So for almost three years, there was no application for this project, but there was a heck of a lot of work, a heck of a lot of time, a heck of a lot of money spent teeing up this project before it even became a formal project. And then of course, the first, Bowie, uh, first uh, commission meeting on this was December 8th. Um, the little red underneath that uh, was from an email from one of the staff members who actually advised me who was actually at that very first meeting. So we have that information. And I guess the question is, when was the public notified? I think is um, probably the best gauge for that would be what Mr. Delacus said December 8th. Um, he was very critical in the Walmart issue. He was a little surprised by it back then. And if he was surprised by it, I would say everybody else was surprised by it as well. Um, you've seen this email. This email is from um, um, Ms. Erweiler to the city manager about um, needing to do some work on the conditional use. Um, that was October 8th. 2018. The, uh, the, from our second bond hearing, um, the Morgan groups, I, I believe uh, the gentleman is the managing partner, basically stated under oath that the uh, Morgan group had decided to proceed with a project November 8th, November 2018. So for two years, even though the Morgan group had agreed to proceed with the project, it wasn't made public. Um, this is the email that um, Commissioner Eisner had mentioned. It's from Ms. Erweiler to uh, uh, Mr. Armstrong, and it just basically talked about the, uh, uh, the, the, re the staff report that was sent to them. And this is kind of the, this is an interesting sort of, um, uh, kind of gets to the meat of the topic. Um, she had given the uh, developer's attorney, the staff report, two days later, you got an email back from the develop developer's attorney to um, the, to the uh, planning director at that time. And the box there is the one that Commissioner Eisner with the proposed language, the Morgan Group's proposed language for the, um, for the conditional use. Um, that same day, at 3.04 3 p.m., Mr. Commissioner Eisner didn't mention the times, but that's three and a half hours from having received the de uh, developer attorney's email to when the planning director emailed the developer's attorney back with the revised language that had already been passed through the city attorney's office at that time. That's three and a half hours. I, I can't get anything that quick. <laughs> out of our staff, but the Morgan Group was able to do that. Um, January, Feb January, February time frame is basically when the two ordinances, the conditional use being tied to the site plan, and that's the one that I'm gonna focus on. And then also the development agreement um, was changed from expiring from five years to 10 years. That was in the January, February 2019 time frame. 
Um, so what is the importance, and this is where I need to tie things together, what's the importance of tying the conditional use to the final site plan and not the building permit? Well, prior to the change, the conditional use would expire in 12 months if a building permit was not issued. And if it expired, then a reapplication would have to be, would be required, which means the, the conditional use would come back to the commission for reconsideration. Now, the conditional use is tied to the final site plan, um, Anclode Harbor Apartments. Final site plan was approved the same night as the preliminary development plan. There was no building permit that was required. When they did that, that triggered and the conditional use is now in place without risking its expiration. In May of 2019, the development agreement, which changed from a five-year expiration to 10 years, was abandoned. And, um, and that's interesting as well. The development agreement expires now in 10 years. Um, once the uh, residential, uh, so basically why in May of 2019, why did the developer move from the developer agree, developer's agreement to the residential plan development approach? That's two different processes. So the development agreement now under the change changed in 10 years. I mean, it expired in 10 years if nothing happened, which is 10 years is a long time. You heard all of us talk about that. But once the re residential plan development is passed, it would expire in one year if a building permit was not applied for, not issued, was not applied for. The Anklo Harbor Apartments building permit was applied for shortly after the final development plan. And under our current ordinances right now, our city ordinances do not provide for an expiration of the residential plan development once a building permit had been applied for. There is no expiration on this right now. So it went from five years to 10 years to right now because of a quirk in our current land development code that wasn't even considered by the Morgan Group at that time, but I, I think once further analysis was done, they, perhaps that would have been a better approach and that's what was done. And that is now on the list of the current planning director uh, uh, job to change that so that doesn't happen again in the future. So the first time that the um, city commission was formally notified was December 2nd, 2019. Um, the conditional use application was submitted almost um, a year later, September 15th, 2020, along with all the other applications for the other approvals that were needed. And the final site plan approved at the same night as the second reading of the preliminary site plan. And the conditional use is in effect. The building permit was applied for shortly after, and right now the residential plan development of the Anclode Harbor's apartment projects does not expire. So what if the conditional use ordinance had not been changed? That's the key. What if it hadn't been changed? To date, the building permit has not been issued. At that time, if the building permit had not been issued, the conditional use would expire if the building permit had not been issued within a year. The approval was in November uh, 2021, and we would be coming up on the expiration of the conditional use in November 2022. Now I've got that asterisk, asterisk because with the COVID, there were some emergency orders that um, uh, through the Florida stat statutes where there was a statewide emergency, the governor can extend these development orders, but I'm not sure that would apply here because there was no, the building permit applied for and the conditional use, there was no, no trigger as far as a specific date. It just didn't happen, so I'm not so sure about that. So if it, if it would expire next month, of course, the commission would rehear the conditional use application, but it's all moot right now.
because the conditional use was changed from what it was and the Morgan Group was involved in that. And I think that's what the crux of the issue is that you're hearing this evening. Again, it gets back to um, many comments tonight. What were the people who, um, you know, up here you've got the baker, butcher, and candlestick maker sitting at the dais. They're not lawyers. They're not, I mean, you could be, but they're not here. And you don't have um, um, uh, a professional planner that's on here. So um, who's, who's, who's minding the store? That's the responsibility of the professionals that we pay, such as a city attorney and, and so forth. Somebody needs to be minding the store, and that's what happened. That's it. So um, because of all of that and, and what you're hearing right now um, as far as why I think we need a, uh, a special counsel to turn everything that you've heard tonight, the emails, um, that special counsel would be able to um, have a conversation with a city manager uh, outside of this sort of forum and uh, perhaps get to the root of some of the issues perhaps uh, maybe speak to the former city attorney. Of course, that would be up to, to them. Um, speak to our current staff, which are some of those are still here that took place then, then they could shed some light on who knew what and perhaps some of these other meetings that took place. And, and then once that, all that information is accumulated, I would hope that the special counsel would make a uh, um, a, a report and then give us the information that we need as far as um, what kind of policies that we should do. We'll, we know of some now, but some others that they see that needs to be done to prevent this outside meddling from occurring within our staff, um, whether there's any actionable items uh, that they see from an ethics or a, a, a rules, Florida rules uh, issue that needs to be uh, followed up, that would be a case-by-case -case basis with the commission. And then, of course, what does all this mean to the overall approval of the uh, Enclote Harbor uh, project? So basically, that's it in a summary. And I'm going to go ahead and um, um, let's get some public comments, and then we'll go to the commission, uh, since this is going to be an action item. So uh, if, if someone has any public comments, please come forward. I'm going to move back to the uh, uh, to the dais. Are there any public comments? M Mayor, you may want to consider extending the meeting. To, it's midnight, right? Yes. Okay. Um, motion? Motion to extend to 1230. I'll second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Cuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? No. Mayor Vatican? Yes. Um, are there any public comments? Okay. Um, I, uh, Mr. Jump, are there any uh, public comments on remote access? If anyone online would like to speak, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand at this time. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and hear those, and then we'll come back to Mr. Delacus. Go ahead, Mr. Jump. Hi, yes. Hi, uh, Nicholas Tabus, 1427 Mears. Um, I just want to thank the, this Board of Commissioners for uh, this evening. Um, I just have to say that, I mean, really, this was probably the, one of the greatest um, events in city commission history um, so far as just the level of detail and expo explanation afforded to the citizens. I mean, we went from, you know, Watergate tape readings to uh, movie episodes to uh, Ross Perot explanations. And I say that in, in, in being all serious of, I mean, just, just the real thank you to uh, this commission and the, um, you know, this is, this is how things are done. I mean, and I know for some citizens, this is a surprise um, for some of us that maybe have been involved a little bit more, not just in the city level, but on other levels of government. I mean, this is really how it's done. And it's unfortunate. Um, you know, we, we talk about special interest groups writing laws. I mean, this is what goes on in Washington, D.C. every day. Um, 
you know, this is what lobbyists do. This is, you know, they, they write the laws, they send it over to Congress people and their legislative team puts it into action and, and, and it becomes law and um, it's wrong. And I just want to thank this board um, for having the guts to delve this deep into something that, you know, most people would probably want to keep under the covers. Um, whether it's wrong, whether it's um, legal, illegal, I don't know. I'm, I'm not the arbiter of that. Um, you know, I spoke at the planning and zoning board meeting uh, prior when they voted, you know, five to one to deny the project. And, you know, everyone was like, how did the FDOT go from saying that, you know, two, ent two one entrance was required and you couldn't have two entrances on 19 to, to then saying, oh, yeah, two entrances on 19 is fine. It's because this is what they do. That's what they're there for. They're, they may make you jump through a couple hoops here and there, but at the end of the day, they are there to build the tax base revenue. They're there to, there to increase the state revenue. They're there to increase the number of public jobs available. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But when you're talking about sensitive coastline, when you're talking about safety of traffic and US-19, and you just want to throw all that to the wayside. When, when I, I mean, what of a joke of a traffic study? I mean, anybody with eyes and ears back then w was able to look and see what a joke that traffic study was. And everyone, you know, on the previous board, oh, oh yeah, it looks good to me. Oh, I'm rubber stamp it. Oh, uh, the perfect. I mean, what a joke, S sir. I mean, um, it, it's just the, the, the sir. You're out of time. If you could wrap so up your it. thoughts. All right. Do, do you have any last thoughts? All right. I thoughts? appreciate it. Okay, thank you, sir. Nope, that's it. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Um, Mr. Jump, is there anyone else? And we do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Jacobs, just for the record, nothing. No, no. Okay, Mr. Delakis, please, thank you. Thank you. I'll try to be short. I know it's getting late. I uh, just want to highlight a couple of things here from uh, the mayor's memo. Uh, I've reviewed many other pieces of the puzzle, specifically Form 8Bs for commissioners fully disclosing voting conflicts of interest, Form F1 Statement of Financial Interest, Code of Ethics for Public Officers, Rules and Standards of the Public of the Florida Bar. In the next paragraph, I am not an attorney, but by, in my opinion, as an experienced layman, there is a strong possibility that there are actionable issues. There appear to be improprieties by any standards of good government, and the public was deprived of its rights to good government. There is sufficient written evidence of questionable activities as they pertain to Florida's ethics rules. So, you need to go forward with a special magistrate, special counsel, however you want to define it, and uh, as the mayor said, it should be someone with constitutional law, land use law, malpractice law. But in the one paragraph here, it says there's a question whether a special counsel should take over any litigation involving the Morgan Group and the concerned citizens. I do not believe it would be wise to have a new city attorney involved in the litigation. Uh, and it goes on to say the city attorney and special counsel this situation may reflect questionably on their independence. So again, I would like to uh, state my suggestion uh, that the special magistrate to review the whole big picture be one. You hire your city attorney to handle all your boards and your normal regular day-to-day -day business, your interlocal agreements, your dealings with Pasco County with the Anclote River, uh, Anclote restaurant out at the River Park out there, any of those other items. <coughs> but you need to have someone actually handling your litigation. And, and not only that, they need to look at it and see with all of what has now been transpired, where you really stand, where, what your true options are. Did, as it was mentioned earlier, I think uh, Ms. Franzis mentioned it, is you, you possibly have a void ordinance because it was done through collusion and other factors. And the mayor mentioned in his 11 uh, questions, uh, number three was about ethics violations. 
There is evidence between Form 8Bs, Form 1s, and the Commissioner's knowledge of the project that suggests it was known that the purpose of the legislation was to benefit a specific project and the project would benefit him personally. So you need a special magistrate or person to be able to look into any financial improprieties or any other types of financial connections. Also, in uh, the number nine, in the first qu commission quasi-judicial meeting on December 8th, the Anklet Har Projects, question of disclosing any ex parte communications was not asked, and the commissioner had a voting call and disclosed it later. Yet, again, in one of the later hearings, we hear how John Terrapani calls and talks to everybody. So that needs to be investigated. And lastly, on the number 11, if the commission proceeds with a special counsel, should the court, concerned citizen Morgan group, be notified formally that the city has commenced an investigation? Yes. You need to let the court know what's going on besides withdrawing from the case. So I would ask at this point that you not only approve a special counsel, uh, but you also in your uh, motion uh, pass that the courts are notified of what your proceedings are and that you need time to hire an attorney to bring on to give you new representation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay, let's go to the uh, commission. Um, see, Commissioner Carr, you're a senior. Yeah, um, Mayor, I think there's two things we need to vote on tonight on this one do we want to hire the special counsel second who's going to be the representative in this process that's right um so if we could separate those is that okay whatever you'd like okay um a couple I mean, things as long as it gets done <laughs> yeah i mean we're here at 12 o'clock so why stop now right Sorry. um i just want to bring up a couple things and i'm not saying it's right or wrong i just want to put it out there because i've been on the board for almost six years um, historically, uh, and this was not, we did not like this as a board in the past, and I think you all are expressing the same um, interest that I'm going to say. Um, the city planners at time or staff would come and say, hey, we have this application, we're going to be voting on it tonight or next, next meeting, but we want to change this code specifically for this application. And time and time again, the board's like, this does not make any sense, stop doing this. Um, we don't need to change the code for one application. Um, so that, that was verbally put into the record multiple times. Um, and it, it was a practice that was done. And I don't know if it's common practice in other cities. I don't know if it's common practice in planning or whatever it is. But it, it happened in the past, and not just for the Anclote project, because as a parent, there's a lot of stuff that happened that wasn't made disclosed or disclosed to the board. Um, but I do want to let the public know that and the, the residents know that that was something that was just common for city staff to do. Well, we're going to change this code to help this application get through so they could put X, Y, Z in the, in the city. Um, the board definitely shared their frustration with that in the past. So I, there's a couple things I just want to bring up. Um, Mayor, I, this is, I mean, it is what it is, but... Um, during the process, too, the, a commissioner at the time did reach out to three members of the Planning and Zoning Board unprovoked to share their recommendations on the Planning and Zoning. That was a recommendation back to our current board as well, too. So I do think there's some questions there that we probably need to hash out um, as well, too. Um, at the end of the day, did I think that was wrong? I did think that was wrong at the time. Um, I think it's if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. Uh, as part of the quote and the backup. So, um, regardless, there's different things on here that we need to look at. Um, I'm not happy with everything, but at the end of the day, it's where we're at. Um, so, uh, voting on on the special majesty that part. I want to move on to the to the next part is. Um, Who's going to be the person that to work with this? You asked that the city manager not be the person, correct? Because I, I, I think it, it's yes. That's the whole idea is to try and insulate 
the city staff from this because sure. the um, special counsel is going to be interviewing everybody, as a matter of fact. So, yeah. So uh, I ask that you hear me out on this one. Uh, one of the struggles that I have is if if it's myself, if it's the mayor, if it's one of the other commissioners, we're going to run in sunshine issues. Um, if I want to go to you and ask, well, mayor, can you give me an update on what's going on here, or what's going on with this? Um, and the aspect of the city's hired a, an internal auditor. And I think this is the perfect time for the internal auditor to step in and take that role to where it's, he's an independent person. He's independent as a staff member. He doesn't report to anybody but to the board. Um, he's got no loyalty to anybody on staff. He's proven that he's fine calling out anybody on staff uh, that he comes across and finds anything. So I think at the end of the day, it's going to be best that he takes that role working with procurement and then the board work with him as well too because then at that point we're going to avoid any sunshine issues um if i've got to go to you and trying to get more information that i can't get any information because you're like well we're on the no, board together right so no the way the way the um the 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 liaison would be for maybe i misstated it but is for hiring the special counsel once that special counsel is hired he doesn't need anybody on city staff. He goes directly to each of the commissioners to talk to them. Correct, but the process of hiring it, the, the council, though, that's what Right, but that in. would come back to you. Um, and, and it would be um, along the lines of the, the specialty areas that we talked about, uh, working with Ms. Lewis to identify some of those and then bring those back to you. Um, I think that there needs to be some uh, assured independence among those law firms that they really have not worked with some of the ones that are like for example uh hill hill ward i think is mr armstrong's firm oh, that sort of thing and um that that would be the only thing but then those questions would be asked by you when they come back for approval yeah i, I just think there's a conflict of interest there um as a as a board member being involved in procurement i know the city managers made that clear throughout all the years i've been up here is that we do not get involved with the procurement process. We have an independent third party individual who reports to the board here. I think he is the best person to, to, to sit there and do that for yeah. us. Well, um, I just think it's, the, it's professional. Yeah, I think it's the, I the right way to go um, and not have one of us sit in that seat. Uh, I understand the desire to it and I appreciate you willing to do it. I know it's a lot of work, um, but I think from our roles of what our roles are, I think it's best that, to utilize our internal auditor for that situation. The only difference is I went through this 25 years ago with a hospital board issue, and I know exactly what needs to be done, and we, we succeeded in that. Now, city manager at that time, um, I just, my concern is putting that liaison in the hands of somebody that doesn't have any experience. I haven't spoken to Mr. Poulos about this at all. So that's my only concern. It's got to be done right. That's but it doesn't mean that we can't work with Mr. Poulos on it also. That's the thing. It, he's not by himself. Like, he still reports to the board. The board can still have communication. No, 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 no. Each of us can. Uh, that's the whole point. <laughs> that's the problem. Each commissioner telling Mr. Poulos what he wants. And Mr. Poulos perhaps doing something that he, I might want or Mr. Eisner might want or whatever. Um, but you're asking to be a strong mayor in this situation and taking it's not a strong mayor it's just a liaison uh, for a person that's got some experience that is not going to cross the line i mean from it is a lot of work but i think it needs to be done right is what i'm getting at. i agree it needs to be done right and i don't think any representation on our board being on there the fact that you voted against the project or anything along those lines like these are things that we need to we have to step back and look at it from a higher view okay. There's nothing personally that I, no, I have no, issues no. about. I'm I, that's just okay. to that's take right. the professional aspect and say, I think it's best to have an independent person that reports to the board handle this process. Okay. Um, that's where I stand. I mean, I'm, but you, the rest so, of the board should so go So basically, um, you're okay with the uh, special counsel. Um, it's just a liaison issue. That's the, the problem. I mean, I, I, what I'm trying to do is get your comments completed so we can go on to the other commissioners. Sure, I understand. Okay. I, I don't know about the special counsel yet. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have total confidence in you making a decision for your liaison. I don't think that there would be any problem 
Um, the issue of picking a liaison is knowledgeable of someone who is going to be able to do delve in work into getting the facts. Um, that person then would report whatever they find or don't find to all of us up here. So I don't have a clue what was just said a few minutes ago. Um, I'm even more shocked that after all of the opinions I've heard Commissioner Carr say over the last six years, he's now decided to flip it around and say that staff seem to convert and change his opinion of code violations or code he was convinced by people that he doesn't take any information from. He's never needed anybody for any sort of his decisions and he's gonna sit and try to sell that to us that somebody else convinced him of otherwise, I don't buy that at all. Okay. But I am for the liaison, and um, that's pretty much it. I don't know. okay with the special counsel? Special well? counsel, yes. Okay. Um, is, is that it? That's okay. more than enough. Commissioner Kulias. I'm okay with the special counsel. I'd like for you to be the, li the liaison for the city. It doesn't matter if it's our city auditor or the mayor or anyone out here in this audience. We can't talk to each other about what we heard, what's happening, regardless of the situation. Um, this requires someone who's, use who's familiar with land use uh, codes and changes and future land use map amendments. and just overall history w w with our town. I, I don't think the city auditor's quite there yet, and uh, that's not his expertise area. Uh, so I'd like to support uh, our mayor to be the liaison. Um, I, I do, I, I'm here to look for a recall of a vote. I, I'm, I've seen enough, I've heard enough, and it, I believe it's time to recall the vote, and I believe we need to have a backup for a second opinion on a special counsel. Uh, I, I may not like what I hear the first time, I don't know. I wanna make sure these people have never worked with Hill Ward Henderson or Morgan Group or some of these local F dot people. Uh, I'm also concerned about you know, a special counsel that we may hire that's very familiar with our six judicial court system, which means you know a lot of the judges inside of there. And uh, I, I prefer someone from outside of here that we're gonna to ask tough questions about um, past experiences or any involvement with other people and we'll go from there. But the, the bottom line is I'm looking for a recall of vote. I'd like to get everybody who's been here and who's been involved with this in the past to get them in depositions under discovery, put their hand on a Bible, hand our oath and start telling the truth. I don't, you know, the mayor, you know, former mayor Alahuza, he's gonna come back from Gallimus, he's gonna have to explain himself, these past commissioners from the prior two boards. I mean, it's time to let the gloves off. We got the residents have more leverage than ever and I think you guys need to realize that and we need to keep pushing forward to make sure we get this all unwrapped and disclosed to the public. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, oh, let, let me, uh, did you have something else? Yeah, and I, and I would be interested in filing a bar complaint versus our, our past firm, Trass and Daniel, as well as Ed Armstrong for the non-disclosures in the work that they did not disclose to the public, as well as recouping all legal fees from the Morgan Group, uh, from Trask and Daniel regarding their legal counsel that they had given us, knowing that Trask was not looking out in the best interest of the people of Tarpon Springs, as well as, uh, but we need to make sure this, get writ this gets written right. These complaints, these bar complaints, these, these lawsuits, they gotta get written right because it takes nothing for a Florida bar to sit there and say, oh, you guys didn't write a good case, so therefore there's not enough evidence for us to look into it. And if you think they're just gonna, you know, side with a, a group of commissioner, commissioners that take out a, a lawyer without some firm facts, you better think again. You know, so I'm very skeptical about, you know, some counsel we've received, and I'd like to have a backup on a second counsel, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna, so I'm not gonna agree to someone telling us, oh, everything was done right, and. I don't care about what they do lobbying in Washington, D.C. This is Tarpon Springs. It's a small town community, and ethics and appearance of ethics must be disclosed and portrayed at all times. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Mr. Eisner, you have the uh, light on. Yes. <clears throat> I want to thank Commissioner Cooley for what he just said. I agree with him 100%. 
with every word that he just said, everything. Thanks. And that's what we should go after. And in addition, we should also, whether it's now or down the road, look to get back the money for the travel time mm -hmm. that we were billed for that was not part of his contract. And yes. I don't know how we're gonna do that or how we figure it up, but he's gotta at least make an offer that's substantial. Thank you. Um, City Manager LaCour, just for the record, do you, if I'm uh, I selected as the liaison, uh, do you have an issue with my working with Ms. Lewis? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, we've done the public comments. We've heard the commissions. If I could have a motion and a second, please. Um, do a motion. Uh, motion to approve the authorization to seek special counsel concerning past administration procedural matters, including to um, have the mayor be our liaison in selecting special counsel. I'll second that. All right. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Cuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? No. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, and then there's a, another associated item with this, and, and that is the, um, um, I, Mr. Delac, it's in my memorandum, Mr. Delacus brought it up, but some other people had brought it up too concerning the independence of the special counsel and also the isolating the city attorney from many of this going forward so they can focus on what we need to do here at the city. Um, perhaps identifying a third um, attorney which would be the litigation attorney for this um, anything going forward um, which would pick up Mr. Dagnall's role. Mm -hmm. um, I've also been told by another attorney that um, there is, at some point, we're co-defendants. We're not against the Morgan Group. We're co-defendants in this matter. Concerned citizens are the, uh, um, the plaintiffs. And so there may come a time when we're going to have to advise the Morgan Group that there may be um, action or advi advise the court that there may be action being taken against somebody on the Morgan Group side, maybe the Morgan Group, I don't know. At least that's something that I was um, told in casual conversation. So it might be smart to look at a third uh, attorney as a litigation attorney for this particular uh, matter, or maybe just let's go ahead and select the special counsel, and then we'll make a decision at that time. Okay. You want to say it? Do you have a comment? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so totally think it's a good idea to have a dedicated counsel to take over these suits. Um, for them to bounce around, I don't think it's a good idea. Just um, go ahead and get one guy there. To yeah, get one guy. If it's the same special counsel that's going to be looking over this, great. It doesn't matter to me who it is. Just make sure that we have one person that specializes in this and they can move forward with it. It's probably a good idea to have the same person because they're going to be doing all the research on the backup data. Um, so I've got no issues with it being the special counsel, being the same person that's going to be, as long okay. as they have could fight in a court case. So let's, um, on that note, do you have any other comments on that? Do you, would, can I get a motion? In yeah, a I'll make a motion to um, utilize the same counsel um, for the Special Majesty as the representation for the a current. Third, a third um, litigator? You want a third litigator on top of that? Not a city attorney, not a special counsel, but a, an ind a separate attorney that's litigator. He could come from um, one of the uh, um, groups that we have on interim, for example, pick him out and, and keep But could he be the special counsel the, also? Pardon me? Could he be the special counsel also there? No, that was the whole idea. If you have, the, keep it if you have the special counsel as a litigator, they're no longer independent in this review. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that's that, fine. That's what, I mean, I agreed. <laughs> that's what I thought initially. A special counsel would be the litigator. That makes but sense. then somebody I, yeah, point, they're not going to be independent. If you want them to be independent, they're not going to be independent. No, I get it. Okay, no, I agree with that. Um, help, me, uh, help me with this real quick. So uh, I make a motion to direct the procurement to go after a, a third independent special counsel, which could be part of um, one of the groups that we recently hired uh, to handle the court cases that are pending litigation with the Ankle Harbors. 
that, that would be fine. Just something to get Ms. Lewis started on that. Is that all right with you, C Major? Let's take that approach. Is That's there good. a second? Okay. I'll have, second, yeah. May I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vadikiaris? Yes. Okay, that ends that item. Um, Ms. Jackson, you're with us. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got the last item, which is the um, city manager transition update and appointment of uh, commission liaison for this as well. Um, I, I promised uh, uh, many people that um, you know, during the budget process that the, uh, uh, there was an agreement that we should start uh, transitioning to a new city uh, manager sometimes next year. And um, I'd promised people since that uh, which I guess would have been around June or maybe our first budget meeting or something like that, that uh, we would get back to this once the budget was out of way. And, and so I wanted to um, give an update on where we are and, and um, kind of a, a, the process. And the first two steps would be one, updating the um, job description of the city manager. And, and then the second uh, step would be actually uh, deciding whether we want to proceed with a uh, search firm for that, which could help with the um, um, updating the job description and that sort of thing. And that's where we are. Then, of course, in the memorandum that I have, I've got the, sec the subsequent um, uh, steps that have to be followed, but I really don't have any time frame for those except that um, we would start the search process sometimes and, and the earliest we would probably expect to have a, a, um, a, a city manager transition would be in the, um, in the spring uh, time frame, perhaps maybe a little later than that. So um, does anybody have any thoughts on that? And I've also, I, I, uh, maybe Commissioner Carr is going to like this, I'm asking be the liaison <laughs> for that too. Um, although that one is going to be uh, the same thing, um, uh, that one's going to be a little longer term, I think, that the, um, in working with the uh, search firm and updating the, uh, um, the, the uh, uh, job description. Of course, all of this would be subject to your approval. So, um, again, the reason why I'm asking, because I was city manager before, and, and um, I know some of the things that... Um, should go into that update. We don't have the strategic plan. We don't have um, waterfront experience. There's a number of things that are not in the current job description that should be added. Um, job description is probably something that Ms. Posivac had, I think, that was used for her way back um, 20 years ago. So um, that's it. So as far as we have an actionable item, so let's go to the commission. Are there any public comments on this item? Okay. Um, Mr. Jump, are there any uh, remote access comments? Anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Ms. Jacobs, nothing, okay. So let's go to the commission uh, comments. Uh, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, there's two things that I want to make sure that um, we do as a board is I'm, I understand the recruiting fee. I do think it's important to utilize it. Um, but I do understand that someone can apply for the position outside of the recruiter as well, too. So I'm not interested in paying a recruiter unless they bring forth the applicant that was hired. Um, and there's also a guarantee that they get paid after the, the individuals here after X amount of days. Um, because if they leave, then at that point, we're kind of stuck without a city manager and we paid this recruiting, recruiting firm money as well too. So just something I, I've seen in the, in the private sector um, in that aspect. So I, I'm fine with the recruiting fee. I'm fine with getting the job posted out there. Um, and the job description, I do think that's something that the board needs to work on together. Um, it comes, needs to come back to the board. Um, again, I'm gonna come back to the, the internal auditor in this situation. Uh, I do think it's all best for us to share with an internal auditor what we would like to see in the city manager um, instead of just one individual that's on the city commission. Uh, I do appreciate your, your history and experience of city manager and other things along those lines, um, but I do think it's good to have an independent person that we could go to individually 
as a board because then at that point, again, we're running into sunshine issues where if you're working with um, the HR individual or this, uh, a recruiting firm or if it's a posting somewhere else, we really can't have those conversations. And I, that's one part I'm struggling with. So that's why I think it's good to have an independent person that, again, our internal auditor has no fight in the game anywhere, city manager, any other staff members, he reports directly to our board. So that's why I think it's best to, to try to go through him. It's a one-time process. It's not a recurring process. So there's not going to be anything that needs to be audited to say, is this done a certain way? So um, I, I'm for the backup. I, it's important to update the, the job description, but I do think we need to utilize our internal auditor in this situation. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> One thing to do a uh, selection of a new city manager is to go through our review of what we wrote. In our review, um, it has pretty much labeled out all of the strengths and weaknesses of what we've already attributed to the city manager. Um, I think the city manager can add things to it that are possibly missing. I think if our city auditor wanted to add to that as well, and we compile um, a listing of all of the um, attributes that we're looking for, um, I think that's the best way to do it. Because we've all written, um, you know, our city manager's pros and cons already. I've read PK's, I've read Carr's, I've read yours, I've read, you know, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Lunt, um, it all spells out what we're looking for. It, I, I think that um, you, you're right. Um, that's not even an issue. I just, at this particular point, I just want to get the process um, started and, and whether we use a search firm or not. And then uh, the search firm, uh, you would be interviewing the search firm and asking these sort of questions about how do you, how do, you do this? I'd like for this to be done and Commissioner Carr's comments and we haven't gotten to Commissioner Kulyash yet, but uh, the whole idea is that the ICMA list, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 of these search firms, many of them are in Florida. That would be the list that I, as a liaison, I would be working with, with Ms. Lewis to, to pick some of these things and, and, and send all of them. And then uh, when the RFPs come in, um, you know, that's when we have to se select the, R, the, um, the search firm, but then the process for searching, uh, selecting the search firm would also be um, up to the commission as far as how they would wanna do that. That's all. Right now, I'm just looking for somebody to work with Ms. Lewis um, to get this process started if you agree with that um, search firm approach and then um, find out whether in the interview process, whether they're gonna do the, uh, whether they provide the services for the uh, job description, updating that or not. If they don't, then we do something else, um, you know, as, as you're describing yourself. So I was in agreement to using a search firm. I just didn't get to that. Um, but when we were talking about the job description, that's what I was speaking about. Right. But I'm okay, okay. with the search firm. Um, let's extend the time just a little bit longer. Um, if I could have motion a motion to uh, extend it to 12:45. That's good. I'll second. All right. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kuyas. Yes. Commissioner Eisner. Yes. Commissioner Carr. No. Mayor Vadikio is. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Carr, did you? I'm sorry, Eisner. Did you have any other comments? No, I'm good. Okay. Commissioner Kuyas. I just want to reiterate to the citizens that we have to do what's in the best interest of Tarpon Springs. We can't make any decisions uh, based on our personal feelings. And we have to make sure that um, this transition is honest, fair, and professional. Uh, if now, obviously, I, I don't mind a headhunter. Uh, I, I does the headhunter, if Mayor, just quick dialogue, does the, will the headhunter be reaching out to the National City Manager Association to be requesting ads, or is that it, something we would it, put an ad in ourselves and make that two options with the headhunter and then an ad with the National for, City Manager search? For example, the ICMA has an accreditation process that the their, their fully accredited city managers have to maintain their accreditation annually. 
uh, just like a CPA, professional engineer, there's extended courses that, you know, uh, courses have, have continuing education courses that have to be taken. Um, they can't be gigged for something that they've done wrong. They'll lose their accreditation, ethics, or any other questionable activity. So it's a fairly high standard. And if that's the way the commission wants to go as a requirement that you want an ICMA credentialed city manager, um, which is probably something I would support because they're trained to manage in the same way in terms of their technique so that if one leaves in four or five years, you get another one, that person can come in and pretty much look at what the previous person did and not have that much of a, a steep learning curve. If you hire someone that is not a trained city manager, they're gonna come in and kind of, you know, they're, they're gonna create their own style of management and that sort of thing. And, and if it works great, if it doesn't, then there'll be issues. And, and, um, um, and, and so maybe that'll answer your question. We could, we'll cross that bridge once we start, if the search firm, we can get a little more information. The ICMA would probably send somebody down here or one of their city, one of their city senior managers would come here from elsewhere, maybe a county manager, and give a presentation on the value of having an ICMA credentialed uh, manager. Okay, here. okay. Well, uh, I'm definitely not looking for a local city manager. Um, I'm gonna be one of those people who try to push for someone outside who's credentialed. And, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think we need to be as detailed and honest as possible what we're looking for. I'm, I'm telling you right now, I've been able to work great w with our city manager. Um, he's been able to have good direction under us, and I think we give him a, a clear, focused direction for, for the time being. So I'm not looking to abruptly make any decisions, nor do I think this commission should. I think in these descriptions and these job searches, we, we need to be honest that they, they need to, this transition will happen between, you know, April and June of next year, April, July of next year. Uh, this gives time for people who may not think they were interested in moving on to another city, hoping, hey, this could be a good fit for me. You know, quick decisions may, may have an effect on the confidence of our staff, which I'm concerned about, and the stability of our city staff workforce. Uh, our city manager right now is not the issue. So uh, as we work together, I think being honest and being smooth about doing this transition is, is the most important thing. And regarding budgeting wise, uh, there'll be ways to, to budget to be able to create a job opening for maybe a, an assistant switch or just being hired on directly. But we may have to pay more than what we're paying right now. So I just want to be clear to the citizens and um, understand that while we're updating our comp plan, our strategic plan, getting a lot of this stuff and straightened out, uh, transitioning a city manager right now is not in the best interest of Tarpon Springs. And I know some of you may not want to hear that, but our job is to do what's right for the city of Tarpon Springs, the well-being of our staff, and being able to give a solid direction in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for the record, I, we've gone through all the commissioners. Um, for the record, I've, I've got a good working relationship with the city manager. We talk about this all the time. Um, I, you know, I, the, the, the only concern with having another charter official as a um, as a liaison is just that they're, they're a charter official and they have to work with the city manager. And not only do they have to work with the city manager, I mean the city manager has to work with that individual, but the city manager staff has to work with that uh, individual as well. And so um, I don't want to create any issues with that um, other city, char the charter official, I'm sorry, charter official such as Mr. Poulos there uh, he's got a job to do, and if, if and I don't want to wind up creating an issue for him. So um, it, it's not a short process. It's got to be done right, and, and um, it's just something that has been talked about for a couple of years. I, 
I don't think that I'm not speaking for the city manager, but I don't think he's surprised by any of this that's been developed over the last year or so. Um, anyway, um, Mayor, are, are we going to have a, a setting where we'll have a couple applicants and being able to interview them in the public like we did with well, the internal auditor? That, that all will be decided by the commission how that'll approach. The answer is you could do that. I've seen it done. I think Ms. Posak was done one on one, I think. That was the last time a city manager, she was interviewed one on one. In other words, um, there was a setup where each commissioner came and had a one on one interview. Um, Mr. Poulos, we had a public interview for, for him as a charter official. There's so, we're, you know, okay, we that, could figure I, that out. I would prefer a, a public stance, that way the people are here, that way this we individual. Could, we could even develop, a, create a search committee for that as well. Okay. Yeah, there's a number of ways of doing it. Um, Commissioner Carr, let me, Commissioner Eisner had the green light on first. Let me ask him. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, I wanted to go on record also since you both said um, I get along with the uh, city manager now like two peas in a pod. We've had no problems, um, and I don't believe that we should go into a rush. Um, but I do also believe that the, the start for the search should happen um, almost immediately because uh, you could luck out and get somebody. Um, and then you can make the decision whether you need to take that person or not. Or um, if it takes a while, we all have no problem working with this city manager right now and we could extend it. But we need to make sure that we are in the upper hand and not where we're, like we're doing with the city attorney where we have to scramble. So I'd rather have it started now and see what the, uh, what's out there um, and make a decision. Uh, I personally don't care if we interview the person up in front of everybody or one-on-one. -on -one. I've interviewed many people. I'm happy to interview this person. Um, I'm sure from what I've heard here, we all have a different approach. And uh, I think that we will do the right thing for what the residents in the city need. So, and, and, and I was pleased to hear what you had to say. I just don't know how long you keep things going. Um, you know, you have to at some point say, I need to do this now and at least start the search, so. Oh yeah, we should start the search immediately. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, right, as soon as practical, given everything else, yeah. Commissioner uh, Carr, go ahead. Please. You gonna finish the job description tonight, Mayor, so we could start, start tomorrow? <laughs> well, go ahead and make your comment, please, uh, it's getting late. So, um, I just wanna make sure I understand what we're approving tonight. We're you're asking for to be the liaison to decide how we're going to search for the city manager. Is that my no, 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 no. The the liaison uh, is to work with Ms. Lewis. To uh, one is part of the approval uh, that we have agreed to try a search committee, and it would be to work with Ms. Lewis to to create a uh, an RP package, and uh, you it would come back for you to release it just like we did for the attorney. It's not gonna be a crisis situation like we did with the city attorney. It would be for Ms. Lewis to um, maybe get some information from the ICMA. Um, there's about a list of 30 ICMA recommended uh, search firms. Some of those are in, in Florida. Some of them that may be in, you know, Virginia may not be interested in doing anything in Florida. Certainly, they're so not going to be able to travel down here. It's solely for the search firm, then? Right. At this, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Then is the board going to approve the job description and have a chance to edit it then at that point? Well, we can do that. Um, the answer is it has to be updated, but it may be wise to wait until the search firm or at least ask some of the search firms that is this some service that you provide or not. And if the majority of them say, well, we don't do that, then maybe that's something that we need to talk about how to proceed okay. separate from them. Yeah, I mean, it's I, just to get the process started right now. Understood. Yeah, I, I still have an issue with commission being involved in procurement stuff. I get it where we're at now, but I'm, I'm happy to support this one tonight. Well, do you want to <laughs> do you want to do it? Not particularly. All right. I'm just. I know I like Mr. Poulos. I don't want to wind up putting him in a bad situation that um, I, I know. Let me just put it this way. I know the city manager's staff real well. 
and there's a strong sense of loyalty, just like a couple of you said. I don't want to put Mr. Poulos in a position where he's got to be dealing with that. He's got a job to do, and if he's the person that is having a hand in this transition, it's not going to make his job go any easier. I can assure you that. Yeah, but it's our decision at the end of the day, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, that's what I'm looking for. So basically, um, right now, it would be to uh, agree to a, uh, a search firm um, and look into uh, updating the um, uh, city manager's job description and then also identify the um, uh, liaison uh, for that process, at least to bring back to you how we're going to approach it. That's, I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second. All right. Roll call, please. Commissioner Pouillas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Mayor Vatagiotis? Yes. Okay, that ends the agenda. So let's go to uh, staff and board comments. Um, Police Chief Young? Uh, no comments, sir. Ms. Jackson, thank you very much for enduring through this process and, and um, would you like to say anything or do you have any comments? I have no comments. Thank <laughs> so you. It's, you're, you're it's being been safe. enlightening. <laughs> so, um, Ms. Jacobs. I just wanted to remind the board that tomorrow night is the Citizens Academy graduation ceremony at the Heritage Museum from 6 to 8. City Manager LaCourse. No, no comments. Okay. okay um, Vice. I'm sorry, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, I, I just want to, I know this is the first meeting since uh, the hurricane came through. Um, our staff did an incredible job preparing city manager um, to our emergency operations center, to our police chief and fire chief, and all the staff. Uh, they went above and beyond to prepare for the storm. Um, we did, obviously didn't get what we thought we were going to get as a, as a city, um, and we're grateful for that. But I, I do want to recognize the staff because they went, uh, and they did a ton of stuff to get ready for this. So I just want to say great job, guys, and uh, looking out for the residents. Thank you. Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. I want to thank um, Fire Chief Young, who sent out updates constantly during this time. I forwarded them on Facebook. Um, it was very informative. It was a very, very scary time. We were uh, destined to get a direct hit, something we hadn't seen in over 100 years. And I think he did an amazing job. I thanked him in person. Um, I also want to thank the uh, homecoming. That was my first homecoming that I drove in. And I just love seeing kids happy. And you know, with all the crap we deal with, they don't have any of this. They were just happy, dressed, partying. It was just, it was such a delight to see. It really brought my, a smile to my face. So I do want to thank all the homecoming. And from what I heard, um, Macy's is allowing the kids that were not vaccinated to be in the parade. They changed their stand, which I kind of thought was a political football, because how do you let these kids on a plane and then you, you want them to stand on the sidelines, but they can't be in the parade. It was just, it was just a, a mess. So I got feedback that they're allowed to go, and I'm thrilled. Um, everybody's happy, and uh, I may shop in Macy's again. That's all. <laughs> That's just like you, Commissioner Carr. I mean, <laughs> Commissioner Eisner. I'm sorry, Commissioner Carr. Um, Commissioner Kulias. Uh, I just want to thank the, the residents of Tarpon Springs for staying late tonight and those watching uh, from home. Uh, it was a it's a big meeting, and just thank you for staying involved. And always remember, this is your town. So thank you. Well said. Um, you're done. Okay. Yeah, for me, I uh, honestly, there's so much going on right now. I could probably take another half an hour uh, thanking people and listing things that are going on around town. And um, uh, again, tonight was almost a single issue meeting, uh, major from 6.30 till now, six hours of spending on this sort of thing and people's emotions are being frayed and, and listening to things that probably they don't like to hear about their city government. But until you actually understand the problem, you can't fix it. So we have a sense that there was a problem. We've identified the issues that are associated with the problem 
we're going to get a, we're going to understand what those issues are with the, an expert that's going to tell us, and then we'll do what we need to do to fix it. So that's what this is all about. In addition to everything else, it's all the events and homecomings and and uh, the great things, and we're moving on to the uh, holiday season too, which I'm very much looking forward to, honestly. So, uh, with that said, um, meeting adjourned at 12:42.